Section 33 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Section 33. On the following afternoon, I again visited the Sarhang. Another man, to whom he did not introduce me, was with him when I arrived, but soon left. The Sarhang upbraided me for wishing to leave Yazd so soon, saying that he had not seen nearly as much of me as he would have liked, and then asked me whether I had attained any greater certainty in the matter of the Babi religion. I stated certain difficulties and objections, which he discussed with me. He also showed me some Babi poems, including one by Janabe Maryam, the sister of Molla Hussein of Boshru'i, the Bab's first convert and missionary, written in imitation of a rather celebrated ode of shams tabriz While we were examining these, a servant entered and announced the arrival of Khodaw, God, and close on his heels followed the person so designated, a handsome but rather wild-looking man, whose real name I ascertained to be Hawji Mirza Muhammad, commonly called Divane, the madman. The Sarhang introduced him as one controlled by divine attraction, Majzub, whose excessive love for God was proof against every trial, and who was deeply attached to the words of Christ, especially as recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, which would move him to tears. The madman, meanwhile, had taken up one of the volumes of Balbi al epistles which the sarhang had brought out and began to read from it in a very melodious voice if you could understand all the beauties of these words he said as he concluded his reading and laid down the book you would at once be firmly convinced of the truth of the new manifestation I tried to put some questions on religious matters to them, but at first they would hardly listen to me, pouring forth torrents of rhapsody. At length, however, I succeeded in stating some of the matters on which I wished to hear their views, namely, the position accorded by them to Islam in the series of Theophanies, and the reasons for its lower standard of ethics and morality lower ideal of future bliss and greater harshness of rule and practice as compared with christianity the answers which they returned made me realize once again how widely separated from each other were our respective points of view they seemed to have no conception of absolute good or absolute truth to them good was merely what god chose to ordain and truth what he chose to reveal so that they could not understand how any one could attempt to test the truth of a religion by an abstract ethical or moral standard god's attributes according to their belief were twofold attributes of grace sefaut jamal or lotf and attributes of wrath sefaut jalal or qahr both were equally divine and in some dispensations as the christian and balbi the former in some as the mosaic and the muhammadan the latter predominated a divine messenger or prophet having once established the validity of his claim by suitable evidence was to be obeyed in all things without criticism or questioning 
and he had as much right to kill or compel as a surgeon has to resort to amputation or the actual cautery in cases where milder methods of treatment would be likely to prove inefficacious as for the muhammadan paradise with its jewelled thrones its rivers of milk and wine and honey its delicious fruits and its beautiful attendants it fulfilled its purpose for every people must be addressed in words suited to the measure of their intellectual capacity and the people to whom the prophet muhammad was sent could not have apprehended a higher ideal of future bliss they could see nothing immoral or unsatisfactory in a man's renouncing pleasures forbidden in this life so as to enjoy them everlastingly in a future state wishing to ascertain the views of the sarhang and his friend divane on sufism and its saints i briefly described to them certain phases of thought through which i myself had passed and certain conclusions as to the relation and significance of different religions which its teachings had suggested to me in a well-known aphorism i concluded it is said that the ways unto god are as the number of the souls of the children of men every religion is surely an expression more or less clear and complete of some aspect of a great central truth which itself transcends expression even as nezalmi says setonad zaban zeraqiban raz keto raz sultan naguyand baz he taketh the tongue from such as share the mystery so that they may not repeat the king's secret thus in islam the absolute unity of god is above all insisted upon in the dualism of the zoroastrians the eternal conflict between good and evil light and darkness being and not being the one and the many is symbolized while the christian trinity as i understand it is the trinity of the sun the sunbeams which proceed from the sun and the mirror cleansed from every stain wherein these falling produce neither by absorption of the mirror into the sun nor by the incarnation of the sun in the mirror but by the annihilation of the mirrorhood of the mirror in the sun's effulgence a perfect image of the sun even idolatry subsists only by virtue of a truth which it embodies as sheikh mahmud shabestari says musulman gar bedonesti ke bot chist bedonesti ke din dar bot parastist did the musulman understand what the idol is he would know that there is religion even in idolatry so in every religion there is truth for those who faithfully and earnestly seek it and hence we find amongst the followers of religions apparently most divergent living in lands and times so widely separated as to preclude all possibility of intercommunication men who led by that inner light which lighteth every one who cometh into the world have arrived at doctrines practically identical is not this identity a sign of their truth is it not moreover far more consistent with god's universal mercy to reveal himself thus inwardly to every pure soul than by a written scripture confided only to a comparatively small section of the human race if salvation is only for the people of the qur'an then how hard is the lot of my people to most of whom no more than its name if so much is known if on the other hand only the people of the gospel are to be saved what possible chance of eternal happiness has been given to the great bulk of your fellow countrymen from a sufi i should have confidently expected a cordial endorsement of these views 
but not from a Babi, and I was therefore surprised by the acclamations with which both of my companions received them, and still more so by the outburst of wild enthusiasm which they invoked in Divane, who sprang from his seat, waving his arms and clapping his hands with cries of, You have understood it! You have got it! God bless you! God bless you! Well then, I continued, what do you consider to be the difference between a prophet and a saint, who by purification of the heart and renunciation of self has reached the degree of annihilation in God, for as your own proverb says, there is no colour beyond black. The difference, they replied, is this. The saint, who has reached this degree, and can, like Mansur, the wool carder, say, I am the truth, has no charge laid on him to guide and direct others, and is therefore not bound to be cautious and guarded in his utterances, since the possible consequences of these concern himself alone, and he has passed beyond himself. While the prophet is bound to have regard to the dictates of expediency and the requirements of the time, hence it is that, as a matter of fact, most of the great Sufi saints were put to death, or subjected to grievous persecutions. I did not see the madman again, but the Sarhang paid me a farewell visit on the morrow, and brought with him another officer, who, as I was informed, belonged to the Ali Elohi sect, and was, like many of that sect, very favourably disposed towards Babiism concerning which the Sarhang spoke freely before him. Meanwhile, the time of my departure was drawing near, and it was in some degree hastened by the kindly meant but somewhat irksome attentions of the Prince Governor. He, as I have already mentioned, had set his heart on visiting a certain waterfall in the mountains, without which he declared my journey to Yazd would be incomplete. As I had no particular desire to see this waterfall, and was anxious to avoid the trouble and expense in which the mounted escort which he wished to send with me would certainly have involved me, I determined to parry his proposals with those expressions of vague gratitude which I had already learned to regard as the most effectual means of defence in such cases, and meanwhile to complete my preparations for departure, and quietly slip away to Kerman with a farewell letter of thanks and apologies to be dispatched at the last moment. There was no particular difficulty about obtaining mules for the journey, but it appeared to be impossible to hire a horse for myself to ride. Personally, I was quite indifferent as to whether I rode on a horse or a mule, but my friends, both Balbees and Zoroastrians, were horrified at the idea of my entering Kerman on the humbler quadruped. It would be so undignified, they said, so derogatory to my state, so incompatible with the idea of distinction. At first I was disposed to deride these notions, pointing out that the well-known Arabic proverb, Sheraful Mekan Bil Mekan, the dignity of the dwelling is in the dweller, might fairly be paralleled by another. Sheraful Markab Birrakib, the dignity of the mount is in the rider. But they evidently felt so strongly on the subject that, seeing that I had received much kindness at their hands and was the bearer of letters of recommendation to their friends at Kerman, I finally gave way and asked them what they advised. I advise you to give up the idea of going to Kerman altogether, said Andalib. 
you will get no good by it and you see the difficulties that it involves go to acre instead that will be easily done on your homeward journey and therefrom far greater blessings and advantages are likely to result but said i i am in some sort pledged to go to kerman as i have written to shiraz and also to my friends in england stating this to be my intention you are quite right said ardashir and i for my part advise you to adhere to your plan for to change one's plans without strong reason is to lay oneself open to a charge of indecision and a lack of firm purpose well i rejoined if i am not to go there on a mule and cannot hire a horse what am i to do shall i for instance walk or would it be more dignified to go on a camel post said one buy a horse said another as for posting i said i have had enough of that i never understood the force of the proverb as sefer sekor travel is travail literally travel is hellfire between sefer and sekor there exists that species of word play technically termed tajnisekhati or linear pun that is to say the two words as written in the arabic character are identical in outline and differ only in diacritical points this play is ingeniously preserved in sir richard burton's translation or paraphrase of the proverb which is here given in the text till i posted from shiraz to dehbid but as for buying a horse that is a more practicable idea supposing that a suitable animal is forthcoming at a moderate price a friend of mine at tehran told me that he kept a horse so as to be able to enjoy the luxury of going on foot because so long as he had no horse it was supposed that the cause of his walking was either parsimony or poverty but when it was known that he had one his pedestrian progress was ascribed to eccentricity now i do not wish to be regarded as poor still less as parsimonious but i have no objection to being credited with eccentricity and i should greatly enjoy the liberty of being able to walk as much and as often as i please after my guests had gone i talked the matter over with hauji safar who was strongly in favour of my buying a horse although he continued to recur with some bitterness to the fact that he had entered yazd riding on a donkey he was good enough to make no difficulties about riding a mule to kerman next day bahman came bringing with him the muleteer who was to supply me with the two mules i needed for my journey he also brought a horse belonging to a zoroastrian miller who was willing to sell it for eighteen tomans nearly six pounds it was by no means an ill-looking animal and both hauji safar and myself having mounted it and tried its paces liked it well however with a view to forming a better idea of its capacities i had it saddled again in the evening and went for a short ride outside the town from which i returned delighted with a full determination to buy it shortly after my return the owner came to the garden and the bargain was soon concluded to the satisfaction of all concerned hauji safar was especially delighted you will have to give me three or four tomans a month more now he said to look after your horse or else engage another servant i suggested his face fell don't be afraid i continued i have enough trouble with you already you shall have the groom's wages in addition to your own and you can either look after the horse yourself or engage someone else to do so only in the latter case please to understand clearly that the selection appointment payment and dismissal of the groom is to be entirely in your hands and that in no case will i listen to any complaints on either side or mix myself up in any way in the quarrels you are sure to have 
Haji Safar was so elated by this arrangement that he launched out into a series of anecdotes about one of his former masters named Haji Qambar, who had held some position of authority, that of chief constable or governor, I believe, in Tehran some fifteen years previously. Although his own morals do not seem to have been beyond reproach, he punished the offences of others with great severity. He ordered a dervish who had got drunk on Arag to be bastinadoed for three hours, and even Sayyids were not protected from castigation by their holy lineage, for which, nevertheless, he would profess the greatest respect, causing the dark blue turbans and sashes, which were the outward sign thereof, to be transferred to a tree or bush, to which he would then do obeisance, ere he bade his farroshes beat the unlucky owner of the sacred tokens within an inch of his life. One evening, continued Hauji Safar, I and three others of his pishchedmats, pages, were taking a stroll in the town, when we noticed in a coffee-house a man accompanied by what we at first took to be a very handsome youth, round whose collar a handkerchief was tied in Kurdish fashion, so as to conceal the hair. On looking more attentively, however, we were convinced that this seeming youth was really a woman in disguise, so we arrested the two and brought them to Haji Gambar's house. Then I went to him and said, Master, we have brought something to show you and what may that be he asked come with me i said and i will show you so he followed me into the room where our prisoners were waiting a nice-looking boy is he not said i pointing to the younger of the two well what have you brought him here for demanded my master and nicely dressed too i continued disregarding his question Look at the pretty Kurdish handkerchief he has wound round his kolaw. And as I spoke, I plucked it off, and the girl's hair, escaping from constraint, fell down over her shoulders. When the Hauji discovered that our prisoner was a girl dressed in man's clothes, he was very angry, reviled her in unmeasured terms, and ordered her to be locked up in a cupboard, on which he set his seal till the morning. In the morning she was taken out, placed in a sack, and beaten all over by the farroshes, after which her head was shaved, and she was released. I had not yet bought my horse, or completed my preparations for departure, when I was again sent for by the prince governor. This time I had not to go on foot, for one of my Bobby friends insisted on lending me a very beautiful white horse which belonged to him. I tried to refuse his kind offer, saying that the Dastur was to accompany me to the government house, and that as he could not ride, I would rather go on foot also. In our country, I said, we are taught to respect age and learning, and the Dastur is old and learned, for which reason it appears to me most unseemly that I should ride and he walk beside me. He is a Zoroastrian, I am a Christian. Both of us are regarded by the Mosalmans as infidels and unclean, and if they could, they would subject me to the same disabilities which are imposed on him let me therefore walk beside him to show my contempt for those disabilities and my respect for the dastur and his co-religionists if you desire to better the zoroastrians replied my friend it is advisable for you to go to the prince with as much state and circumstance as possible the more honour paid to you the better for them the Dastur himself took exactly the same view, so there was nothing for it but to acquiesce. Half an hour before sunset, the horse and servant of my friend came to the garden, and immediately after them the usual band of government farroshes with a large lantern. 
i had arrayed myself in a new suit of clothes made by a yazdi tailor of white shawl stuff on the pattern of an english suit these were cool comfortable and neat and though they would probably have been regarded as somewhat eccentric in england i reflected that no one at yazd or kerman would doubt that they were the ordinary summer attire of an english gentleman Hoji safar indeed laughingly remarked that people would say i had turned bobby i suppose because the early bobbies were wont to wear white raiment but otherwise expressed the fullest approval the first question addressed to me by the prince on my entering his presence was when are you going on hearing that i proposed to start on the next day but one he turned to the dastur and inquired whether he intended to accompany me the dastur replied that he could not do so as one of the zoroastrian festivals which necessitated his presence in yazd was close at hand and that as it lasted a week i could not postpone my departure till it was over hearing this the prince wished to rearrange my plans entirely i must go on the morrow he said to visit the waterfall and the mountains remain there five days then return to the city to see the zoroastrian festival and after that accompany the zoroastrians to some of their shrines and holy places protestations were vain and i was soon reduced to a sulky silence which was relieved by the otherwise unwelcome intrusion of a large tarantula and its pursuit and slaughter after conversing for a while on general topics and receiving for translation into english the rough draft of a letter which the prince wished to send to bombay to order some photographic apparatus for his son manu Cheh mirza i was suffered to depart i now determined to carry into effect my plan of taking french leave of the prince and accordingly my preparations being completed on the very morning of the day fixed for my departure i wrote him a polite letter thanking him very heartily for the many attentions he had shown me expressing regrets that the limited time at my disposal would not suffer me either to follow out the programme he had so kindly arranged for me or to pay him a farewell visit and concluding with a prayer for the continuance of his kindly feeling towards myself and of his just rule over the people of yazd this letter i confided to the dastur who happened to be going to the government house together with the english translation of the order which the prince wished to send to the bombay photographer i now flattered myself that i was well out of the difficulty and returned with relief to my packing but i had returned altogether without my host for in less than an hour i was interrupted by the prince's self-sufficient pishkhedmat who brought back the letter to the bombay photographer with a request that i would write a literal translation of it in persian this involved unpacking my writing materials and while i was engaged in this and the translation of the letter one of the servants of my bobby friends came with a horse to take me to their house towards this man the pishkhedmat behaved with great insolence asking him many impertinent and irrelevant questions and finally turning him out of the room at length i finished the translation and to my great relief got rid of the pishkhedmat as i hoped for good i then proceeded to the house of my bobby friends bade them a most affectionate farewell received from them the promised letters of recommendation for kerman and the names of the principal bobbies at nuuk bahramabad and neiriz and returned about sunset to the garden here i found the dastur ardashir and bahman awaiting me and also to my consternation the irrepressible pishkhed mat who brought a written message from the prince expressing great regret at my departure and requesting me if possible to come and see him at once 
As the hour of departure was now near at hand, I was weary and eager for a little rest before setting out on the long night march to Sarayazd. I would fain have excused myself, but, seeing that my Zoroastrian friends wished me to go, I ordered my horse to be saddled and set out with the Pish Khedmat. We rode rapidly through the dark and narrow streets, but in crossing the waste ground in front of the government house, my horse stumbled in a hole and fell with me, luckily without doing much harm to himself or me. The prince was greatly concerned on hearing of my fall, and would hardly be persuaded that it was of no consequence. Indeed, I was rather afraid that he would declare it of evil augury for my journey, and insist on my postponing my departure. However, this, my farewell interview, passed off as smoothly as could be wished, and I sat for about an hour, smoking, drinking sherbet, and conversing. He paid me many undeserved compliments, declaring that the letter I had written to him was better than he could have believed it possible for a European to write, and that he intended to send it to the Prime Minister, the Aminos Sultan. I, in return, expressed the genuine admiration with which I regarded his just, liberal, and enlightened rule, prayed that God might prolong his shadow so long as the months repeated themselves and the days recurred, and finished up by putting in a good word for the Zoroastrians. So we parted, with mutual expressions of affection and esteem, but not till he had made me promise to accept the escort of a mounted Tofangchi or musketman, and further placed in my hands a letter of recommendation to the Prince Governor of Kerman. Of this, which was given to me open and unsealed, I preserved a copy, which, as it may be of interest to the curious, I here translate, premising only that the terms in which the Prince, Emodo Dole, was kind enough to describe me, exaggerated as they appear in English, are but the commonplaces of polite Persian. In the abode of security of Kerman, may it be honoured by the august service of the desirable, most honourable, most illustrious, nobly born lord, the most mighty, most puissant prince, his highness Nosero Dole, may his glory endure, governor and ruler of the spacious domain of Kerman, on the fourteenth of Ramazan, was it dispatched two four six eight this mystic number corresponding to the word badu is generally written under the address on a letter to ensure its safe arrival red house says it is the name of an angel who is supposed to watch over letters but i never succeeded in obtaining a satisfactory explanation of it may i be thy sacrifice Please God, our religious devotions are accepted, and the care of God's servants, which is the best of service, on the part of the desirable, most honourable, most illustrious, most mighty and eminent prince, may his glory endure, is approved in the divine audience hall of God, for they have said, By service and succour of men we win to the grace of the Lord, by this, not by rosary gown or prayer mat, we earn our reward. At all events, the bearer of this letter of longing and service is my respected and honoured friend, of high degree, companion of glory and dignity, Eduard Baroum Saheb, the Englishman, who, having come to visit this country, and being now homeward bound, hath set his heart on Kerman, and the rapture of waiting upon the servants of the nobly-born prince. Of the characteristics of this illustrious personage, it is needless for me to make any representation. After meeting him, you will be able to appreciate his good qualities, and the degree of his culture, and how truly sensible and well-informed he is. 
for all his youth and fewness of years the laudable traits which he possesses indeed are beyond what one can represent since he has mentioned that he is setting out for kerman my very singular devotion impelled me to write these few words to the blessed presence i trust that the sacred person of your desirable most illustrious most mighty and eminent highness may be conjoined with health and good fortune more were redundant sealed emodo dole it was two hours after sunset when i returned to the garden and finally got rid of the prince's pishhed mat with a present of two or three tomans Hauji safar said that he should have had a watch or some other gift of the kind rather than money which he feared might be refused or taken amiss however i had no watch to spare and i am bound to confess that he was condescending enough to accept the monetary equivalent with grace if not gratitude the farroshes having likewise been dismissed with presents of money i was left in peace with my zoroastrian friends who after drinking a farewell cup with me departed with the exception of bahman ardashir's confidential clerk who remained behind to give me a statement of my finances and to pay over to me the balance still to my credit the amount for which i had brought a cheque from shiraz was a hundred and forty seven and a half tomans nearly forty five pounds of which i found that i had drawn forty five tomans during my stay at yazd the balance of a hundred and two and a half tomans i elected to receive in cash to the amount of thirty two and a half tomans and a check on a zoroastrian merchant of kerman for the remaining seventy tomans both of which bahman who was as business-like careful and courteous as any english banker could have been at once handed over to me receiving in return a receipt for the whole sum with which i had been credited at yazd little now remained to be done but to eat my supper put a few finishing touches to my packing and distribute small presents of money to some of those who had rendered me service they came up in turn called by hauji safar old jamshid the gardener received twelve grands his little son khosro six grands another gardener named khodal daud twelve grands and hauji sayed m servant twenty grands the farewells were not yet finished for just as i was about to drink a last cup of tea two of my bobby friends came in spite of the lateness of the hour to wish me godspeed then they too left me and only bahman was present to watch the final departure of our little caravan as it passed silently forth into the desert and the darkness End of section thirty three. End of chapter fourteen. Yazd continued. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in London. Section thirty four, chapter fifteen. From Yazd to Kerman of a year amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Raftam o bordam daag to dar del, vaudi be vaudi, manzel be manzel. I journeyed on, bearing the brand of thy grief in my heart from valley to valley, from stage to stage. Five men and five beasts constituted the little company in which I quitted Yazd. Besides myself and my horse, there was Amir Khan, one of the Arab tribesmen of Ardastan, whom the prince had sent as a mounted escort to see me safely to the marches of his territory. 
the muleteer with his three mules, two of which only were hired by me, my servant Haji Safar, and a young Tabrizi named Mirza Yusuf, who had formerly been his fellow servant, and to whom, at his request, and on the recommendation of my friend the Sarhang, I had given permission to accompany me to Kerman, where he hoped to obtain employment from Prince Nasrud Dole, and to ride on one of the lightly laden mules. Mirza Yusuf, a conceited and worthless youth, had, as I subsequently discovered, and as will be more fully set forth in its proper place, been passing himself off at Yazd as a Babi, so as to obtain help and money from rich and charitable members of that sect. And it was by this means, no doubt, that he had induced the Sarhang to bespeak my favor for him. Were all his fellow townsmen like him, no exaggeration would be chargeable against the satirist who wrote, ز تبریزی به جز هیزی نبینی همان بهتر که تبریزی نبینی From a Tabrizi thou wilt see naught but rascality Even this is best that thou shouldest not see any Tabrizi Outwardly, however, Mirza Yusuf was sufficiently well favored and civil spoken and it was only after my arrival in Kerman that I detected in him any worse quality than complacent self-satisfaction and incurable idleness. Amir Khan, being well mounted, soon wearied of the slow march of the caravan and urged me to push on with him at a brisker pace. I did so, thinking, of course, that he knew the way. But this proved to be a rash assumption, for after traversing the considerable village of Muhammad Abad, he lost the road and struck off into the open desert, where the soft sand proved very arduous to my horse, which began to lag behind. A halt with Amir Khan made, not to allow me to come up with him, but to say his prayers, brought us once more together but the subsequent appearance of two gazelles at some distance to our left was too much for his self-control and he set off after them at full gallop i soon abandoned all idea of following him and having now realized his complete uselessness both as a guide and a guard continued to make my solitary way in the direction which I suppose to be correct. After some time, Amir Khan, having got a shot at the gazelles and missed them, returned in a more subdued frame of mind. And after again losing the way several times, we finally reached the post house of Sare Yazd about sunrise. The remainder of the caravan being far behind, I had nothing to do after seeing to the stabling of my horse but to lie down on the mud floor with my head on the rolled-up greatcoat, which I had strapped to the saddle at starting, and go to sleep. I was awakened about three hours later by Haji Safar for my morning tea, and passed the day in the post-house writing and making up my accounts. About sunset, I received a visit from a Zoroastrian who was coming up to Yaz from Kerman. He remained with me for about an hour, chatting and drinking tea, and informed me, amongst other things, that he had spent several years in Bombay and Calcutta, that the governor of Kerman, Prince Nasr Dole, was a most enlightened and popular ruler, that Kerman was much cooler than Yazd, as proved by the fact that the mulberries were not yet ripe there and that cucumbers were still scarcely to be obtained, that the poverty of the inhabitants, always great, had been increased by the depreciation in shawls, which fetched less than a third of their former price, but that as against this the crops, and especially the opium crop, had been remarkably good in the last year. 
We left Sarayazd between three and four hours after sunset by the light of a nearly full moon, my Zoroastrian friend coming to bid me farewell and wish me Godspeed. Amir Khan, who kept dozing off in his saddle, again led us astray, and while we were wandering about amongst the sand hills, there reached our ears a faint cry which in that solitary and ghostly desert caused us to start with surprise amir khan however followed by myself made for the spot whence it appeared to come and there huddled together between two sand hills we presently discerned a group of about half a dozen persons three men three women and i think one child at least gathered round a diminutive donkey as we approached they again addressed us in tones of entreaty but in a dialect which was to me quite unintelligible amir khan however understood them they were from the city of barbar shahr barbar which he explained was near sistan on the eastern frontier of persia and were bound for karbala drawn thither by a longing desire to visit the place of martyrdom of the imam hussein they had lost their way in the desert and were sorely distressed by thirst and the boon they craved was a draught of water my heart was filled with pity for these poor people an admiration for their faith and piety and as i bade haji safar give them to drink from the leather bottle he carried there ran in my mind the words of hafez on chijan aashiqan az dast hijrat mi kashad kas nadide dar jahan juz tishnagan karbala what the souls of thy lovers suffer at the hands of thy separation none hath experienced in the world save the thirsty ones of karbala the rat and by the blessings and thanks which they poured forth as they gulped down the water was my compassion still further moved and i felt constrained to give them also a small piece of money for this amir khan warmly applauded me as we rode off telling the pilgrims that they were within a short distance of the village of sarayaz those who give said he of that which god hath given them will never want and those who will not give are not profited even in this life by their avarice only yesterday a beggar asked me for money i replied that i had none though i had three gherans and a half in my pocket at that moment but when i looked for these a little later i found that they were gone no doubt to punish me for my niggardly conduct after this incident the march continued in sleepy silence but towards dawn amir khan who was riding beside me suddenly woke up from his doze and remarked with complete irrelevance to anything that had gone before no sect are worse than the babis why i inquired wondering what had caused him to introduce spontaneously a subject generally avoided with the most scrupulous care by persian musalmans they worship as god he replied a man called mirza hussein ali who lives at adrianople a friend of mine at yazd once told me that he was going there i asked why to visit God, be ziyarat haq he answered. When he got there, he was asked what work his hands could do. None, said he, save writing, for I am a scrivener by profession. Then said they, 
there is no place for you here, and we do not want you. He was not allowed to see Mirza Hussein Ali at all, but was given a handkerchief which he used and invited to make an offering of three tomans. So he returned thoroughly disgusted, for, said he, God does not take presents. While I was considering how I should meet this Sally, and whether Amir Khan, knowing that I had had dealings with the Babis at Yazd, was anxious to warn me against them, he solved the difficulty by again dozing off into a fitful slumber from which he awoke, between the wolf and the sheep, Miane Gorgomish, as the Persians say. That is at early dawn. As soon as he had collected his scattered wits, he cast his eyes round the horizon in hopes of being able to discern our next halting place, Zainuddin, and after some scrutiny, declared that we had passed it during his sleep and that it was over there, pointing to a dark line on the plain behind us, some distance off the track which we were following. Luckily, warned by previous experience, I paid no heed to his opinion, and supported by Haji Safa, insisted on continuing our advance for which we were rewarded by finding ourselves in less than half an hour at Zainuddin, where there is nothing but a caravansary and a very good post house. I alighted at the latter and after a cup of tea slept for about six hours. Zainuddin is the last halting place within the territories of Yazd, and consequently Amir Khan had been instructed to accompany me only thus far on my journey, and to obtain for me another mounted guard belonging to the jurisdiction of the governor of Kerman. I had, however, no desire to avail myself of this unnecessary luxury, and hinted as much to Amir Khan as I placed in his hand ten gherans. He took the hint and the money with equal readiness, and we parted with mutual expression of esteem. The evening was cloudy, with occasional gusts of wind, and every now and then a great pillar of sand or dust would sweep across the plain after the fashion of the Jannis in the Arabian night. The road presented little of interest, being ever the same wide, ill-defined track through a sandy plain enclosed between two parallel mountain chains running from the northwest to the southeast. At one place I noticed a number of large caterpillars, larva of Deilophila euphorbia, I think feeding on a kind of spurge which grew by the roadside. No trace of cultivation was visible till we came within a farsakh of Kermanshahan, when we passed two or three villages at about the same distance to the east of the road. We reached Kermanshahan half an hour before sunset and alighted at the post house, which was the best I had seen in Persia. There are also two caravansaries, one old and one new. As no meat was obtainable, I made my supper of eggs fried in oil and then went to sleep. I woke about two hours before dawn to find the people of the post house eating their morning meal preparatory to entering on the day's fast. Haji Safar and the muleteer, however, were sleeping so peacefully that it seemed a shame to wake them. 
So I lay down again and slept for another two hours, when I was awakened by Haji Safar. It was quite light when we started, but this was of little advantage, as the scenery was precisely the same in character as on the previous day. The road, however, hugged the western range of mountains more closely, and indeed at one point we passed inside a few outlying hills. Kerman Shahan was in sight for two hours and a quarter after we had left it, and we had no sooner crossed a slight rise which finally hid it from our view than we caught sight of the caravansary of Shemsh, which, however, it took us nearly three hours more to reach. A more dismal spot than Shemsh it would be hard to imagine. There is nothing but the aforesaid caravansary and a post house singularly good like all the post houses between Yazd and Kerman, standing side by side in the sandy salt strewn plain. As I rode up to the latter edifice, I saw a little stream, very clear and sparkling, carefully banked up between mud walls which conducted it into a small pound. Being overcome with thirst, I flung myself from my horse and dipped my face into it to get a long draught of what I had supposed to be pure, fresh water. To my disappointment, it proved to be almost as salt as the sea. There was no other water to be had, and Haji Safar had thrown away what was left from Kerman Shahan. Nor did my hope that boiling might improve it, and that a decent cup of tea might at least be obtainable prove well founded. No one who has not tried it can imagine how nasty a beverage is tea made in a cup of teapot with brackish water. Luckily, my kind Zoroastrian friends had forced me to accept two bottles of beer from them as I was leaving Yaz, and these in that thirsty wilderness were as the very elixir of life. Even so, the day was a horrible one, and seemed almost interminable. Swarms of flies, distant thunder, and a violent gusty wind increased my despondency, and the only discovery in which a visit to a neighboring mud ruin resulted was a large and very venomous-looking serpent. Altogether, I was heartily glad to leave this detestable place about four and a half hours after sunset by the light of a radiant moon. The monotony of the march to the next stage, Anar, was only twice broken. First by meeting a string of twenty-five camels going up to Yazd, whose drivers greeted us with a usual forsat boshat, may it be opportune, and secondly by the appearance of some wild beast which was prowling about by the road, but which on our approach slunk off into the desert. About dawn we arrived at Anar, a flourishing village containing a good many gardens and surrounded by fields in which men were busy reaping the corn. Here we alighted at the post house to rest and refresh ourselves before continuing our march to the next stage, Bayaz, which we reached without incident a little before sundown. Bayaz is a small hamlet containing a few trees, and not devoid of signs of cultivation. Three or four camels were resting and taking their food in a field opposite the post house, where I alighted in preference to the large but dilapidated caravansary. Soon after our arrival, a party of mounted ghulams rode up and bivouacked outside under the trees. One of these, as Haji Safar informed me, 
was anxious to challenge my horse. This practice, called Mu'azzab Bastan, I was surprised to find amongst the Persians, as I had hitherto only met with it in the pages of Mr. Sponge's sporting tour. For those not familiar with that entertaining work, I may explain how the transaction would have been conducted if I had given my consent, which needless to say I did not do. The Ghulam who had challenged my horse suggested that the postmaster, Naib Chapar, should act as umpire between the two animals, and to this Haji Safar, acting as he chose to consider as my representative, agreed. Haji Safar then informed the Naib Chapar that I had bought my horse for thirty-two months. As a matter of fact, it had only cost me sixteen two months. But the latter valued it still higher at thirty-five two months. However, he valued the Ghulam's horse at forty-two months. It was probably worth twelve at the outside so that the award was that my horse should give the Ghulam's horse five tumans, or, in other words, that I should give the Ghulam my horse and five tumans in money for his horse. We left Bayaz about four hours before sunset, and continued our south-easterly march along a track so ill-defined that I felt impelled to make a wide detour towards the telegraph posts which lay some distance to the east in the expectation of finding something more like a high road as dusk drew on the whole character of the country began to change rivulets and streams intersected it in every direction the air grew moist and damp like that of a fan and the night re-echoed with the shrill chirping of grasshoppers and the hoarse croaking of frogs. Once we lost our way amongst the ditches and cornfields and floundered about for some time in the dark air, rather by good luck than good management we again struck the road. Flickering lights in the distance, probably willow the wisps, kept our hopes of speedy arrival alive but it was only after repeated disappointments that the welcome outline of the post-house of Kushku loomed out like some moated grange through the darkness. We had to wake the postmaster ere we could gain admission, and no sooner was my bed spread in the porch of the Balakhane or upper chamber than I fell sound asleep lulled by a chorus of frogs and grasshoppers till supper time after which i again composed myself for slumber when haji safar brought me my tea next morning he informed me that the muleteer zainul abedin had decided to remain at kushku to rest his beasts after they forced marches of the last day or two till sundown so as to accomplish the seven long parasangs which separated us from the considerable town of Bahramabad, the capital of the district known as Rafsanjan, during the night. I was not sorry for the rest, and though much pestered by flies, passed a tolerably comfortable day in the little post-house. We started by starlight about three hours after sunset, but in about an hour the moon rose up to light us on our way. The night was quite chilly and the march very tedious, and even when soon after dawn we sighted Bahramabad, a weary length of willfully sinuous and serpentine road remained to be traversed ere we finally alighted at the post-house. At Bahramabad I had a letter of introduction from Haji Sayyid to the chief of the post in that district, which after lunch I caused to be conveyed to him. He came to visit me without delay, and after sitting for a short time, carried me off to his office in the caravansary. While I was there, several persons came to see him, 
amongst them a fine-looking young Khan of Rafsanjan, who had just returned from Sirjan by way of Paris and Gadi Ahmar. He had with him the body of an enormous lizard, Bozmajje, which he had shot on the road. About three hours before sunset, my host took me to his house and gave me tea, after which I was waited upon successively by deputations of Zoroastrians and Hindus, both of which classes regard an Englishman as their natural friend and ally. The Zoroastrians were only three in number. One of them was Ardashir Mehraban's agent, and of the other two, one was an old man called Mehraban, and the other a young man named Ardashir. They told me that there were in all about twenty or twenty-five Zoroastrians in Bahramabad, that their co-religionists in Kerman were much less subject to insult and annoyance, and in all ways better off than those in Yazd and that the chief products of Rafsanjan were, besides cereals, almonds, and pistachio nuts, which were exported to India. After the departure of the Zoroastrians, the whole Hindu community, save one who was ill, waited upon me. There were fourteen of them, men and youths, all natives of Shekarpur, and they brought me as a present an enormous block of sugar candy. One of them had recently been robbed of a large sum of money, and as the Persian governor could not succeed in capturing the thief and would not make good the loss, he begged me to make a representation of the facts to the English embassy at Tehran. I promised to come and inspect the scene of the outrage, if I had time, without further committing myself and shortly afterwards the deputation withdrew. I remained to supper with the postmaster, who made me eat to repletion of his excellent polo, washed down with a delicious sharbat, and strove to persuade me to stay the night with him. But I excused myself on the ground that the muleteer would probably wish to start. However, on arriving at the chapar khane, whither he insisted on accompanying me, I found that, as the morrow, Ramazan the 21st, was the anniversary of the Imam Ali's death, and consequently an unlucky day, neither Haji Safar nor the muleteer wished to continue the march till the following evening. End of section 34Section 35 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I did not go out next day till about three hours before sunset when the postmaster sent his servant to bring me to his house i conversed with him for about two hours and he inquired very particularly about the signs which should herald christ's coming but did not make any further allusion to the beliefs of the babis which i believe were his own our conversation was interrupted by the arrival of one of the Hindus, who wished me to inspect the scene of the recent robbery, which I agreed to do. We found all the other Hindus assembled in the caravansary, where they lodged, and I was at once shown the inner room whence the safe, containing, as they declared, 400 tumans in cash and 14,000 tumans in checks, and letters of credit had been abstracted by the thieves who as it was supposed had entered by the chimney ten or fifteen men had been arrested on suspicion by the governor mirza hedayatullah but as there was no sufficient evidence against any of them 
they had been released. I took notes of these matters and promised to bring them to the notice of some of my friends in the English embassy if I got the chance. And we then conversed for a time while I smoked a galleon which they brought me. They questioned me closely as to the objects of my journey and refused to credit my assertion that I was traveling for my own instruction and amusement declaring that I must be an agent of the English government. Why don't you take Persia? said one of them at length. You could easily, if you liked. I suppose the thief who took your money put the same question to himself with regard to it, I replied. And yet you feel that you have a just ground of complaint against him. People have no right to take their neighbor's property even if they think they can do so with impunity, and states are no more entitled to steal than individuals. The Hindus appear to be still unconvinced, and my sympathy for their loss was considerably abated. I returned to the postmaster's house for supper, after which he caused soft pillows and bolsters to be brought and insisted on my resting for a couple of hours before starting. At the end of this time, Haji Safar awoke me to tell me that the caravan was ready to start, and after a final cup of tea and a hasty farewell to my kind host, I was once more on the road. We lost our way at the very start, and wandered about for some time in the starlight, until we came to one or two small houses. The Naib Chapar of Bahramabad, who had joined our party, hammered at the door of one of these till an old peasant, aroused from his sleep, came out and directed us on our way. But this did not satisfy the Naib Chapar, who compelled the poor old man to accompany us for a mile or so, which he rather unwillingly did though two gherans which i gave him as he was leaving us more than satisfied him for the trouble he had incurred about dawn while still distant some two paris lengths from our halting place kabutar khan we passed a company of men with a young girl enveloped in a white chador who were going down to kerman and exchanged a few words with them we reached the post house of kabutar khan which seemed to be entirely in the charge of a very quaint old woman about an hour after sunrise, and remained there till about three hours after sunset, when we again set out for Barry. The man who had been our companion on the previous stage again joined us, being now mounted on a very small donkey, which he had hired for thirty shahis, about two pence to take him to Bahrain. A little boy named Abbas accompanied the donkey, and several times the man dismounted to allow him to ride for a while, on which occasions he would break out into snatches of song in his sweet childish voice. Before we reached Bahrain, the great broad plain running towards the southeast, which we had followed since leaving Yaz, began to close in, and mountains appeared in front of us, as well as on either hand. Soon after dawn, we reached Barin, which is a small village surrounded by a considerable extent of cultivated ground, and as usual put up at the post house. Here we remained till four hours after sunset, when the mules were loaded up for the last time for that night's march was to bring us to our journey's end. Our course now lay nearly due east, along a good level road, and when the dawn began to brighten over the hills before us, Kerman, nestling as it seemed at the very foot of their black cliffs, and wrapped like one of her daughters in a thin white mantle of mist and smoke, gladdened our straining eye. My original intention had been to alight in the first instance at a post-house, 
but as this proved to be situated at some distance outside the city walls and as i was eager to be in the very centre of the town without further delay i decided to take up my quarters instead at one of the caravanseries it was fortunate that i did so for events so shaped themselves that my sojourn at kerman instead of lasting only ten days or a fortnight as i then intended was prolonged for more than two months and for reasons soon to be mentioned it would probably have been difficult for me to have quitted the post-house if i had once taken up my abode there without offending my good friend the postmaster of kerman on entering the city we first made our way through the bazaars to the caravansary of the vakil which we were told was the best but here there was no room to be had so after some delay during which i was surrounded by a little crowd of sightseers we proceeded to the caravansary of haji ali agha where i obtained a lodging while the beasts were being unloaded i was accosted by two zoroastrians one of whom proved to be ardashir mehraban's agent mulla gushtas all the zoroastrians in kerman are entitled mulla even by the mohammedans they came into my room and sat down for a while and gushtas told me that he had found a place for me to stay in during my sojourn at kerman in a garden outside the town they soon left me and after a wash and a shave i slept till nearly noon when i was awakened by a farrosh from the telegraph office who was the bearer of a telegram from cambridge which had been sent on from shiraz the original which of course was in english arrived by post the same evening and ran please authorize name candidate for persian readership Neil. the persian translation made i believe at kashan where the wires from shiraz and kerman to the capital join was as follows khahish daram izn bedahid shumara baraye muallimi farsi taklif konam Neil. i was rather overwhelmed by the reflection that even here at kerman i was not beyond the reach of that irrepressible nuisance of this age of ours electricity haji safar had already succeeded in discovering a relative in kerman a cousin on his mother's side as i understood a sleek wily looking man of about fifty generally known as noeb hassan whom he brought to see me while he was with me a greek of constantinople who had turned musulman and settled in kerman joined the party and conversed with me a little in turkish then came servants from the telegraph office to inquire on the part of their master a prince as well as a telegraphist but then as i have already remarked princes are not rare in persia how i did and when i would come and visit him for i had an introduction to him from my friends at yazd who had also written to him about me and hard on the heels of these came the son of the postmaster of kerman to whom also i had letters of recommendation so that i had hardly a moment's leisure this last visitor carried me off to see his father at the central post office in the town the postmaster a kindly-looking man past middle age with a gray moustache and the rank of colonel sartip gave me a most friendly welcome but reproached me for being a day later than he had been led to expect by the postmaster of bahramabad who appeared to have sent him a message concerning me although i am in poor health said he and am as you see lame in one foot i rode out nearly three parasangs to meet you yesterday for i wish to be the first to welcome you to kerman and i also wanted to tell you that the chapar khane which is well built and comfortable and is intended for a residence is entirely at your disposal and that i hope you will stay in it while you're here i next proceeded to the telegraph office to visit the prince whom i found sitting at the instrument with his pretty little son opposite him 
he in turn insisted that i should take up my abode at a new telegraph office which had just been completed for him and it was with great difficulty that i got him to acquiesce in the plan which i had formed of inspecting the three residences chosen for me in advance by my kind friends of kerman indeed i was somewhat embarrassed by their hospitality for i was afraid that whichever place i selected i could hardly hope to avoid giving offence to the owners of the other two as however it was clear that i could not live in all of them i decided in my own mind that i would just choose the one i liked best and accordingly after i had conversed for a short while with a prince i set off with the postmaster's son to visit the chaparkhane to the north and the zoroastrian garden to the south of the town the chaparkhane proved fully worthy of the praises bestowed on it by the postmaster for the rooms in it were spacious clean and comfortable and looked out on to a pleasant garden we smoked a cigarette there while horses were saddled to take us to the garden of the zoroastrians thither we rode through the town which we entered by the north gate called darwaz sultan and quitted by the south gate darwaz nasiriye in the garden which was just outside the latter we found the two zoroastrians who had first accosted me in the caravansary ardashir's agent goshtas and feridun a man of about twenty-five years of age with both of whom i afterwards became very intimate after sitting for a while in the char fast or summer house which stood in the middle of the garden and partaking of the wine arak and young cucumbers which the zoroastrians according to their usual custom had brought with them we returned together to the caravansary naib hassan presently joined us and outstayed all my other visitors as he seemed inclined to take the part of confidential adviser i informed him of the difficulty in which i was placed as to the selection of a lodging from the three proposals after reflecting a moment he said sahib you must of necessity run the risk of offending two out of three persons and therefore as you cannot avoid this you need only consult your own inclination in the matter if you accept the prince's offer and take up your abode in the telegraph office you will be continually subjected to some degree of constraint and will be always surrounded by inquisitive and meddlesome servants if you go to the chaparkhane you will be outside the city and will only see the friends of the sartip of the post office in the gabres garden on the other hand you will be your own master and you will be free and unconstrained my advice therefore is that you should select the last and make polite excuses to the prince and the sati as this counsel seemed good to me i determined to act in it without delay and it was arranged at naib hassan's suggestion that i should transfer myself and my possessions to the garden on the following morning so that ere my apologies should reach the prince and the sati the transfer might be an accomplished fact admitting of no further discussion soon after this naib hassan departed and i was left at leisure to enjoy the welcome letters which that day's post had brought me from home the move to the garden was duly effected on the following morning wednesday the fifth of june or the twenty-fifth of ramazan with the help of naib hassan feridun and a zoroastrian lad named rostam who was brother to my friend Bahman of Yaz. Of this garden, which was my residence for the next two months, I may as well give a brief description in this place. Its extent was several acres, 
it was entirely surrounded by a high but rather dilapidated mud wall. It was divided transversely, that is, in a direction parallel to the main road leading to the Darvaze Nasivie, or southern gate of the city, which bounded it to the west, by another mud wall in which was a gap which served the purpose of a gate, and longitudinally by a stream, not one of the niggardly three hours a day streams of Yaz, but a deep, clear brook in which I was often able to enjoy the luxury of a bath. Besides the summer house or charfast, of which I have already spoken, and which stood in the middle of the northern half of the garden, about halfway between the stream and the northern wall, there was a larger building consisting of two rooms and a small courtyard standing on the very edge of the stream. It was in this more spacious building that I established myself on my arrival, using the larger of the two rooms, which had windows to the east and south, the former looking out into the courtyard, the latter on to the stream, for myself, and leaving the smaller chamber at the back to Haji Safar and Mirza Yusuf. But afterwards, when the heat waxed greater, though it was at no time severe, I lived for the most part in the little summer house, which, being open to the air on all four sides, was cooler and pleasanter. From the larger building another wall ran westwards, towards the main road, leading to the Darvaze Nassirie, partially cutting off the southwest portion of the garden from that which I occupied. This southwest or outer part of the garden appeared to be in some measure public property, for often as I passed through it to reach the gate, I saw groups of women washing their linen in the stream which traversed it. The garden had been originally planned and laid out by a former wazir of Kerman, whose son Mirza Javad, a man of about fifty years of age, occupied a house in another garden not far distant from this. But he ere his death, so at least I gathered, having fallen into disgrace and comparative poverty, it had been neglected and suffered to run wild, and was now led to some of the Zoroastrians who used it chiefly for the cultivation of plants useful either as food or medicine. In truth, it was rather a wilderness than a garden, albeit a fair and fragrant wilderness, and never a calm, clear summer night, sweet with the scent of the rose and melodious with the song of the nightingale. But I am again transported in the spirit to that enchanted ground. Is there one who dares to maintain that the East has lost its wonder, its charm, or its terror? Then he knows it not, or only knows that outer crust of commonplace which under the chill influence of Western utilitarianism and practical sense has skimmed its surface. End of section 35 Section 36 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Section 36 Chapter 16 Kerman Society Har chand ke az ruy kariman khajalim qam nist ke parvard in abu gelim dar ruy zamin nist chu kerman jai kerman dere alamast uma ahl delim 
although we stand abashed in the presence of the noble it matters not since we have drawn nourishment from this earth and water on the face of the earth there is no place like kerman kerman is the heart of the world and we are men of heart in no town which i visited in persia did i make so many friends and acquaintances of every grade of society and every shade of piety and impiety as at kerman when i left i made a list of all the persons who had visited me or whom i had visited and found that the number of those whom i could remember fell but little short of a hundred amongst these almost every rank from the prince governor down to the mendicant dervish was represented as well as a respectable variety of creeds and nationalities baluchis hindus zoroastrians shiites and sunnis sheikhis sufis babis both bahai and azali dervishes and kalandars belonging to no order fettered by no dogma and trammelled by but few principles hitherto i had always been more or less dependent on the hospitality of friends whose feelings i was obliged to consult in choosing my acquaintances here in kerman the garden where i dwelt was open to all comers and i was able without let or hindrance to pursue that object which since my arrival in persia had been ever before me namely to familiarize myself with all even the most eccentric and antinomian developments of the protean persian genius i succeeded beyond my most sanguine expectations and as will presently be set forth found myself ere long in a world whereof i had never dreamed and wherein my spirit was subjected to such alternations of admiration disgust and wonder as i had never before in my life experienced all this however did not come to me at once and would not perhaps have come at all but for a fortunate misfortune which entirely altered all my plans and prolonged the period of my stay at kerman from the fortnight or three weeks which i had originally intended to a couple of months for just as i was about to depart thence having indeed actually engaged a muleteer for the journey to shiraz by way of sirjan khir and neiriz i fell a victim to a sharp attack of ophthalmia which for some weeks compelled me to abandon all idea of resuming my travels and this ophthalmia from which i suffered no little pain had another result tending to throw me more than would otherwise have been the case into the society of dervishes dreamers and mystics judge me not harshly o thou who hast never known sickness i and for a while partial blindness in a strange land if in my pain and my wakefulness i at length yielded to the voice of the tempter and fled for refuge to that most potent most sovereign most seductive and most enthralling of masters opium unwisely i may have acted in this matter though not as i feel altogether culpably yet to this unwisdom i owe an experience which i would not willingly have forfeited though i am thankful enough that the chain of my servitude was snapped ere the last flicker of resolution and strenuousness finally expired in the nirvana of the opium smoker i often wonder if any of those who have returned to tell the tale in the outer world have wandered farther than myself into the flowery labyrinths of the poppy land 
for of him who enters its fairy realms too true as a rule is the persian opium smoker's epigram hazrat afyunema har marazi ra revast lik chu adishodi khod maraz bi devast sir opium of ours for every ill is a remedy swift and sure but he if you bear for a while his yoke is an ill which knows no cure although it was some while after my arrival in kerman that i became numbered amongst the intimates of the aforesaid seropium he lost no time in introducing himself to my notice in the person of one of his faithful votaries mirza hussein qoli of bam a pleasant gentle dreamy soul of that type which most readily succumbs to the charm of the poppy who came to visit me in naib hasan's company on the very day of my entry into the garden soon after this too i came into daily relations with another bondsman of the all-potent drug one abdul hussein whom haji safar in accordance with the agreement made between himself and myself at yazd had hired to look after my horse he was far advanced on the downward path and often when sent to buy bread or other provisions in the shops hard by the city gate would he remain away for hours at a time and return at last without having accomplished his commission and unable to give any account of how the time had passed this used to cause me some annoyance till such time as i too fell under the spell of the poppy wizard when i ceased to care any longer because the opium smoker cares not greatly for food or indeed for aught else in the material world save his elixir nay i even found a certain tranquil satisfaction in his vagaries but i must leave for a while these delicious reminiscences and return to the comparatively uneventful fortnight which my residence at kerman began of this i shall perhaps succeed in giving the truest picture by following in the main the daily entries which i made in my diary on the day of my instalment in the garden wednesday fifth june twenty fifth ramazan i received several visitors besides the opium smoker of bam chief among these was a certain notable sheikh of qom whose doubtful orthodoxy had made it expedient for him to leave the sacred precincts of his native town for happy heedless kerman here he succeeded in gaining the confidence and esteem of prince nosrud dole the governor in whose society most of his time was passed either in consultation on affairs of state or in games of chance for which he cared the less because he was almost invariably the loser he was a burly genial kind-hearted gentleman with but little of the odour of sanctity so much sought after in his native town and a fund of wit and information i afterwards saw much of him and learned that he was an azali babi so far as he was anything at all for by many he was accounted a free thinker la mazhab but in this first interview he gave no further indication of his proclivities than to inquire whether i had not a copy of monakji's new history of the babi theophany with him came two brothers merchants of yazd whom i will call aga mohsen and aga mohammad sadiq of the former who was an orthodox shiite i saw but little subsequently but with the younger brother a man of singular probity and most amiable disposition i became rather intimate and from him i met with the disinterested kindness which i shall not omit to record in its proper place he too was a babi but a follower of baha not of azal as also was a third brother who being but a lad of fifteen or sixteen was suddenly so overcome by a desire to behold the face of baha 
that he soon ran away from kerman with only five tumans in his pocket with the set purpose of making his way to acre on the syrian coast in which project thanks to the help of kindly zoroastrians at bandar e abbas and the babis of bombay and beirut he was successful i subsequently made the acquaintance of another lad whose imagination was so stirred by this exploit that he had determined to imitate it at the first opportunity though whether or no his plan was realized i cannot say thursday sixth june twenty sixth ramazan soon after i was up i received a visit from naeb hassan who indeed lost no time in establishing himself in the position of my guide philosopher and friend and who seldom allowed a day to pass without giving me the pleasure of his society for a good many hours including at least one meal with him came rostam the young zoroastrian of whom i have already spoken who on this occasion outstayed the naeb this rostam was a well-mannered and intelligent lad whose only fault was an unduly deferential manner which at times i found rather irksome he asked me many questions about my country and about america yangi donya the new world in which like several other persians whom i met he appeared to take an extraordinary interest for what reason i know not since he had not the excuse of supposing like some mohammedans that thence by some underground channel antichrist dajjal shall reach the well in esfahan from which at the end of time he is to appear in the afternoon i went into the town accompanied by haji safar and mirza yusuf notwithstanding a message which i received from the sardar of sistan informing me of his intention of paying me a visit we passed the walls not by the adjacent darwaz e nasiriye but by another gate called darwaz e masjid the mosque gate lying more to the west from which a busy thoroughfare thronged especially on friday eve with a host of beggars leads directly to the bazaars and paid a visit to my zoroastrian friends in the caravanserai of ganj ali khan where for the most part their offices are situated and to the post office in the bazaars i met a quaint-looking old hindu who persisted in addressing me in his own uncouth hindi which he seemed to consider that i as an englishman was bound to understand we returned about sunset by the way we had come and met crowds of people who had been to pay their respects to a deceased saint interred in a mausoleum just outside the mosque gate re-entering the city on reaching the garden i found another visitor awaiting me an inquisitive meddlesome self-conceited scion of some once influential but now decayed family who in place of the abundant wealth which he had formerly possessed subsisted on a pension of one hundred fifty tomans allowed him by the prince governor in consideration of his former greatness for this person whose name was haji mohammad khan i conceived a very particular aversion he manifested a great curiosity as to my rank my income and the object of my journey and presently assured me that he detected in me a remarkable likeness to the prince of wales with whom he declared he had struck up an acquaintance one evening at the crystal palace don't attempt to deceive me he added with many sly nods and winks i understand how one of noble birth may for a time be under a cloud and may find it expedient to travel in disguise and to forego that state and circumstance to which he is justly entitled i am in somewhat the same position myself but i am not going to continue thus for long i have had a hint from the amino sultan and am wanted at tehran 
there are those who would like to prevent me reaching the capital he continued mysteriously but never fear i will outwit them when you leave kerman for shiraz i leave it in your company and with me you shall visit shahribabak and many other interesting places on our way thither naeb hassan fooled him to the top of his bent unfolding vast and shadowy pictures of my power and affluence and declaring that i had unlimited credit with the zoroastrian merchants of kerman which falsehoods haji muhammad khan whose copious libations of beer were rendering every moment more credulous and more mysterious greedily imbibed when he had gone i remonstrated vigorously with the naeb for his mendacity i suppose it is no use for me to remind you that it is wicked to tell lies i remarked but at least you must see how silly and how futile it is to make assertions whereof the falsity cannot remain hidden for more than a few days and which are likely to land me in difficulties but the naeb only shook his head and laughed as though to say that lying was in itself an artistic and pleasurable exercise of the imagination in which when there was no reason to the contrary he might fairly allow himself to indulge so finding remonstrance vain i presently retired to rest in some disgust friday seventh june twenty seventh ramazan in the morning i was visited by an old zoroastrian woman who was anxious to learn whether i had heard in tehran any talk of aflatoon plato having turned musulman it took me some little while to discover that the said aflatoon was not the greek philosopher but a young zoroastrian in whom she was interested though why a follower of the great mazdayasnian religion should take to himself a name like this baffles my comprehension in the afternoon i was invaded by visitors first of all came a baluch chief named afzal khan a picturesque old man with long black hair a ragged moustache very thin on the upper lip and very long at the ends and a singularly gorgeous coat he was accompanied by two lean and hungry-looking retainers all skin and sword-blade but though he talked much i had some difficulty in understanding him at times since he spoke persian after the corrupt and vicious fashion prevalent in india he inquired much of england and the english whom he evidently regarded with mingled respect and dislike Qal'ate nasiri is my city he replied in answer to a question which i put to him three months journey from here or two months if your horse be sound swift and strong khan khodadad khan is the amir if he be not dead as i have heard men say lately he informed me that his language was not baluchi but brahui which is spoken in a great part of baluchistan the next visitors to arrive were the postmaster aga muhammad saudeg the young yazdi merchant of whom i have already spoken and the eldest son of the prince telegraphist the last upbraided me for taking up my abode in the garden instead of in the new telegraph office which his father had placed at my disposal but his recriminations were cut short by the arrival of a tabrizi merchant two zoroastrians an azali babi whom i will call mulla yusuf to distinguish him from my tabrizi satellite mirza yusuf who appeared on this occasion as a zealous musulman and undertook to convince me on some future occasion of the superiority of islam to christianity and a middle-aged man of very subdued demeanour how deceptive may appearances be dressed in a long job fez and small white turban after the manner of asiatic turks to whom under the pseudonym of sheikh ibrahim of sultanabad i shall have frequent occasion to refer in this and the succeeding chapter
these in turn were followed by four more zoroastrians including gushtasp feridun and rostam who outstayed the other visitors and did not depart till they had pledged me in wine after the rite of the magians after which i had supper with naeb hassan and sat talking with him till nearly midnight saturday eighth june twenty eighth ramazan in the morning i visited one of the shawl manufactories of kerman in company with rostam naeb hassan and mirza yusuf of tabriz our way lay through the street leading to the mosque gate which by reason of the saturday market bazar shambe was thronged with people the shawl manufactory consisted of one large vaulted room containing eleven looms two or three of which were standing idle at each loom sat three workers one skilled workman in the middle and on either side of him a shagird or apprentice whom he was expected to instruct and supervise there were in all twenty-five apprentices ranging in years from children of six and seven to men of mature age their wages as i learned begin at ten tomans about three pounds a year and increase gradually to twenty-four or twenty-five tomans about seven pounds ten shillings in summer they work from sunrise to sunset and in winter they continue their work by candlelight till three hours after sunset they have a half holiday on friday from midday onwards thirteen days holiday at the nowruz and one or two days more on the great annual festivals while for food they get nothing as a rule but dry bread poor little kermanis they must toil thus deprived of good air and sunlight and debarred from the recreations and amusements which should brighten their childhood that some grandee may bedeck himself with those sumptuous shawls which beautiful as they are will evermore seem to me to be dyed with the blood of the innocents the shawls manufactured are of very different qualities the finest of three or three and a half ells in length require twelve or fifteen months for their completion and are sold at forty or fifty tomans apiece others destined for the constantinople market and of much coarser texture can be finished in a month or six weeks and are sold for ten or fifteen crowns of late however the shawl trade had been on the decline and the proprietor of this establishment told me that he was thinking of closing his workshops for a year and making a pilgrimage to karbala hoping i suppose to win by this act of piety the divine favour which he would have better merited by some attempt to ameliorate the condition of the poor little drudges who toiled at his looms i next visited the one fire temple which suffices for the spiritual needs of the kerman zoroastrians and was there received by the courteous and intelligent old dastur and my friend feridun i could not see the sacred fire because the mobad whose business it was to tend it had locked it up and taken the key away with him in general appearance this fire temple resembled those which i had seen at yazd i inquired as to the manuscripts of the sacred books preserved in the temple and was shown too a copy of the avesta of two hundred ten leaves transcribed in the year a h ten eighty six a d sixteen seventy five to six and completed on the day of alban in the month of bahman in the year ten forty four of yazdegerd by the hand of dastur marzaban the son of dastur bahram the son of marzaban the son of feridun and a copy of the yashts 
completed by the hand of Dastur Esfandiyar, the son of Dastur Nushirvan, the son of Dastur Esfandiyar, the son of Dastur Ardashir, the son of Dastur Alzar of Sistan, on the day of Bahman, in the month of Esfandarmad, in the year 1108 of Yezdegerd, corresponding to A.H. 1226, A.D. 1811. I found that the Dastur was much interested in the occult science of geomancy, Elme Ramal, which he informed me required the assiduous study of a lifetime ere one could hope to attain proficiency. He was also very full of a rare old book called the Jamasp Nome, of which he said only one copy, stolen by a Musulman named Hossein from the house of a Zoroastrian in Yazd, existed in Kerman, though he had information of another copy in the library of the mosque at Mashhad. This book he described as containing a continuous series of prophecies, amongst which was included the announcement of the return of Shah Bahram, the Zoroastrian Messiah, to re-establish the good religion. This Shah Bahram, to whose expected advent I have already alluded at page 395 supra, is believed to be a descendant of Hormoz, the son of Yezdegerd, the last Sasanian king, who fled from before the Arab invaders with Peshutan and other fire priests to China, whence he will return to Fars by way of India in the fullness of time. Amongst the signs heralding his coming will be a great famine and the destruction of the city of Shoshtar. In the evening I went for a ride outside the city with Feridun, Rostam, and the son of the postmaster we first visited a neighbouring garden to see the working of one of the dulabs, generally employed in Kerman for raising water to the surface. The dulab consisted of two large wooden wheels, one set horizontally and the other vertically, in the jaws of a well, cogged together. A blindfolded cow, harnessed to a shaft inserted in the axle of the former, communicated a rotatory motion to the latter, over which a belt of rope passed downwards into the well, to a depth of about five ells. To this rope earthenware pitchers were attached, and each pitcher, as it came uppermost on the belt, emptied its contents into a channel communicating with a small reservoir. The whole arrangement was primitive, picturesque, and inefficient from the dulab we proceeded to the old town shahr qadim situated on the craggy heights lying if i remember rightly to the west of the present city and said to date from the time of ardashir babakan the founder of the sasanian dynasty there are a number of ruined buildings on these heights including one known as the qadam gah where vows and offerings are made by the Kermanis. From this place we proceeded to another valley, closed to the south by beetling cliffs, studded with cavernous openings which are said to extend far into the rock. High up on the left of this valley is a little building known as Darya Qolibeg, whither, leaving our horses below, we ascended, and there sat for a while drinking wine by the light of the setting sun. My companions informed me that formerly the mouth of the valley below had been closed by a band, or dike, and all the upper part of it converted into a gigantic lake, whereon boat races, watched by the king and his court, from the spot where we sat, took place on certain festal occasions as we rode homewards in the gathering twilight the postmaster's son craved a boon of me which i think worth mentioning as illustrative of that strange yearning after martyrdom which is not uncommon amongst the bobbies 
bringing his horse alongside of mine at a moment when the two zoroastrians were engaged in a private conversation he thus addressed me saheb you intend as you have told me to visit acre if this great happiness be allotted to you and if you look upon the blessed beauty jamal -e mubarak that is baha'u'llah do not forget me nor the request which i now prefer say if opportunity be granted you there is such an one in kerman so and so by name whose chief desire is that his name may be mentioned once in the holy presence that he may once if it be not too much to ask be honoured by an epistle and that he may then quaff the draught of martyrdom in the way of the beloved sunday ninth june twenty ninth ramazan today i received a demonstration in geomancy elme ramal from a young zoroastrian bahram -e behruz whom i met in mulla gushdasp's room in the caravanserai of ganj ali khan the information about myself with which his science supplied him was almost entirely incorrect and was in substance as follows a month ago you received bad news and suffered much through some absent person fifteen days ago some physical injury befell you by the next post you will receive good news in another month you will receive very good news you are at present in good health but your calorie is in excess and the bilious humour predominates your appetite is bad and you should take some laxative medicine this is a fair specimen of the kind of answer which he who consults the ramal geomancer is likely to get but it is fair to say that bahram laid claim to no great proficiency in the science however he promised to introduce me to a mussulman who was reputed an adept of the occult sciences including the tashkhir -e jen or command of familiar spirits and this promise as will presently be set forth he faithfully kept while bahram was busy with his geomancy a dervish boy who afterwards proved to be a babi entered the room where we were sitting for the dervish is free to enter any assembly and to go wherever it seemeth good to him and presented me with a white flower i gave him a gran whereupon at the suggestion of one of those present he sung a ghazal or ode in a very sweet voice with a good deal of taste and feeling later on in the day i visited mirza rahim khan the farrash bashi and sheikh ibrahim of sultanabad whom i have already had occasion to mention the latter as i discovered had after the manner of galandars of his type taken up his abode in the house of the former till such time as he should be tired of his host or his host of him thence i went to the house of the sheikh of qom where i met two young artillery officers brothers one of whom subsequently proved to be an azali babi i was more than ever impressed with the sheikh's genial kindly manner and wide knowledge i inquired of him particularly as to the most authentic and esteemed collections of shiite traditions and he mentioned too the me'rajus sa'adat a scent of happiness and a very large and detailed work in fifteen or sixteen volumes by jamaluddin hassan ibn yusuf ibn ali of hella entitled allama the great doctor called beharul anwar oceans of light we then talked for a while about metaphysics and he expressed astonishment at the lack of interest in the subject generally prevalent in europe after which we passed by a natural transition to the doctrines of the sheikhis and babis about which he gave me not a little information 
it had been intended that i should visit the prince governor in company with the sheikh but the visit was postponed as the prince sent word that he was indisposed and wished to sleep in the evening i received another visit from the garrulous haji muhammad khan who seemed to me rather less disagreeable than on the occasion of his first call after his departure a temporary excitement was caused by the discovery of a theft which had been committed in the garden a shirazi muleteer who intended shortly to return home by way of sir john and nairiz had greatly importuned me to hire his mules for the journey and this i had very foolishly half consented to do these mules were accordingly tied up in the garden near my house and it was their coverings which as the muleteer excitedly informed us had been removed by the thief the curious thing was that my horse's coverings which were of considerably more value had not been touched and i am inclined to believe that the muleteer himself was the thief he caused me trouble enough afterwards for when owing to the ophthalmia with which i was attacked i was obliged to rescind the bargain he lodged a complaint against the poor gardener whom he charged with the theft a farrosh was sent by the vazir to arrest him whereupon the said gardener and his wife accompanied by the myrmidon of the law came before me wringing their hands uttering loud lamentations and beseeching me to intercede in their favour so though my eyes ached most painfully i was obliged to write a long letter to the vazir in persian declaring the gardener to be to the best of my belief an honest and worthy fellow and requesting as a personal favour that he might be subjected to no further annoyance i furthermore took the precaution of promising a present of money to the farrosh when he returned with the gardener in case the latter had suffered no ill treatment and thanks to these measures i succeeded in delivering him from the trouble in which the malice of the muleteer threatened to involve him but the effect of the exertion of my eyes in writing the letter was to cause a recrudescence of the inflammation which had previously been on the decline so the muleteer had his revenge which i suppose was what he desired and intended monday tenth june thirtieth ramazan in the morning i visited several persons in the town including two of my zoroastrian friends shahriar and bahman the shop of the former was crowded with soldiers just home from jask and bandar -e abbas so that conversation was impossible and i left almost immediately bahman on the other hand had only one visitor an old seyyed named aga seyyed hussein of jandak of whom i afterwards saw a great deal in fact rather more than i wished he conversed with me in a very affable manner chiefly of course on religious topics and amongst other things narrated to me the following curious legend about christ once upon a time said the seyyed the lord jesus upon whom be peace entered into a certain city now the king of that city had forbidden any one of his subjects on pain of death to shelter him or supply him with food nevertheless seeing a young man of very sorrowful countenance he craved his hospitality which was at once accorded after the lord jesus had supped and rested he inquired of his host wherefore he was so sorrowful and eventually ascertained that he had fallen in love with the king's daughter then said the lord jesus be of good cheer thou shalt win her go to the king's palace to-morrow and demand her in marriage and your proposal will not be rejected so the young man marvelling the while at his own audacity repaired on the morrow to the palace and demanded to see the king into whose presence he was presently ushered on hearing his proposal the king said my daughter shall be yours 
if you can give her a suitable dowry so the young man returned sadly to his home for he knew that such a dowry was far beyond his means and told the lord jesus what had passed then said the lord jesus if you will go to such and such a spot and search there you will find all that you seek he did so and found much gold and silver and many precious stones of great worth diamonds pearls rubies emeralds and the like beyond all that even the daughter of a king could expect or desire so the king bestowed on him his daughter's hand but after a time the lord jesus bade him leave all this and follow him and he knowing now that the great treasure compared to which all that he had given as the princess's dowry was as mere worthless dross was with christ alone abandoned all for his master's sake and indeed as this legend shows amongst all the prophets there was none who taught the path tariqat like the lord jesus and this remains amongst you christians in some measure even now though the law shariat which he brought has little by little disappeared before islam so that no vestige of it is left in the evening i received a visit from some of the leading members of the hindu community thirteen or fourteen in number who begged me to let them know if at any time they could be of service to me in any way we owe you this said they for it is through the protection of your government that we are able to live and carry on our business here in safety and security later in the evening i partook of supper with several of the zoroastrians at the dulab of the elder goshtasp tuesday eleventh june first shawal in the morning i had a visit from rostam the young zoroastrian he told me amongst other things of the persecutions to which his co-religionists were occasionally exposed formerly said he it would often happen that they carried off one of our boys or girls and strove to compel them by threats and torments to become mussulmans thus on one occasion they seized upon a zoroastrian boy twelve years of age carried him to the public bath and forced him to utter the mohammedan profession of faith and to submit to the operation of circumcision on another occasion they abducted two zoroastrian girls aged fifteen and twenty respectively and by every means in their power strove to compel them to embrace the religion of islam one of them held out against their importunities for a long while until at last they turned her out almost naked into the snow and she was ultimately compelled to submit in the afternoon i again went into the town to pay some visits i entered it by the darvaze gabr to the east of the darvaze nasserie and visited an old mosque situated near to that gate the mosque had as i was informed been wilfully destroyed by a former governor of the city but it still showed traces of its ancient splendour after visiting the hindus and some of my zoroastrian friends i proceeded to the house of the sheikh of qom with whom as it had been arranged i was to pay my respects to the prince governor after drinking tea we accordingly repaired to the bogue which is situated near to the gate of the same name on the arrival of the prince nasiruddole we were conducted to an upper chamber where he received me in the kindliest and most friendly manner he talked to me chiefly about the condition of baluchistan which as well as kerman was under his government and declared that a very notable improvement had taken place during the last few years i then presented my letter of recommendation from prince emodo dole of yazd and took occasion to mention the forlorn condition of mirza yusuf of tabriz and his hope 
that the shadow of the royal protection might not be withheld from him and that he might aspire to be numbered amongst the prince's servants in the evening i was again entertained at supper by one of my zoroastrian friends named shahriar all the other guests were of the good religion save myself naib hassan who still continued to accompany me everywhere and to consider himself as invited to every feast whereunto i was bidden and a singer named farajullah who had been summoned for our entertainment wednesday twelfth june second shawwal towards evening i was visited by the baluch chief afzal khan and his son seyyed hussein of jandag the sheikh of qom and his friend the young babi gunner and mulla yusuf the azali between the last and seyyed hussein a violent dispute arose touching the merits and demerits of the first three caliphs so called omar abu bakr and uthman whereby the other visitors were so wearied that they shortly departed and finally the seyyed was left in undisputed possession of the field which he did not abandon till he had prayed the prayers of sundown maghrib and nightfall i share and explained to me at length the significance of their various component parts adding that if i would remain in kerman for one month he would put me in possession of all the essentials of islam naib hassan and feridun had supper with me in the char fasl or summer house on the roof of which i sat late in the latter and finally fell asleep with the song of a nightingale sweet-voiced as esrafil ringing in my ears thursday thirteenth june third shawwal in the morning while walking in the bazaars i met afzal khan the baluch with his ragged and hungry-looking retainers he invited me to return with him to his lodging situated near the darvaze rigabad and i having nothing else to do and not wishing to offend him accepted his invitation on our arrival there he insisted notwithstanding my earnest protests on sending out for sherbets and sweetmeats wherewith to do me honour and he put me to further shame by continued apologies for the unfurnished condition of his abode and the humble character of his entertainment repeating again and again that he was only a poor baluch presently he got on the subject of his wrongs the english government so he declared had taken into their service one of his relatives who had forthwith made use of his new privileges to dispossess him of all his property and generally speaking to make his life a burden to him he had therefore come to kerman to seek employment from prince nasiruddole if he will not help me concluded afzal khan i intend to go to mashhad and seek assistance from the english officials residing there and if they will do nothing for me i will place my services at the disposal of the russians shortly afterwards i rose to go alleging when afzal khan pressed me to stay that i had letters to write what letters he inquired suspiciously oh i answered carelessly letters of all sorts to yazd to shiraz and this though true was not said altogether without mischievous intent to mashhad then afzal khan as i had anticipated became very perturbed and anxiously inquired what acquaintances i had at mashhad evidently supposing that i intended to inform the english representatives there of his intentions so that they might intercept him in case he should attempt to reach russian territory but indeed the poor fellow's services on which he evidently set a high value were not likely to be accounted as of much value by any one else persian english or russian in the afternoon i visited mulla yusuf the azali who though he talked about nothing else than religion confined himself much to my disappointment to the mohammedan dispensation he admitted my contention that by many paths men may attain to a knowledge of god 
and that salvation was not for the votaries of one religion only but maintained that though all roads led to the same goal some were safe short and sure and others circuitous and perilous wherefore said he it behoves us to seek the shortest and safest way whereby we may most speedily and with least danger attain the desired haven we had a good deal of discussion too about the code of laws established by muhammad some of which as for example the punishment of theft by amputation of the hand i condemned as barbarous and irrational to this he replied by arguing that the lex talionis was intended merely to fix the extreme limit of punishment which could be inflicted on an offender and that forgiveness was as highly extolled by the mohammedan as by the christian religion this discussion lasted so long that on reaching the gate on my homeward way i found it shut and was obliged to creep through a hole in the city wall known to the cunning Nolib Hassan. End of section thirty six. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Section thirty seven of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org recording by nicholas james bridgewater a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown section 37 friday 14th june 4th shawwal this afternoon mulla yusuf the azali and one of his friends came to visit me and continue the discussion of yesterday they talked much about reason and the universal intelligence which according to the words was the first creation or emanation of god and which at diverse times and in diverse manners has spoken to mankind through the mouth of the prophets reason said they is of four kinds Aql bil potential reason such as exists in an untaught child Aql bil fil actual or effective reason such as belongs to those of cultivated intelligence Aql bil meleke habitual reason such as the angels enjoy and Aql mustakfi all sufficing reason this last is identical with the first intelligence agle aval or universal reason agle koli which inspires the prophets and indeed becomes incarnate in them so that by it they have knowledge of all things that is of their essences not of the technical terms which in the eyes of men constitute an integral part of science whosoever is endowed with this all-sufficing reason and claims to be a prophet must be accepted as such but unless he chooses to advance this claim men are not obliged to accord him this rank next in rank to the prophet nabi is the saint vali whose essential characteristic is a love for god which makes him ready to lay down his life willingly and joyfully for his sake the love of the valley is such that by it he often becomes insensible to pain thus it is related of ali ibn abi talib the first imam that he was once wounded in the foot by an arrow attempts made to extract it only resulted in detaching the shaft from the barb which remained in the wound and caused so much pain that it seemed impossible for ali to endure any further operation then said one of his sons wait till the time for prayer comes round for when my father is engaged in prayer he becomes unconscious of all earthly things 
being wholly absorbed in communion with god and you can then extract the arrowhead without his so much as feeling it and this they did with complete success mulla yusuf told me another anecdote about ali which though it is well known to students of arabic history note see for instance al fakhri edition alvart page fifty four end note will bear repetition he had overthrown an infidel foe and kneeling on his prostrate body was about to dispatch him with his sword when the fallen unbeliever spat in his face thereupon ali at once relinquished his hold on his adversary rose to his feet and sheathed his sword on being asked the reason of this he replied when he spat in my face i was filled with anger against him and i feared that should i kill him personal indignation would partially actuate me wherefore i let him go since i would not kill him otherwise than from a sincere and unmixed desire to serve god at this point our conversation was interrupted by the arrival of mirza yusuf of tabriz accompanied by one of the prince's servants who in turn were followed by feridun and naeb hassan the two last and mirza yusuf remained to drink wine after the others had gone and mirza yusuf who was in a boastful humour began to say if you wish to know anything about the bobbies i am the man to tell you for i knew all their chief men at yazd and indeed professed myself a convert to their doctrines so as to gain their confidence they gave me some of their books to read including one note the book entitled kalimat maknu fatima hidden words of fatima is intended see for a description of this book my catalogue of twenty-seven bobby manuscripts in the journal of the royal asiatic society for eighteen ninety two pages six seventy one to five end note wherein the reader was addressed in such words as o child of earth o child of my handmaid and the like and in fact mirza yusuf had succeeded in finding out a good deal about the babis though his information was in some matters erroneous he declared for instance that qurratul ain was put to death by being cast from the summit of the citadel arg at tabriz but that the first time she was launched into the air she was so buoyed up by her clothes that she escaped all hurt note mirza yusuf had evidently mixed together a real fact the bob's martyrdom in the square of the citadel at tabriz with a story referring to the miraculous escape of a woman cast from its summit which story has been already referred to at page fifty eight supra end note my last visitor was seyyed hassan of jandag whose arrival caused the other guests to conceal the wine and at the earliest possible opportunity to depart he was in a captious frame of mind finding fault with the newspaper Akhtar, of which the sheikh of qom had sent me a recent issue for talking about the zealous sultan's resignation estetfal instead of calling it in plain persian his dismissal azl and taking exception to sundry idioms and expressions in a letter from the prince governor of yazd which at his request i allowed him to read saturday fifteenth june fifth shawwal today while i was sitting in the shop of a merchant of my acquaintance haji abdullah of shiraz bahram behruz hurried up to inform me that his friend the magician haji mirza mohsen the controller of spirits and genies was at that moment in his shop and that if i would come thither he would present me to him i wished to go at once but haji abdullah and naeb hassan strove to detain me 
and while we were engaged in discussion the magician passed by the shop in person haji abdullah invited him to enter which he at first declined to do and made as though he would pass on but suddenly changing his mind he turned back entered the shop and seated himself amongst us this sahib said naib hassan as soon as the customary greetings had been exchanged has heard of your skill in the occult sciences and desires to witness a specimen of the powers with which you are credited what would it profit him replied the magician and then turning to me is your motive in desiring to witness an exhibition of my powers a mere idle curiosity or is it that you seek to understand the science by means of which i can produce effects beyond the power or comprehension of your learned men sir i answered my object in making this request is in the first instance to obtain ocular evidence of the existence of powers generally denied by our men of learning but which i in the absence of any sufficient evidence presume neither to deny nor to affirm if having given me such evidence of their existence as i desire you will further condescend to acquaint me with some of the principles of your science i need not say that my gratitude will be increased but even to be convinced that such powers exist would be a great gain you have spoken well said the magician with approval and i am willing to prove to you the reality of that science concerning which you doubt but first of all let me tell you that all that i can accomplish i do by virtue of powers centred in myself not as men affirm by the instrumentality of the jinn which indeed are mere creatures of the imagination and have no real existence has any one of you a comb haji abdullah at once produced a comb from the recesses of his pocket and handed it to haji mohsen who threw it on the ground at a distance of about three feet from him to the left then he again turned to me and said are your men of learning acquainted with any force inherent in the human body whereby motion may be communicated without touch to a distant object no i replied apart from the power of attraction latent in amber the magnet and some other substances we know of no such force certainly not in the human body very well said he then if i can make this comb come to me from the spot where it lies you will have to admit that i possess a power whereof your learned men do not even know the existence then the distance is in this case small and the object light and easily movable is nothing and does not in the least degree weaken the force of the proof i could equally transport you from the garden where you live to any place which i choose now look then he moistened the tip of his finger with his tongue leaned over to the left and touched the comb once after which he resumed his former position beckoned to the comb with the fingers of his left hand and called bio bio come come thereat to my surprise the comb spun rapidly round once or twice and then began to advance towards him in little leaps he continuing the while to beckon it onwards with the fingers of his left hand which he did not otherwise move so far one might have supposed that when he touched the comb with his moistened finger-tip he had attached to it a fine hair or strand of silk by which while appearing but to beckon with his fingers he dexterously managed to draw the comb towards him but now 
as the comb approached within eighteen inches or so of his body he extended his left hand beyond it continuing to call and beckon as before so that for the remainder of its course it was receding from the hand always with the same jerky spasmodic motion haji mohsen now returned the comb to its owner and requested me for the loan of my watch i handed to him the clumsy china-backed watch which i had bought at tehran to replace the one which i had lost between erzerum and tabriz and he did with it as he had done with the comb save that when he began to call and beckon to it it made one rapid gyration and a short leap towards him and then stopped he picked it up looked closely at it and returned it to me saying there is something amiss with this watch of yours it seems to me that it is stolen property well i replied rather tartly i did not steal it at any rate i bought it in tehran for three tomans to replace my own watch which i lost in turkey how it came into the hands of him from whom i bought it i cannot of course say after this the magician became very friendly with me promising to visit me in my lodging and show me feats far more marvellous than what i had just witnessed you shall select any object you choose said he and bury it wherever you please in your garden so that none but yourself shall know where it is hidden i will then come and pronounce certain incantations over a brass cup which will then lead me direct to the place where the object is buried hearing that i was to visit the vazir of kerman he insisted on accompanying me the vazir was a courteous old man of very kindly countenance and gentle manners and i stayed conversing with him for more than half an hour a number of persons were present including the kalantar or mayor whose servant had that morning received a severe application of the bastinado for having struck the kad khoda or chief man of a village to which he had been sent to collect taxes or rents haji mirza mohsen who lacked nothing so little as assurance gave the vazir a sort of lecture on me as though i were a curious specimen which he concluded somewhat to my consternation by declaring that he intended to accompany me back to my own country and to enlighten the ignorance of its learned men as to the occult sciences of which he was a master on leaving the vizier's presence i accompanied the magician to his lodging and was introduced to his brother a fine-looking man of middle age dressed after the fashion of the baghdadis in jobbe fez and white turban who spoke both arabic and ottoman turkish with fluency there were also present a number of children belonging as i gathered to haji mirza mohsen who was still mourning a domestic tragedy which had recently led to the death of his eldest son a lad of sixteen ah you should have seen him he said such a handsome boy and so quick and clever none of my other children can compare with him he did not acquaint me with the details of his son's untimely death which according to naeb hassan were as follows one of mirza mohsen's servants or disciples had a very beautiful wife with whom his son fell madly in love mirza mohsen on being informed by the boy of his passion promised to induce the girl's husband to free her by divorce in this he succeeded but instead of bestowing her hand on his son he married her himself the lad remonstrated vehemently with his father who only replied it was for my sake not yours that her former husband divorced her thereupon the boy in an access of passionate disappointment shot himself through the head two stages out from kerman whither they were then journeying from sir john sunday sixteenth june sixth shavol 
Today I was invited to take my midday meal, Nahar, with the postmaster. On my way thither I encountered, near the Darvaz Masjid, one of my Zoroastrian friends, K. Khosro, who informed me with some excitement that two Farangis had just arrived in Kerman. Come and talk to them, he added, for they are now in the street a little farther on. I accordingly followed him, though with no great alacrity, for I enjoyed the feeling of being the only European in Kerman, and had no wish to spoil the unmixedly Persian character of my environment, by forming an acquaintance with two promiscuous Europeans, who might very likely, I thought, be mere adventurers, and whose presence I was inclined to resent. We soon found one of the newcomers, a little grey-bearded Frenchman, who was very reticent as to his object in visiting Kerman, and told me no more than his companion, also French, spoke English much better than himself, which I could readily believe, for his pronunciation was vile, and his vocabulary most meagre, and that they had come to Turkestan, Bukhara and Samarkand by way of Mashhad, and thence through the deserts by way of Tun and Tabas to Kerman. He then went on to inquire with some eagerness whether there were in the town any cafes or wine shops. Wine shops in Kerman! And seemed much disconcerted when he heard that there were not. I soon left him and proceeded to the postmaster's house. There I found one Mirza Muhammad Khan of the Shah Ni'matullahi order of dervishes, Sheikh Ibrahim of Sultanabad, and another, a parcher of peas, Nukhod Beriz, by profession, whom, as I should have to say a good deal about him before I bid farewell to Kerman, and, as I do not wish to mention his real name, I will call Ustal Akbar. Till lunchtime we sat in the Tambal Khane, idler's room or drawing room, smoking kalyans and conversing on general topics, including, of course, religion. The postmaster told me that he had a book wherein the truth of each dispensation, down to the present one, or Bobby manifestation, was proved by that which preceded it and this book he promised to lend me so soon as it was returned to him by a zoroastrian in whose hands it then was i asked him about the signs which should herald the manifestation of the end of time and he said that amongst them were the following that men should ride on iron horses that they should talk with one another from great distances that they should talk on their fingers and that men should wear women's clothes and women men's of which signs he added you will observe that the first clearly indicates the railroad the second the telephone and the third the telegraph so that nothing is wanting to apprise men of the advent of the most great theophany i inquired of him as i had previously inquired of the sheikh of qom as to the best and most authentic collections of shiite traditions and he mentioned with a special commendation the osule kafi the rosea kafi and the man la yahzori of faqi after lunch most of the guests indulged in a nap but the parcher of peas came and talked to me for a while in a very wild strain with which i subsequently became only too familiar if you would see adam he said i am adam if noah i am noah if abraham i am abraham if moses i am moses if christ lo i am christ why do you not say at once i am god i retorted yes he replied there is naught but he i tried to ascertain his views as to the future of the human soul but could exact from him no very satisfactory answer as one candle is lit from another said he so is life kindled from life 
if the second candle should say i am the first candle it speaks truly for in essence it is indeed that first candle which has thrust forth its head from another garment presently we were interrupted by the arrival of visitors the officious and meddlesome haji muhammad khan and the mulla bashi as soon as the customary forms of politeness had been gone through the latter turned to me saying soheb what is all this that we hear about you and haji mirza mohsen the magician is it true if you would kindly tell me what you have heard i replied i should be better able to answer your question well he answered haji mirza mohsen is telling everyone that you being skilled in the magic of the west had challenged him to a contest that you gave what proofs you could of your power and he of his but that he wrought marvels beyond your power and amongst other things wrote a few lines on a piece of paper burned it before your eyes and then drew it out from your pocket that thereupon you had said that if he could summon the spirit of your father and cause it to converse with you in the french language you would embrace the religion of islam and that he had done what you demanded is this true and are you really going to become a mussulman really i replied i am not and were i disposed to do so haji mohsen whom after what you have told me i must regard as a liar of quite exceptional attainments is not exactly the sort of person who would affect my conversion as for his story every word of it is false all that actually happened was this here i described our meeting in haji shirazi's shop furthermore my father by the grace of god is alive and in good health neither do i see why in any case he should address me in french since my language and his is english on returning to the garden i found afzal khan the baluch and his retainers mulla goshtasp and agha seyyed hossein of jandag awaiting my arrival the first somewhat overpowered by the seyyed's theology probably left very soon but the seyyed as usual stayed a long while and talked a great deal he first of all produced a small treatise on physiognomy el me piofe of which he declared himself to be the author and proceeded to apply the principles therein laid down to me you have a very long arm and long fingers said he which shows that you are determined to wield authority and to exercise supremacy over your fellows also that you take care that whatever work you do shall be sound and thorough he next produced a collection of aphorisms which he had written out for me of which the only one i remember is eat the bread of no man and withhold thine own bread from none he then dictated to me four questions connected with religion which he wished me to copy out on four separate pieces of paper and send to the prince governor with a letter requesting him to submit them to four learned theologians whom he named and to require them to give an immediate answer without consulting together or taking time to reflect you will see the seyyed remarked with an anticipatory chuckle that they will all give different answers and all wrong so that the prince will recognize the inadequacy of their learning i only remember one of these questions which ran as follows which of the four gospels now in the hands of the christians is the injil mentioned in the quran while we were engaged in this conversation the present proprietor of the garden mirza javad son of agha seyyed rahim the late vazir of kerman was announced he was a portly pleasant-looking man of about forty-five or fifty and was accompanied by his son a very beautiful boy of unusually fair complexion with dark blue eyes and long eyebrows and eyelashes 
rendered even more conspicuous than they would naturally have been by a liberal application of sorme and timony the seyed however did not allow their presence long to interrupt the unceasing stream of his eloquence and began to catechize me about the gospels asserting that the very fact of their being four proved that they were spurious and that the true gospel had disappeared from the earth he then inquired whether wine was lawful according to our law i replied that it was inasmuch as we knew that christ himself tasted wine on several occasions i take refuge with god cried the seyed it is a calumny this alone is sufficient to prove that your gospels are spurious for none of the prophets have ever drunk wine well i said i do not quite see your object in trying to disprove the genuineness of our gospels i imagine that you wish to convince me of the truth of islam but please to remember that if you could succeed in convincing me that the gospels now in our hands are forgeries you having no other and genuine gospel to put in their place you would be no nearer converting me to islam but rather further from it than at present you would either make me disbelieve in revealed religion altogether or you would drive me back on the pentateuch and make me a jew there is something in that replied the seyed and i am now disposed to understand the matter in a different way the word sharab originally means any kind of drink since the verb sharibe from which it is derived is employed in a perfectly general sense your priests have not understood this and have wrongly explained it as wine the very miracle which you adduce as evidence proves my point for you say that the attendants at the wedding feast were bidden to fill the jars with water it is quite clear that what christ wished to show was that water was the best and most exhilarating of drinks and that it was lawful not unlawful like wine the little boy seemed to take the liveliest interest in this discussion and kept whispering suggestions to the seyed for he like his father was imbued with the ideas of the sheikhis and was evidently not unwilling to make a display of his knowledge the seyed outstayed the other visitors and squatting down by the little stream proceeded to give me much advice a thing whereof he was ever prodigal mingled with hints and warnings which i was for some time unable to comprehend don't cultivate an acquaintance of so-and-so mentioning one of my bobby friends too much he began and don't visit his house more than you can help the prince doesn't like him why doesn't he like him i inquired the prince had a very beautiful wife called pambe cotton rejoined the seyed and one day in a fit of temper he said to her go to your father's house but without explicitly divorcing her your friend mirza blank lived next door to her father saw her was smitten with her charms and took her in marriage but when the prince who soon repented of his hasty conduct desired to take her back he found that she was the wife of another naturally he was greatly incensed with mirza blank naturally i said but he would hardly be incensed with me for visiting him you don't understand my point said the seyed the people of kerman are the greatest gossips and scandal-mongers under the sun and the people of kerman will say that you go there to see pambe who is the most beautiful woman in the city what nonsense i exclaimed why i never even heard of pambe till this moment and when i go to see mirza blank i am naturally not introduced to his wives never mind you that said he take my advice and keep away from his house 
you can't be too careful here you don't know what the kermanis are like it was a most unfortunate thing that mirza javad found me here when he came to see you it was very nice for him i replied no doubt but why so specially fortunate because answered he seeing that i am your friend and associate and hearing our improving conversation he will think the better of you and will be the slower to credit any slanders against you which he may hear i am not aware said i that i have given any occasion for slander perhaps you do not know what people say about your servant hoji safars Sipe, returned he what do you mean i demanded sharply i was not aware that he had a seeker the seyyid laughed a little unpleasant incredulous laugh uh, uh, really said he that is very curious i should have supposed that he would have consulted you first anyhow there is no doubt about the matter for i drew up the contract myself and men say that the sikhe though taken in his name was really intended for you here i must explain what a sikhe is note for fuller details see guerriers droit musulman paris eighteen seventy one volume one pages six eighty nine to six ninety five from which admirable compendium of shiite law i have drawn several of the particulars given in the text End note. a shiite may according to his law contract a temporary marriage with a woman of his own or of the jewish christian or though some contest this magian faith for a fixed period of time which may vary from a fraction of a day to a year or several years properly speaking it is the contract drawn up by the officiating mullah in which both the period of the duration of the marriage and the amount of the dowry though this last may be no more than a handful of barley must be specified which is called the sikhe but the term is commonly applied to the woman with whom such marriage is contracted this species of marriage if it can be dignified by this name though held in very proper detestation by sunnite mohammedans is regarded by the shiites as perfectly legal and children resulting from it are held to be lawful offspring though prevalent to some extent throughout persia it flourishes with a special vigour in kerman where owing to the great poverty of the people the small dowry bestowed on the sikh induces many parents to seek for their daughters such engagement bad as this institution is at the best the mullahs by one of those unrighteous legal quibbles of which they are so fond have succeeded in making it yet more abominable according to the law a sikh on completing the contracted period must before going to another husband wait for forty-five days or two months to ascertain whether or no she is with child by the former husband this however only applies to cases where the marriage has been actually consummated so as many of these women are practically seekers by trade and do not wish to be subjected to this period of probation the more laws have devised the following means of evading the law when the contracted period of marriage has come to an end the man makes a fresh contract with the woman for another very short period this second purely nominal marriage being with the same man as the first is legal without any intervening period of probation and is not consummated so that on its expiration the woman is free to marry another man as soon as she pleases the seyyid's hints whether intended maliciously or prompted by a friendly feeling caused me a good deal of disquietude for absurd and false as the slander was i clearly saw that if it gained the credence of the vulgar it might become a source of actual peril Haji safar who made no attempt to exculpate himself 
was of the same opinion and entreated me to leave kerman as soon as possible sahib he concluded you do not know the malice and mischief of which these accursed kermanis are capable if we stay here much longer they will find some pretext for killing us both nonsense i said they are a quiet peaceable downtrodden folk these same kermanis though over fond of idle tattle besides you know what sheikh sa'di says Onra ke hesab palkast as mohasebe che balkast to him whose account is clean what fear is there of the reckoning but in future i hope that you will be careful to avoid doing anything which may compromise my good name i have no wish to interfere either with your religion or with such indulgences as are accorded to you by it but i have a right to expect that you will avoid anything which is liable to discredit my character and so the matter dropped the quotation from sa'di being more effective as quotations from sa'di or hafiz always are with a persian than any quantity of argument i have had occasion to allude to the unrighteous quibbles whereby the mullahs while keeping the letter contravene the spirit of the law and i may here add an instance which was related to me today by one of my balbi friends of the gross ignorance which sometimes characterizes their decisions a certain man in kerman wishing to expose this ignorance addressed the following question to a distinguished member of the local clergy i agreed with a laborer said he to dig in my garden a whole one yard square for eight crowns he has dug a hole half a yard square how much should i pay him half the sum you agreed upon of course said the mullah that is to say four crowns after thinking for a while however he corrected himself two crowns is the sum which you legally owe him he declared and this decision he committed to writing and sealed with his seal then the inquirer demonstrated to him that the labor required to excavate a hole measuring half a yard in each direction was only an eighth part of that needed for the excavation of one measuring a yard in each direction this conclusion the cleric resisted as long as he could but being at length compelled to admit its justice he got out of the difficulty by declaring that though mathematically the laborer could only claim one kron his legal due was two krons end of section 37 Re section 38 of a year amongst the persians by edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monday, the seventeenth of June, or seventh of Shawwal. This afternoon, I visited a young secretary of the prince with whom I had become acquainted, and found him with a son of the prince telegraphist, Mullah Yusuf, and other congenial friends, all or nearly all as Ali Babis, sitting round a little tank which occupied the centre of the room and smoking opium. The discussion, as usual, turned on religion and Mullah Yusuf gave me some further instances of the kibbles whereby the Shia clergy and their followers have made the law of no effect. There are, said he, six obligations incumbent on every Musalman, to wit, prayer, salat, fasting, siyam, pilgrimage, hajj, teeth homes alms zakat and under certain circumstances 
religious warfare jihad of these six the last three have practically become null and void of religions war they are afraid because the infidels have waxed strong and because they remember the disastrous results which attended their more recent enterprises of this sort as for the teeths homes literally fifths they should be paid to poor seyyids or descendants of the prophet and how do you suppose they manage to save their money and salve their consciences at the same time why they place the amount of the money which they ought to give in a jar and pour treacle shire over it then they offer this jar to a poor seyyid without of course letting him know about the money which it contains and when he has accepted it buy it back from him for two or three garans or else they offer him one toman on condition that he signs a receipt for fifty i turned these admissions against mullah yusuf when he began to argue for the superiority of islam over christianity you yourself i said declare that the essential characteristic of the prophetic word is that it has power to control men's hearts and as you have just told me that out of six things which muhammad made binding on his followers three have become of non effect you cannot wonder if i question the proof of islam by your own criterion god knows that the mass of professing christians are very far from putting into constant practice all the commands laid upon them by him whom they profess to follow but i should be sorry to think that his precepts and example had as little effect on my countrymen as those of muhammad on your own showing seem to have on yours on returning to the garden i found a note from the officious haji muhammad khan inquiring whether i had learned anything more about the two frenchmen who had arrived in kerman he had also left with haji safar a verbal message asking for some brandy which message by reason of sayyid hussein's presence haji safar communicated to me in turkish don't attempt to conceal anything from me exclaimed the seyyid by talking a foreign language for i perfectly understand what you are talking about this however was as i believe a mere idle boast from mullah yusuf i today obtained a more circumstantial account than i had yet heard of an event which some time ago created a good deal of excitement in kerman especially amongst the bobbies a lad of fifteen the son of an architect in the city who had been brought up in the doctrines of the sheikhis turned babi and inspired by that reckless zeal which is the special characteristic of the people of the bayan repaired to langar the headquarters of the sheikhis and the residence of the sons of haji muhammad karim khan and there publicly addressed the assembled sheikhis on the signs of the manifestation of imam mahdi and the general theory of the theophanes the sheikhis believing him to be one of themselves at first listened complacently enough as he developed his doctrine and were even pleased with his eloquence and fervor but when after declaring that in each dispensation there must needs be a point of darkness opposed to the point of light an emrud against an abraham a pharaoh against a moses an abu jahl against a muhammad an antichrist or dajjal against a mahdi he so described the point of light and point of darkness of this cycle as to make it clear that by the former he meant mirza ali muhammad the bab 
and by the latter, Haji Muhammad Karim Khan, the fury of his audience burst forth. They seized him, dragged him from the mosque, reviled him, cursed him, pelted him with stones, bound him to a tree, and scourged him most cruelly. In spite of all they could do, however, it continued to laugh and exult, so that at last they were obliged to release him. Tuesday the 18th of June, the 8th of Shawwal. This afternoon I received another visit from Afsal Khan, the Baluch, who wished me to give him a letter of introduction to my friend, the Nawab Mirza Hassan, Ali Khan at Mashhad, whither he proposed to proceed shortly. Then he began to persuade me to accompany him thither and thence onwards to Kandahar and Galat Nasiri, his home in Baluchistan. You say you are a traveler, concluded he, desirous of seeing as much as you can of the world. Well, Baluchistan is part of the world, and a very fine part too. Not Persian Baluchistan, of course, which is a poor, miserable place, but our own land. I declined his seductive offer, and thereupon he taunted me with being afraid. At this juncture, the Sheikh of Rome and the postmaster's son arrived. Well, said the Sheikh, when the usual greetings had been exchanged, what do you make of these two Farangis who have come to Kerman? Hitherto, I replied, I have hardly seen them and consequently am not in a position to form an opinion. They declare themselves to be Frenchmen, continued the sheikh, but if so, it's a very astonishing thing that they should be so wanting in good manners as they appear to be, for we always suppose the French to be remarkable amongst European nations for their courtesy and politeness. Your supposition is correct as a rule. I answered, even though there be exceptions, but you know, the aphorism, enadero kalmaadun, the exceptional is as the non-existent. In what way have they shown a lack of courtesy? Why, said the sheikh, his royal highness, the prince, may God perpetuate his rule, naturally wish to see them, and ascertain the business which had brought them here. So he sent a message inviting them to visit him. They refused to come. He was naturally very angry, but seeing that they were Farangis, and so saving your presence not to be judged by our standards of good behavior, he swallowed down his annoyance and sent another message saying, Since you do not wish to visit me, I must needs visit you. In answer to this second message, they sent back word that their lodging was not suitable for receiving so august a personage. His Royal Highness hesitated to punish their churlishness, as it deserved. But finding that they had with them a Persian attendant, lent to them by the governor of Mashhad, with whom Prince Nasser Dole is not on the best of terms, he ordered him to come to the palace for interrogation on the following day. For, thought he, him at least I can oblige to speak. When the Farangis found that their fists were going to be opened in spite of them, they decided to accompany their man before the prince, and without giving any notice of their visit, in they marched with their great dirty boots, which they never even offered to remove neither would they give any satisfactory account of themselves or their business. We think it probable that they are come after walnut trees, which, as men say, they cut and polish in some manner known to themselves, in such a way that pictures or reflections of any scene which may have taken place in the neighborhood of the tree appear in the polished surface of the wood. But of this you probably know more than we do. 
The question is, are they really Frenchmen, as they assert? I don't know, said I. All I can say is that they talk French so far as I can judge as though it were their native language. Don't you believe a word of it? broke in the Baluch. They're no more French than I am. Who are the French that they should dare to act toward his royal highness as these men have done? No, they are either Russians or English, of that you may be sure. We laughed at the Baluch's ideas on the balance of power in Europe, while he continued with increasing excitement. If his royal highness will but give me a hint, I will seek out these Farangis in their lodging, I and my companions here, and will kill them and cut off their heads, and lay them at the prince's feet. And how would you do that? asked the sheikh, with difficulty suppressing his mirth. Do it, rejoiced Afzal Khan, easily enough. I would find out where they lodged, walk in one fine day with an assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, and cut them down with this sword of mine before they had time to speak, or flee, or offer the slightest resistance. Oh, said the sheikh, but that wouldn't be at all right. You shouldn't say peace be upon you to a man you're just going to kill. Why not? retorted the Baluch. They're infidels, kafirs, and such it is lawful to slay in any manner. But he is a kafir too, slyly remarked the sheikh, pointing towards myself. Yes, I know he is, exclaimed the Baluch, and if only... Here he was interrupted by a general row of laughter. Oh, most excellent Khan! I cried as soon as the general merriment had somewhat subsided. Now your fist is opened. Now I see why you were so eager for me to accompany you to your interesting, hospitable country. A long journey, in sooth, would it have been, and one, as I think, and which I might have set out singing, Dame raftan ast, orfi, birokhash nezarei kon, ke omid baz gashtan kas az in safar nadara. This the moment of departure, O Orphi. Take a last look at his face, for from this journey none may hope to return. The Baluch hung his head in some confusion, and then began to laugh gently. You are quite right, Sahib, he said, but I know very well that you are an agent of your government, engaged in heaven knows what mischief here why look at me i replied i live as you see like a dervish without any of the circumstance or having which befits any envoy of such a government as ours ay he retorted but you english are cunning enough to avoid ostentation when it suits your own ends to do so I know you to my cost, and that is the way it always begins. And so the matter dropped, and that was the last I saw of my friend Afzal Khan. Later on several other visitors came, the Sayyid of course, Haji Shirazi, who was immensely convivial, having as he informed me, drunk half a bottle of brandy for his stomach's sake, and the parcher of peas. The last drew me aside out of the hearing of the Sayyid, between whom and himself subsisted a most violent antipathy, and said he had come to ask me to have supper one night with him, the postmaster, and some other congenial friends, so that we could converse quietly and without fear of intrusion. Thank you, I said. I shall be very pleased to come any evening that suits you, and I am no less anxious than yourself for an opportunity for some quiet conversation, for hitherto 
though i know that many of my friends here are bobbies we have only talked on side issues and have never come to the main point and it's about the bob especially and qurratul ain and the others not about baha that i want to hear it was he whom i heard about and learned to admire and love before i left my native country and since my arrival in persia though i have conversed with many babis it is always of baha that they speak baha may be very well and may be superior to the bab but it's about the bab that i want to hear yes he replied you shall hear about him for he is worth hearing about the lord jesus come back to earth in another form he was but a child of nineteen when his mission began and was only twenty-six when they killed him killed him because he was a charmer of hearts and for no crime but this dar kodam millat astin dar kodam mazhab astin ke kushand dilbari ra ke to dil ruba chirai in what church in what religion is this lawful that they should kill a charmer of hearts saying why dost thou steal hearts whose is that verse i inquired oh he replied the original verse is araghis and runs thus dar kodam millat astin dar kodam mazhab astin ke kushand aashiqi ra ke to aashiqam chera in what church in what religion is this lawful that they should kill a lover saying why art thou my lover but we have altered the verse to suit our purpose at this point the sayyid was seen approaching us and the parcher of peas fled as from the angel of death but haji shiraz and after supper consumed as much brandy as he could get observing repeatedly in a rather unsteady voice that no amount of it produced any effect upon him because moisture so greatly predominated in his natural temperament section thirty nine of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown section thirty nine wednesday nineteenth june ninth shawwal this morning i received a visit from a very melancholy person who i think held the office of treasurer to the prince governor he told me that he did not like europeans and would not have come to see me if he had not heard that i unlike most of them took an interest in religious questions into which he forthwith plunged arguing against the possibility of the use of wine being sanctioned by any true prophet and defending the seclusion of women and the use of the veil against these last i argued very earnestly pointing out the evils which as it appeared to me resulted from them he was silent for a while after i had finished speaking and then said it is true i admit the force of your arguments and i cannot at this moment give a sufficient and satisfactory answer to them though i believe there must be one but i will not attempt to give an insufficient answer for my sole desire is to be just and fair before he left he told me that he suffered much from indigestion brought on by excessive meditation adding i fear i fear greatly i asked him what he feared and he replied god in the afternoon feridun came to me while i was sitting in haji shirazi's shop to arrange a visit to the dakhme 
or Tower of Silence of the Zoroastrians. Hauji Shirazi was most insolent to him, calling him a son of a dog, Pedar Sag, a Gabr, and the like. I saw poor Feridun flush up with an anger which it cost him an effort to control, and would fain have given the drunken old Haji a piece of my mind had I been certain that he did not intend his rudeness for playful banter, and I had not further feared that in any case my remonstrances would only increase his spite against Feridun, which I could only hope to suppress so long as I remained at Kerman. I told Feridun this afterwards, and he not only approved my action, but begged me not to interfere in any similar case. It would do no permanent good, he said, and would only embitter them against us. But do not forget what we poor Zoroastrians have to suffer at the hands of these Mussulmans when you return to your native land, and try, if you can, to do something for us. Towards evening I rode out with Gushtasp and Feridun to the lonely Dachmer, situated on a jagged mountain spur at some little distance from the town. Gushtasp rode his donkey, but Feridun, who was a bold and skilful rider, had borrowed a horse, for the Zoroastrians at Kerman are not subjected to restrictions quite so irksome as those which prevail at Yazd. We stopped twice on the way to drink wine at a place called Sarepol, Bridge End, and at a sort of halfway house where funerals halt on their way to the Dachme, or rather Dachmes, for there are two of them, one disused and one built by Monakchi, the late Zoroastrian agent at Tehran, a little higher up the ridge. At the foot of this we dismounted, Molla Gushtasp remaining below to look after the animals, while I ascended with Feridun by a steep path leading to the upper Dachme. Here Feridun, whose brother had recently been conveyed to his last resting place, proceeded to mutter some prayers, untying and rebinding his girdle, or Koshti, as he did so after which he produced a bottle of wine and poured three libations to the dead exclaiming as he did so khoda biya morzad hameye raftagan ra may god forgive all those who are gone and then helped himself and passed the wine to me observing an inscribed tablet on the side of the dakhme which was still some twenty yards above us I called my companion's attention to it, and made as though I would have advanced towards it, but he checked me. None, said he, may pass beyond this spot where we stand, save only those whose duty it is to convey the dead to their last resting place, and a curse falls on him who persists in so doing. As he spoke, he pointed to a Persian inscription, cut on the rock beside us, which I had not previously observed, wherein a curse was invoked on any one whom curiosity or a desire to molest the dead should impel to enter the Dachme. Near this was inscribed the well-known verse, A dust bar genaus e doshman chu begzari, shaudi makon ke bar to hamin ma jarabovad. O oh, friend, when thou passest by the corpse of thine enemy, rejoice not, for on thee will the same fate fall. Below this was recorded the date of the Dachme's completion, Zelhedje 20th, A.H. 1283, 25th April, A.D. 1867, corresponding to the year 1236 of Yazdegerd. On returning to the garden, I found the inevitable Sayyid Hussein, who had arrived soon after I had gone out, and in my absence had been inflicting his theological dissertations on Naib Hassan. 
it had been arranged that i should visit a certain mirza muhammad jafar khan a nephew of the great leader of the sheikhis and antagonist of the babis haji muhammad karim khan who had called upon me a few days previously and the sayyid hearing this insisted on accompanying me on reaching his house which stood alone at some distance from the town we were received by him and a stout pallid youth named yusuf khan who i believe was his cousin or nephew in the tambal khane or lounging room the walls of which were profusely decorated with a strange medley of cheap european prints and photographs representing scripture incidents scenes from uncle tom's cabin scantily clothed women and other incongruous subjects arranged in the worst possible taste the low opinion of my host's character with which this exhibition inspired me was not bettered by his conversation which was so far as i remember singularly pointless he evidently felt ill at ease in the presence of the sayyid who inquired very searchingly as to the reception which the eldest of haji mohammad karim khan's sons the present chief of the sheikhis had met with at the holy shrines of karbala and najaf whither he had recently gone so far as we could learn he had been anything but cordially received and at kauzamein the people had not suffered him to preach in the mosque on my return to the garden i had supper with naeb hassan who aspersed the character of my new acquaintance in a way which i cannot bring myself to repeat thursday twentieth june tenth shawwal this morning i paid a visit to one of the most eminent members of the clergy of kerman the mujtahed mulla muhammad saleh kermani he was a fine-looking man with a long black beard and deeply furrowed brow and received me with a somewhat haughty courtesy he conversed on religious topics only pointing out the beauties of the law of islam and taking great exception to the carelessness of europeans in certain matters of purification on leaving his house i was taken to see an iron foundry where i was shown two excellent-looking enfield rifles manufactured by a kermani gunsmith in imitation of one of european workmanship lent to him by the prince governor in the afternoon i received a visit from the two frenchmen of whose arrival in kerman i have already spoken haji mohammad khan mulla yusuf and sayyid hossein happened to come while they were with me but the last on a hint from naeb hassan that wine was likely to be produced fled precipitately to the satisfaction of every one the frenchmen appeared from their account to have had a very rough journey from mashhad to kerman and not to enjoy much comfort even here they were delighted with the wine cognac and tea which i placed before them for they had not been able to obtain any sort of alcohol here not knowing whither to go for it and conversed freely on everything save the objects of their journey of which they seemed unwilling to speak though haji mohammad khan who really did speak french with some approach to fluency endeavoured again and again to extract some information from them he was so disgusted at his ill success that he afterwards announced to me his conviction that they were persons of no rank or breeding and that he had no wish to see anything more of them in the evening i supped with the prince governor the party being completed by the sheikh of qom and the prince telegraphist the meal was served in european fashion in a room in the balge nasserie palace which was brightly illuminated a great number of european dishes was set before us no doubt in my honour though as a matter of fact i should have greatly preferred persian cookery wine too was provided and not merely for show either the prince acting i suppose on the aphorism address men according to the measure of their understandings 
conversed chiefly on european politics in which i felt myself thoroughly out of my depth he was however extremely kind and when i left insisted on lending me a horse and a man to conduct me home friday twenty first june eleventh shawwal in the afternoon i returned mirza javad's call and found with him his son and his son's tutor mulla Ghulam hussein a sheikhi from whom i extracted the following account of the essential doctrines of his school the bala saris or ordinary shiites said he assert that the essentials of religion are five to wit belief in the unity of god tawhid the justice of god adl the prophetic function nubavat the imamate imamat and the resurrection ma'aud now we say that two of these cannot be reckoned as primary doctrines at all for belief in the prophet involves belief in his book and the teachings which it embodies amongst which is the resurrection and there is no more reason for regarding a belief in god's justice as a principal canon of faith than belief in god's mercy or god's omnipotence or any other of his attributes of their five principles or essentials osul therefore we accept only three but to these we add another namely that there must always exist amongst the musulmans a perfect shiite she ayekamel who enjoys the special guidance of the imams and acts as a channel of grace vosetaye phase between them and their church this tenet we call the fourth support rokne or fourth essential principle of religion in the evening i was the guest of osta akbar a parcher of peas at supper and stayed the night at his house amongst the guests were aga fathullah a young azali minstrel and poet who sung verse in praise of the bab composed by himself sheikh ibrahim of sultanabad one of his intimates and admirers a servant of the farrash bashi named abdullah a post office official whom i will call haydarullah and the pea parcher's brother as the evening wore on these began to talk very wildly in a fashion with which i was soon to become too familiar declaring themselves to be one with the divine essence and calling upon me by such titles as janab saheb and hazrat ferangi to acknowledge that there was no one but the lord jesus present wearied and somewhat disgusted as i was it was late before they would suffer me to retire to rest on the roof saturday twenty second june twelfth shawwal the party at osta akbar's did not break up till about an hour and a half before sunset when i returned to the garden accompanied by sheikh ibrahim who from this time forth until i left kerman became my constant companion though more than once disgusted at his blasphemous conversation and drunkenness i endeavoured to discourage his visits but he was not one to be easily shaken off and on these occasions when my indignation had been specially kindled against him he would make so fair a show of regret for his conduct that i was constrained to forget his unseemly behaviour moreover he was a man well worth talking to so long as he was sober or not more than half drunk having travelled widely through persia turkey and egypt seen many strange things and stranger people and mixed with almost every class and sect as it is the privilege of his order to do he was indeed one of the most extraordinary men whom i ever met and presented a combination of qualities impossible in any but a persian anarchist antinomian heretic and libertine to the very core he gloried in drunkenness and expressed the profoundest contempt for every ordinance of islam 
boasting of how he had first eaten pork in the company of a european traveller with whom he foregathered in egypt and quoting in excuse for his orgies of hashish and spirits this couplet from the masnavi nange bango khamr bar khod minahi to dami az khishtan to warahi thou disgracest thyself with bang and wine in order that for a moment thou mayest escape from thyself i have seen him on an occasion when by the laws of islam the minor ablution was incumbent on him take up an empty ewer off Dalbe, and when warned by his friends that it contained no water replied bah what do i care i only carry it to blind these accursed dogs of orthodoxy who if they had but proof of one-tenth of the contempt which i entertain for them and their observances would tear me to pieces he professed to be a bawby and as will be related in its proper place had all but suffered death for his beliefs when a youth he had visited baha at acre and subh azal in cyprus and declared himself to be a follower of the former though in point of fact he paid no more attention to the commands and prohibitions of the kitab aqdas than to those of the quran accounting all laws human and divine as made by the wise for fools to observe in short he was just a free-thinking free-living antinomian dervish or kalandar a sort of mixture of omar khayyam and eraqi with only a fraction of their talent and culture and ten times their disregard for orthodox opinion and conventional morality yet was he lacking neither in originality power of observation and deduction nor humour and his intelligence now sadly undermined by narcotics and alcohol must have originally been sufficiently acute such was the man in whose society it was my lot to pass a considerable portion of my remaining days at kerman again and again as i have said i would have cast him off and been quit of him but ever the interest of his extraordinary character and the charm of his conversation made me condone his faults and bear with him a little longer he was a perfect repository of information concerning the roads halting places towns and peoples of western asia you had but to ask him how to reach any town from a given starting place and he would in a few minutes sketch you out two or three alternative routes with the stages advantages disadvantages and points of interest of each to give an instance i had at this time some idea of quitting persia by hamadan and making my way thence to the mediterranean and i inquired of sheikh ibrahim whether this project was feasible oh yes he replied nothing can be easier from hamadan you will go to sanandej a march of four days thence in four days to soleimaniye thence in four days more to mosul where you must certainly pay a visit to zainul muqarrabin and who inquired i is zainul muqarrabin he is one of the most notable of the friends ahbab that is the babis replied he and to him is entrusted the revision and correction of all copies of the sacred books sent out for circulation of which indeed the most trustworthy are those transcribed by his hand his real name is mulla zainul abedin of najafabad you may also see at mosul mirza abdul wahhab of shiraz the seal engraver who will cut for you a seal bearing an inscription in the new writing khattebadi and mirza abdullah alaqband both of whom are worth visiting are these the only babis at mosul i inquired oh no he answered 
you will find plenty of them there and elsewhere on your route you can tell them by their dress they wear the turkish fez with a small white turban and a jobbe they do not shave their heads but on the other hand they never allow the zolf to grow below the level of the lobe of the ear well to continue from mosul you will go in four days to jezire thence in three days to mardin thence in four days to diarbekr thence in four days to orfa thence in two days to sovarak thence in three days to aura thence in three days to birejik and thence in six days to eskanderun alexandretta where you can take a ship for constantinople or alexandria or your own country as you please but you should by all means go to Accra and visit baha so that your experience may be complete you have visited Accra, have you not i inquired tell me what sort of place it is and what you saw there yes he replied i was there for seventy days during which period i was honoured musharraf by admission to the holy presence twelve times the first time i was accompanied by two of baha's sons by his amanuensis and constant attendant aga mirza aga john of kaushan whom they call janab khadimullah his excellence the servant of god and by my fellow traveller all these so soon as we entered the presence chamber prostrated themselves on the ground but while i ignorant of the etiquette generally observed was hesitating what to do baha called out to me it is not necessary lazem nist then said he twice in a loud voice alaykum god bless you and then most blessed are ye in that ye have been honoured by beholding me which thing saints and prophets have desired most earnestly then he bade us be seated and gave orders for tea to be set before us my companion hesitated to drink it lest he should appear wanting in reverence seeing which baha said the meaning of offering a person tea is that he should drink it then we drank our tea and khadimullah read aloud one of the epistles al after which we were dismissed during my stay at Accra, i was taken ill but baha sent me a portion of the pelo which had been set before him and this i had no sooner eaten than i was restored to health you should have seen how the other believers envied me and how they begged for a few grains from my share and this happened on two subsequent occasions when i left Accra, baha commended me but bade me preach the doctrine no more because i had already suffered enough in god's way later on mirza yusuf of tabriz joined us and thinking to please sheikh ibrahim pretended that he too was a babi but when sheikh ibrahim feigned ignorance of the whole matter expressing surprise and in some cases mild disapproval at what mirza yusuf told him of the doctrines and practices of the sect the latter thinking that he had made a mistake changed his ground and told us that he had only pretended to be a convert to the new religion so as to get money from the rich and charitable bobbies at yazd i could hardly contain my laughter as i watched mirza yusuf thus entangling himself in the snare set for him by the sheikh who meanwhile never so much as smiled at the success of his stratagem i expected of course that the whole story would become known to all the babis in kerman but i think the sheikh kept his own counsel being less concerned with the exposure of hypocrisy than with his own amusement after mirza yusuf's withdrawal the sheikh 
having communicated to me a great deal of very scandalous gossip about the postmaster whom he was by way of considering as one of his best friends began to disclose with high approval the character of the free-thinking poet nasser -e whose poems and apocryphal autobiography he had been recently reading the episode in the autobiography which had especially delighted him and which he repeated to me with infinite relish runs as follows note i translate from the tabriz edition of nasser -e works lithographed in a h twelve eighty a d eighteen sixty four pages six seven end note after much trouble we reached the city of nishapur there being with us a pupil of mine an expert and learned metaphysician now in the whole city of nishapur there was no one who knew us so we came and took up our abode in a mosque as we walked through the city at the door of every mosque by which we passed men were cursing me and accusing me of heresy and atheism but the disciple knew nothing of their opinion concerning me one day as i was passing through the bazaar a man from egypt saw and recognized me and approached me saying art thou not nasser -e khosro and is not this thy brother abu sa'id in terror i seized his hand and engaging him in conversation led him to my lodging then i said take thirty thousand mesquals of gold and refrain from divulging the secret when he had consented i at once bade my familiar spirit produce that sum gave it to him and thrust him out from my lodging then i went with abu sa'id to the bazaar halted at the shop of a cobbler and gave him my shoes to repair that we might go forth from the city when suddenly a clamour made itself heard near at hand and the cobbler hastened in the direction whence the sounds proceeded after a while he returned with a piece of flesh on the end of his bradawl what inquired i was the disturbance and what is this piece of flesh why replied the cobbler it appears that one of nasser -e khosro's disciples appeared in the city and began to dispute with the doctors thereof these repudiated his assertions each adducing some respectable authority while he continued to quote in support of his views verses of nasser -e khosro so the clergy tore him in pieces as a meritorious action and i too to merit a reward cut off a portion of his flesh when i learned what had befallen my disciple i could no longer control myself and said to the cobbler give me my shoes for one should not tarry in a city where the verses of nasser -e khosro are recited so i took my shoes and came forth with my brother from nishapur the sheikh then recited to me the two following fragments of nasser -e khosro's verse which it will be allowed are sufficient to account for the lack of favour wherewith he was regarded by the clergy of nishapur elahi rost guyam fitne az tost vali az tars natvanam chakidan agar rigi be kaf shikhod nadari chera bayast shaytun afaridan labo dendan khuban khatara badin khubi nabayast afaridan be ahu mizani hey hey ke begriz be tazi mizani hey bar davidan o god although through fear i hardly dare to hint it all our trouble springs from thee hadst thou no sand or gravel in thy shoes what prompted thee to bid the devil be twere well and thou hadst made the lips and teeth of tartar beauties not so fair to see with cries of on thou bidst the hound pursue with cries of on thou bidst the quarry flee now serechosro bedashti migozasht Mastila yaqel nachun meikhaw ragan Mabrazi deed o mazari roberu Bang barzad goft kei nazaw ragan 
نعمت دنیا و نعمت خور بین اینچ نعمت اینچ نعمت خارگان dead drunk not like a common sot one day nasir khosro went to take the air hard by a dung he pierced by the grave and straightway cried o ye who stand and stare behold the world behold its luxuries its dainties here the fools who ate them there ere evening was passed the sheikh like nasir khosro was dead drunk not like a common sot and finally to my great relief went to sleep wrapped in his cloak in a formless heap on the floor where we left him till morning he awoke very late and was sipping his morning tea with a begone air which contrasted strangely with his vivacity of the previous day when visitors were announced and my disagreeable acquaintance Haji Muhammad Khan, accompanied by a pleasant, well-informed mullah named Haji Sheikh Jafar of Karbala, entered the room. He was more than usually impertinent and inquisitive, inquired when Sheikh Ibrahim had come to the garden, and on learning from me that he had been there since the previous night, lifted his eyebrows in surprise remarking that the sheikh had said he came that morning early and then proceeded to inquire pointedly how the postmaster was and whether i had any fresh news from adrianople or acre meaning of course to imply his belief that i was a babi finally however naeb hassan came to the rescue reminding me in a loud voice that i had accepted an invitation to visit hormozyar one of my zoroastrian friends at his garden he omitted to mention that the engagement was for the evening but the intimation had the desired effect of causing haji muhammad khan to retire taking the divine with him i now wish to go out but to this sheikh ibrahim objected declaring that it was too hot so we had lunch and then adjourned to the summer-house where he fell asleep over my bobby history on awakening from his nap he was more like his usual self and began to entertain me with his conversation so you met sheikh s the bobby courier at shiraz did you he began a fine old fellow he is too and has had some strange experiences did he tell you how he ate the letters no i replied tell me about it ah he continued he is not given to talking much well you must know that he goes to acre once every year to convey letters from the friends in persia and elsewhere and to bring back replies he takes esfahan shiraz yazd and the south while dervish khawar takes mazandaran gilan and the northern part of iraq riding about on a donkey selling drugs and passing himself off as an oculist the sheikh however goes everywhere on foot save when he has to cross the sea and this i fancy he only does when he cannot well avoid it at least since a ship in which he was a passenger was wrecked between bushir and basra and every one on board drowned save himself and another dervish who managed to keep themselves above water by means of floating wreckage until after fourteen or fifteen hours exposure they were drifted ashore as a rule he so times his return from the interior as to reach bushir early in the month of zelhedje whereby he is enabled to join the pilgrims bound for jeddah and mecca after the conclusion of the pilgrimage he makes his way to acre where he generally stays about two months while the letters which he has brought are being answered though he is not perhaps honoured by admission to baha's presence more than once or twice during this period he is in many ways a privileged person being allowed to go into the andarun women's apartments when he pleases and to sit with outstretched feet and uncovered head even in the presence of the masters that is 
Bahar's sons. When the letters are all answered, he packs them into his wallet, takes his staff, and sets off by way of Beirut for Mosul, where he stays for about a month with Zainul Mokarrabin, of whom I told you a few days ago. Thence he makes his way down the Tigris to Baghdad, and so across the frontier into Persia. He walks always off the beaten track to avoid recognition, and for the same reason, seldom enters a town or village, save to buy sufficient bread and onions. He is passionately fond of onions, to last him several days. These he packs away in his wallet on the top of the letters. At night, he generally sleeps in a graveyard or in some other unfrequented spot where he is not likely to be disturbed unless there be some of the friends in the place where he halts in which case they are always glad to give him a night's lodging well it was about his eating his letters that i was going to tell you once in the course of his travels he was recognized in a village near yazd arrested locked up in an empty room to await examination by the kad khoda or headman the kad khoda chanced to be engaged when word was brought to him that the bobby courier had been caught leave him locked up where he is said he till i can come now the sheikh is a man of resource and finding that the kad khoda did not immediately come to examine him he began to cast about for some means of destroying the compromising letters in his wallet for he knew that if these should fall into the hands of the enemy the writers would get into trouble unluckily there was no fire nor any means of making one and the earth which formed the floor of the room was too hard to dig a hole in even if it would have been safe to bury the letters in a place whence they could not afterwards be removed there was only one thing left to do namely to eat them and this the sheikh proceeded to do it was a tough meal for their total weight amounted to several pounds and some of them were written on thick strong paper in particular there was one great packet from rafsinjan which cost the sheikh a world of trouble and on the senders of which as i have myself heard him say he lavished a wealth of curses and expletives ere he finally succeeded in chewing it up and swallowing it at length however the whole mass of correspondence was disposed of and when his persecutors arrived there was the old sheikh with a very dry mouth i expect and likely enough somewhat uneasy within sitting there as innocent looking as could be the kad khoda and his men didn't pay much heed to that though nor to his protestations but when they had turned his wallet inside out and searched all his pockets and found not so much as the vestige of a letter to reward them for their pains they were rather taken aback and began to think they had made a mistake they gave him the bastinado to make all sure but as he continued to protest that he was no bobby and no courier and knew nothing about any letters at all they eventually had to let him go we were interrupted by the unwelcome arrival of seyyed hossein of jandag and quickly as i pushed the bobby history under a cushion he noticed the movement and forthwith proceeded to make himself disagreeable an accomplishment in which he excelled to sheikh ibrahim persistently and pointedly asking him about wine where the best qualities were manufactured how and when it was usually drunk and the like on all of which points the sheikh professed himself perfectly ignorant the seyyed however continued to discourse in this uncomfortable strain concluding severely with the aphorism mandana bidinin lazimahu ahkamu whosoever professeth a faith its laws are binding on him presently the farrash bashi's servant abdullah who was one of the sheikh's intimates joined us and we had tea but the seyyed continued to act in the same aggressive and offensive manner 
inquiring very particularly whether the cup placed before him had been properly purified since last it touched my infidel lips mirza yusuf of tabriz who had brought it answered pertly enough and put the old man in a still worse temper so that i was very glad when naeb hassan reminded me in a loud voice that it was time to set out for the garden of hormuz yar whose guest i was to be that evening and the seyyid departed grumbling as he went you have already forgotten the advice i gave you the other day eat no man's bread and grudge not thine own bread to any one sheikh ibrahim though uninvited insisted on accompanying me and naib hassan to hormuz yar's entertainment we found about twenty guests there assembled all with the exception of ourselves and fatullah the minstrel zoroastrians rostams and rashids shahriyars dinyars and ormozdyars keikhosros and khodamorads bahmans bahrams esfandiyars and mehrabans the entertainment was on a magnificent scale the minstrel sang well and the pleasure of the evening was only marred by the conduct of sheikh ibrahim who got disgustingly drunk and behaved in the most indecorous manner but that he came under your aegis said hormuz yar to me afterwards when i apologized for his behaviour and explained how he had forced his company upon me we would have tied his feet to the poles and given him the sticks for if sticks be not for such drunken brutes as him i know not for what they were created i was constrained to admit that he was right but for all that i was unable to shake off my disreputable companion who accompanied us back to the garden when we said good-night to our host and slept heavily on the ground wrapped in his cloak the next day monday fourteenth shawwal twenty fourth june will ever be to me the most memorable for thereon did i come under the glamour of the poppy wizard and forge the first link of a chain which it afterwards cost me so great an effort to break thereon also was first disclosed to me that vision of antinomian pantheism which is the world of the kalandar and the source of all that is wildest and strangest in the poetry of the persians with this eventful day then let me open a new chapter end of section thirty nine end of chapter sixteen kerman society recording by nicholas james bridgewater section forty of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown section forty chapter seventeen amongst the kalandars how sweet it were hearing the downward stream with half-shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half-dream to dream and dream like yonder amber light which will not leave the myrrh-bush on the height to hear each other's whispered speech eating the lotus day by day to lend our hearts and spirits holy to the influence of mild-minded melancholy tennyson tova mulko jau he sekand dari mano rasmo rohe kalandari agar on khoshast to dar khori vagar in badast maro sazao sekandar's pomp and display be thine the kalandar's habit and way be mine that if it please thee i resign while this though bad is enough for me Qurratul Ain. this was how it came about on the afternoon of this notable day 
about four hours before sunset i went into the town to pay some visits leaving sheikh ibrahim asleep in the garden i first went to see the frenchmen about whose health i had heard disquieting reports which fortunately turned out to be exaggerated having remained with them for rather more than half an hour i proceeded to the house of the young artillery officer whose acquaintance i had made through the sheikh of qom while i was sitting there conversing with him and watching the grotesque antics of a large tame monkey antar which he kept as a pet i first became conscious of an uneasy sensation in my eye my host too noticed that it appeared inflamed and bade one of his servants bring a bowl of iced water that i might bathe it so far from deriving any benefit from this treatment however it rapidly grew worse so that on my return to the garden i was in considerable pain now Osta akbar the pea parcher whenever i urged him to tell me more about the bob and his religion used to declare that he could not talk freely on this topic save in some place where there was no fear of his being overheard and it had therefore been arranged a day or two previously that on this evening he and a select company of his balbi friends to wit sheikh ibrahim of Erag, the farrash bashi's man abdullah and the azali minstrel fatullah should sup with me in the garden and spend the night there just as i was going out in the afternoon osta akbar had come to the garden bringing with him a balbi merchant whom i will call aga muhammad hassan of yazd just arrived on business in kerman from the little village in rafsenjan where he dwelt he having heard from usta akbar an account of myself was so curious to see me that he insisted on at once paying me a visit and no sooner were they seated than the pea parcher began to introduce him in his usual wild language here is Agha Muhammad Hassan, said he, come to do penance before you and entreat your forgiveness for his shortcomings, in that when you passed through Rafsinjan, he neither came out to meet you, nor brought you into his house, nor set you on your journey. I have scolded him well, saying, Agha Muhammad Hassan, the holy spirit ruhul quds passed through rafsinjan and you had not so much as a word of welcome nor advanced one foot from the other are you not ashamed of yourself he is now duly ashamed of himself and will not be content till he receives from your lips the assurance of his pardon i was in a hurry to get rid of my visitors as i had to go into the town so half assenting to agha muhammad hassan's proposal that i should spend a few days with him at the village before leaving the province of kerman and inviting him to join us at supper that evening when we should be able to talk to our heart's content i bade them farewell for the present on my return to the garden about an hour after sunset i found these two and sheikh ibrahim awaiting me my eye was now so painful that i determined to cover it with a bandage which at once called the attention of my guests to its condition they all expressed the greatest concern and usta akbar begged me to allow him to try a remedy which he had never known to fail in this request he was so importunate that at last i most foolishly consented thereupon he went out into the garden and gathered some leaves from the hollyhock or other similar plant with which he soon returned then he called for an egg broke it into a cup removed the yolk leaving only the white and bade me lie down on the floor on my back 
and if possible keep the inflamed eye open then he poured the white of the egg over the eye covered it up with the leaves and entreated me to remain still as long as i could that the treatment might work it did work in two or three minutes the pain became so acute that i could bear it no longer and called for warm water to wash away the horrid mess which half blinded me Osta akbar remonstrated but i told him that the remedy was worse than the disease ah said he it is clear that i have made a mistake when you told me that you had been bathing your eye in iced water i assumed that this cold was the cause of the affection and so i applied a hot remedy now it is evident that it is due not to cold but to heat so that a cold remedy should be applied and i know one which will not disappoint you thank you i rejoined if it is anything like the last i should prefer to have nothing to do with it it is nothing like the last he answered what i would suggest is that you should smoke a pipe of opium that is a cold drug most potent in the treatment of hot maladies and of its efficacy you cannot but have heard opium there was something fascinating about the idea the action on the mental functions exercised by narcotic drugs had always possessed for me a special interest and though the extremely unpleasant results of an experiment on the subjective effects of cannabis indica indian hemp which i had tried while a student at st bartholomew's hospital had somewhat cooled my enthusiasm for this sort of research the remembrance of that dreadful evening when time and space seemed merging in confused chaos and my very personality appeared to be undergoing disintegration had now sufficiently lost its vividness to make me not unwilling to court some fresh experience of this kind so after a few moments reflection i signified my willingness to try Osta akbar's new cure and ten minutes later my whole being was permeated with that glow of tranquil beatitude conscious of itself nay almost exultant in its own peaceful serenity which constitutes the fatal charm of what the persians call par excellence the antidote teryag at this juncture the young azali minstrel and soon afterwards abdullah arrived and we adjourned to the summer-house where haji safar had spread a cloth on which were disposed dishes of fruits sweets and algeel pistachio nuts melon seeds and the like strongly salted to whet the appetite and bottles of wine and arab the conversation though it did not flag was at first quite enough my guest spoke in the usual strain of the succession of prophetic cycles of the progressive character of revelation and of the increasing strength of the theophanic sun in each appearance the lord jesus said they was as the sun shining in the fourth heaven which is the station of the spirit Magaumeru. muhammad was in the fifth heaven which is the station of reason magome agl the noqtee bayan his holiness our lord the supreme that is the bob appeared yet higher in the sixth heaven or station of love magome ashq and baha in whom all previous manifestations find their fulfilment and consummation occupies the seventh or highest heaven and is a perfect manifestation of the unseen and incomprehensible essence of the divinity then suddenly someone bade the minstrel sing and he in high-pitched plaintive voice every modulation of which 
seemed to stir the soul to its very depths burst forth with an ode of the Babi heroine Qurratul Ain, whereof the translation which I here give can but dimly reflect the passion and the fire. The thralls of yearning love constrain in the bonds of pain and calamity, these broken-hearted lovers of thine, to yield their lives in their zeal for thee, though with sword in hand my darling stand with intent to slay though i sinless be if it pleases him this tyrant's whim i am well content with his tyranny as in sleep i lay at the dawn of day that cruel charmer came to me and in the grace of his form and face the dawn of the morn i seemed to see the musk of Cathay might perfume gain from the scent those fragrant tresses rain, while his eyes demolish a faith in vain, attacked by the pagans of Tartary. With you who contemn both love and wine for the hermit's cell and the zealot's shrine, what can I do for our faith divine you hold as a thing of infamy? the tangled curls of thy darling's hair and thy saddle and steed are thine only care in thy heart the infinite hath no share nor the thought of the poor man's poverty sikandar's pomp and display be thine the kalandar's habit and way be mine that if it please thee i resign while this though bad is enough for me the country of i and we forsake thy home in annihilation make since fearing not this step to take thou shalt gain the highest felicity note this translation together with the original text i first published in the journal of the royal asiatic society for eighteen eighty nine the former at pages nine thirty six to seven the latter at page 991. For the benefit of those not accustomed to this style of mystical verse, in which the Persians so greatly delight, I may remark that by such terms as the beloved, the darling, the friend, and the like, God, or in this case the Bob, is intended, that the cruelty and tyranny attributed to him are not regarded as reproaches but rather as praise of his independence estegnau. that islam is the faith demolished by his eyes though in vain attacked by the pagans of tartary and that couplets five and six are addressed respectively to the dry votaries of orthodox piety and to such as care only for the world and its pleasures End note. when he had finished this ode and the cries of a john o my life and Qurbanat gardam may i be thy sacrifice which interjected more than once even in the course of the song burst forth with uncontrollable enthusiasm at its conclusion had ceased the minstrel once more began to sing i cannot recall the actual words of this song save in a few places but the general tenor of it was not far from the paraphrase which i here offer as you gaze on the heaving ocean's foam a myriad bubbles meet your eye the raindrops fall from their heavenly home to ascend no more it would seem on high but all shall return when their race is run for their source is one their source is one through glasses of every tint and hue fair and bright shine the rays of light some may be violet and some be blue some be orange and some be white but in essence and origin all are one for the source of all is the radiant sun beaker and flagon and bowl and jar of earth or crystal coarse or fine however the potter may make or mar still may serve to contain the wine should we this one seek or that one shun when the wine which lends them their worth is one 
again the minstrel was silent and sheikh ebrahim with flushed face and glittering eyes began to speak yes said he we are all one what matter if the vessels differ in honour and degree from one another when in truth their honour is but from the wine they hold which perisheth not though they be broken in pieces and what is this wine which perisheth not which pervadeth all things god you will answer then what i say again is god an imaginary abstraction a projection of your own personality and conceptions thrown on the sky above hich esme bi mosammao didei yaze ga fullao me gol gol chidei esm josti ro mosammao ro beju na be balao down na andar o beju didst ere a name without an object see or colour rose from r o s and e thou seek'st the name to find the object try the moon's not in the stream but in the sky what then means the meeting with god spoken of in the quran who are those who shall meet their lord can you meet an abstraction nay is not this abstraction after all but the creation of your own mind and as such dependent on you and inferior to you no god is something real visible tangible definite go to acre and see god now god forbid i exclaimed in utter horror of the frightful anthropomorphism thus suddenly laid bare before me god forbid that it should be so why the very verse which you cited from the masnavi bears witness against you the moon's not in the stream but in the sky that is to say as i understand it look for the reality outside and beyond this phenomenal world not in these transient reflections whereby clearly or dimly it is mirrored amongst mankind the mirror wholly depends on the original and owes all to it the original stands in no need of the mirror exalted is god above that which they allege then fathullah the minstrel broke in o hazrat ferangi he exclaimed all these ideas and thoughts about god which you have yea your very doubts and wonderings are your creatures and you are their creator and therefore above them even according to the verse you quote exalted is god above that which they allege jesus who is the spirit of god ruhollah passed into his church and is manifested in them therefore was it that when his holiness the point of revelation that is the bob was asked what are the ferangis he replied they are spirit you are today the manifestation of jesus you are the incarnation of the holy spirit nay did you but realize it you are god god forbid i exclaimed again speak not after this impious fashion and know that i regard myself as the least of god's servants and the most inconsistent and unworthy of those who profess to take the lord jesus as their pattern and exemplar verily i am a man like unto you shouted sheikh ibrahim thus said the prophet whose object like all the prophets who preceded and followed him was to make us men so said baha to me in acre i desire that all men should become even as i am if any one says that baha has attained to anything whereunto we also may not attain he lies and is an ignorant fool 
here he glared fiercely round the assembly to see if any one would venture to contradict him and as no one did so continued on the forehead of every man is written in that writing whereof you wot either hede mu'min this is a believer or hede kafir this is an infidel on that side of your forehead uncovered by the bandage which you have bound over your eye i read hede mu and i know that were the bandage removed i should see min written on the other side o janab sahib o hazrat ferangi when you go back to ferangistan you must stir up trouble and mischief fitnel fasaud you must make them all bobbies they talked much after this fashion while i listened in consternation half frightened at their vehemence half disgusted at their doctrines yet with all held spellbound by their eloquence was this then i thought to myself the root of the matter the heart of that doctrine which promised so fairly whereof the votaries whom i have hitherto met seemed so conspicuous for their probity piety sobriety and devoutness have i mistaken for a gleam of heaven-sent light a will o the wisp born of the dead disintegrated creeds of mazdak and el mogana and the terrible old man of the mountain before the daggers of whose emissaries the chivalry of east and west fell like the grass before the scythe of the mower and have i tracked it onwards step by step only to find at last that its home is in this quagmire of antinomian anthropomorphism or are these indeed no more babis than they are mohammedans but men who in true persian fashion disguise atheism in the garb of religion and bedeck it with the trinkets of a mystical terminology at length long after midnight we adjourned for supper in the other buildings and ere the conclusion of the meal sheikh ibrahim's conversation grew so blasphemous and disgusting that on the first opportunity i arose and returned distressed and angry to the summer house followed by my guests the merchant from rafsinjan whose conversation had throughout been more moderate and reasonable than that of the others and fatullah the minstrel whose vehemence was the outcome of an emotional and excitable nature not of wine which he eschewed noticed my disgust and approached me to inquire its cause what is it that has offended me i replied what should it be but sheikh ibrahim's disgusting behaviour the all-controlling influence exerted by the prophetic word over the hearts of men is one of the chief proofs to which you appeal in support of your religion is not wine forbidden in your religion as rigorously as in islam what is the use of your professing all this devotion to him whom you regard as the mouthpiece of god and kissing the kitab aqdas which you regard as the word of god if you condone so gross a violation of the laws which it contains and of the laws whether of religion ethics or good taste sheikh ibrahim at this moment staggered up to us with cries of drunken defiance and laying his hand on my arm demanded what we were talking about i shook him from me with a gesture of uncontrollable loathing and followed by the other two retired to a little distance from the summer house you are right they rejoined as soon as we were out of sheikh ibrahim's sight and hearing and the sheikh's conduct is to be deplored but then 
old habits will force themselves to the surface at times and after all to know and recognize the truth is the great thing but action is better than assent said i and to do is greater than to know what think you of this parable which we find in our gospels and i repeated to them the parable of the two sons bidden by their father to go and do his work of whom the one said i go and went not and the other said i will not go but afterwards went i said they but for all that both were sons knowledge is like a telescope wherewith we view the distant land of promise we may be standing in the mud chilled by snow and sleet or drenched with rain yet with this telescope we may see and correctly describe the orange and myrtle groves of the promised land and this knowledge the sheikh has none the less because at times he wallows as now in the mud of sin but this vision of the promised land i replied is of no use unless you set out to reach it better is he who without seeing it or knowing where it lies faithfully follows one who will lead him thither though he be compelled to walk blindly than he who supinely gazes at it through this telescope they were silent for a while distressed as it seemed at my distress and somewhat ashamed of the sheikh's conduct then said the merchant of rafsinjan sahib we will now bid you farewell and depart for see the dawn grows bright in the sky and we had best return nay i answered fearing lest i had offended them tarry at least till the city gates are open and sleep for a while and then depart in peace but they would not be persuaded and departed with sorrowful and downcast faces all save sheikh ibrahim who was in no condition to move and abdullah who would not forsake his friend so i left these two in the summer-house and went back to the room where we had eaten supper and bathed my eye which had again become very painful and after a time fell asleep it was the afternoon of the next day when i awoke and learned with some relief that abdullah had departed soon after the other guests and the sheikh about noon my eye was so painful that it was impossible to think of going out and there was nothing to distract my attention from the pain which i suffered for to read was of course impossible till about three hours before sunset a telegram from my friend the chief of the telegraph at yazd was brought to me informing me that he had just received my letter and had answered it by the day's post and inquiring after my health the telegram must have travelled very slowly or the letter very fast for hardly had i finished writing the answer to the former when the latter was brought by the postmaster of kerman who was accompanied by the young balbi merchant aga muhammad saudeq in the letter which was most kindly worded were enclosed copies of two poems for which i had asked the one by qurratul ayn note of this poem which is written in the same rhyme and metre as that translated at page four ninety supra the text and translation will be found at pages three fourteen to sixteen of volume two of my traveller's narrative End note. the other by janabe maryam the sister of the bob's first apostle mulla hussein of bushraway these i showed to my visitors who read them with manifest delight and the subject being thus introduced the conversation turned on the babis and especially on qurratul ayn of whose death the postmaster gave me the following account which he professed to have had from the lips of her jailer mahmud khan the kalantar 
the day before she suffered martyrdom said the postmaster she told those about her that her death was to take place saying tomorrow evening the shah will send after me and his message will come riding and will desire me to mount behind him this i do not wish to do wherefore i pray you to lend me one of your horses and to send one of your servants to escort me next day all this came to pass when she was brought in before the shah in the palace of the negaristan and bidden to renounce the bab she refused and persisted in her refusal so she was cast into a well which is in the garden and four large stones were thrown down upon her and the well was then filled up with earth as for mahmud khan he was as you know strangled by order of the father of prince nasir al our governor during the bread riots in tehran and his body dragged by the feet through the streets and bazaars note the accounts of qurratul ain's death are very various but this one at least i do not regard as having any claims to authenticity compare gobineau's religions et philosophies dans l'asie centrale pages two ninety two to ninety five polak's persienne volume one page three fifty three and my traveller's narrative volume two pages three thirteen three fourteen end note the postmaster also talked a little about the azalis saying that they were more numerous at kerman than anywhere else and that even in kerman they were but few in number amongst them he mentioned fatullah the minstrel and a certain mullah whom i will call mullah hadi but the sheikh of qom he would not include in his enumeration for said he though he sympathizes with the azalis and courts their society he is in point of fact a freethinker and a materialist after the departure of these guests i was visited by my zoroastrian friends goshtasp and feridun who came to condole with me and to inquire after the ophthalmia repeating over and over again bad naboshad may it not end ill till i was depressed not a little monday eighth july twenty eighth shawwal this morning i received a visit from one murtaza qoli khan afshar who soon after his arrival produced a great roll of verse in manuscript from which he proceeded to read me selections this verse was i fancy his own composition but about the writer i could learn no more than that his poetical pseudonym tachalos was binavao and that he was still living my visitor was very anxious to give me the manuscript so that i might take it back with me to europe and get it printed but i excused myself assuring him that it could be better and more conveniently published in persia in point of fact it was not worth publishing anywhere being remarkable only for its monotonous harping on the topics of death corruption and the torments of hell and for its badness of taste and poverty of style over and over again was this idea repeated in substance how many moon-faced beauties whose stature was as that of the cypress tree have gone down into the grave with only scorpions snakes worms and ants for their companions in their narrow bed only one poem in praise of the reigning king offered the least variety this began with an account of the shah's travels in europe which was followed by a description of the balbi rising and its suppression a long passage being devoted to qurratul ain my visitor remained with me for some time after i had succeeded in checking this recitation of doggerel but his conversation was not much more lively than his verse for he talked of nothing else 
but the horrors of hell and the delights of paradise both of which he depicted in the crudest and most grossly material colours tuesday ninth july twenty ninth shawwal this evening i was again the guest of the zoroastrians at the garden of mola serouche and sat down to supper with some twenty-five followers of the good religion the evening passed much as usual with wine song and minstrelsy save that one firouz by name having taken rather more to drink than was good for him a rare thing amongst the zoroastrians favoured the company with a rather vulgar imitation of the performances of dancing boys there was some talk of zoroaster and the miracles ascribed to him and of the descent to earth of ten flames ozar distinguished from fire otash by being devoid of all property of scorching or burning three of these so my hosts informed me had returned to heaven and one had in recent times migrated from khorasan where it suffered neglect to yazd it was not till after midnight that i was suffered to depart and then only on giving a promise that i would return first thing the next morning it was on this night that a jerk of the chain which i had suffered seropium to wind round me first made me conscious of the fact that i had dallied over long with him eight days had now elapsed since this dalliance began and though i had smoked what may well be termed the pipe of peace pretty regularly during this period the fact that once or twice i had abstained from smoking it at the usual time without suffering inconvenience had lulled me into a false sense of security after all i said to myself a great deal of exaggeration is current about these things for how few of those in england who talk so glibly about the evils of opium smoking and waste their time and other people's money in trying to put a stop to it have any practical acquaintance at all with it and on the other hand how many of my friends here when they feel depressed and worried or want to pass a quiet evening with a few congenial friends in discussing metaphysics and ontology indulge in an occasional pipe however this resolution i make that on the day when i shall be well enough to go out of this garden again i lay aside my pretty opium pipe valfour and its sikh cleaning rod and its anbor charcoal tongs which shall be to me thenceforth but as curiosities to hang up in my college rooms when i get back to cambridge well to-night as i reluctantly admitted to myself the time had come to put my resolution into practice and how did i do it i kept it after a fashion just for that one night and what a night it was in vain i longed for sleep in vain i tossed to and fro on my couch till the stars grew pale in the sky for an indefinable craving to which was presently superadded a general sense of uneasiness pervading all the facial nerves warred with the weariness which possessed me i was ashamed to wake my servant and bid him kindle a fire else had my resolution not held even for one night indeed as it was it can hardly be said to have held since at last in desperation i drenched some tobacco in laudanum taken from the little medicine chest i had with me rolled it into a cigarette and tried though with but little satisfaction to smoke it and this is the way of opium you may smoke it occasionally at long intervals and feel no after craving you may smoke it for two or three days consecutively and abandon it without difficulty then you may after an interval of one or two days do the like once more and again forsake it and then having smoked it once or twice again 
you will try to put it from you as before and you will find that you cannot that the fetters are forged which likely enough you will wear forever so next day i relapsed into bondage and when a few days later i told my plight to a friend of mine the prince's secretary and an azali babi who was a confirmed valfuri opium smoker he clapped his hand on his thigh and exclaimed hallo digar gozasht valfuri shode eid now at any rate it is all over you have become an opium smoker neither did he say this without a certain air of contentment if not of exultation for it is a curious fact that although the opium smoker will as a rule never tire of abusing his tyrant he will almost always rejoice to see another led into the same bondage and will take the new captive by the hand as a brother end of section 40 recording by nicholas james bridgewater recorded in london england This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 41 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown Section 41 Thursday, 11th July, 2nd Zelqa'de Last night I received a telegram from Shiraz informing me that a telegram addressed to me there had arrived from England in which i was requested to signify my acceptance of the post of persian lecturer to which i had been appointed at cambridge accordingly i went into the city an hour or two after sunset to dispatch an answer near the mosque gate i met osta akbar the pea parcher who invited me to lunch with him when i had completed my business i readily accepted his invitation and walked with him to his shop where i stayed talking with him for a few minutes a young tabrizi named rahman beg was there and osta akbar pointing at him asked me jestingly whether i could make this turk a bobby my business at the telegraph office did not take long the telegram though destined for england had of course to be written in persian and i managed to condense it including the address into seven words for which i paid twenty krons and thirteen shahis about sixteen shillings sixpence the tariff having luckily been reduced within the last few days i then returned to osta akbar's house and had lunch with him after which i wrote some letters including one to prince nasir ud the governor in this i ventured to say a few words in favour of mirza yusuf of tabriz at whose urgent request supported by seyyed hussein of jandag i had been induced to take what certainly was rather a liberty asking the prince in case he could not find him employment whether he would give him the means of reaching his native town of tabriz where he had friends and relatives i stayed to supper with osta akbar fatullah the azali minstrel 
being the only other guest. We ate our meal on the roof, for it was a beautiful moonlight night, and sat so late talking, drinking tea, and smoking opium, that, as the time for shutting the city gates had long passed, I agreed to my host's proposal that I should spend the night there. Bolsters, pillows, and quilts were accordingly brought up to the roof, but though our host soon composed himself to sleep, I sat late, talking to the Azali. I asked him to tell me how he had become a Babi, and he related as follows. A year or two ago, he began, I fell desperately in love, so that, on the rare occasions when my good fortune suffered me to pass a few moments in the presence of my beloved, I was for the most part, as one annihilated and overcome with bewilderment, submerged in the ocean of adoration, and repeating in the language appropriate to my condition, Sheikh Sa'di's lines, Ajabast ba vojudat ke vojudeman bemunad, to begoftan andar oi u maro sukhan bemonad the wonder is that i survive the while i gaze on thee that thou should speak and power of speech should still be left to me or as another has said agar khaham qamedel ba toguyam ja namiyabam agar jai konam peda Toro tanha namiyabam, agar tanha toro yabam, vajai ham konam peda. Zishadi dastupa gum mikonam, khodra namiyabam. I find no place where I to thee my passion may declare, or if I find the place, with thee I find my rival there. Or if at length I find a place, and find thee there alone, In vain I seek myself, for self has melted into air. But more often it happened that I was compelled to bear with separation, And then I would console myself as best I might, By reading and singing the odes of Sa'di, which seemed to me specially applicable to my condition. Now one day a friend of mine begged me to lend him my divan of Sa'di, promising to give me instead another and a better book. With some reluctance I consented to the exchange, and received from him the mystical Masnavi of Jalaluddin Rumi. When I began to read this, I at first bitterly repented the bargain. What is all this, I asked myself, about the flute-making lamentation because of its separation from the reed-bed, and what has it to do with me? But gradually the inner meaning began to dawn upon me. The love of the true and eternal beloved, displaced from my heart, the earthly passion which had filled it, and I realized the meaning of what the mystics say. al majazu kan taratul haqiqat The phenomenal is the bridge to the real, yes. Emruz shah anjomane del baron yakist. Del bar agar hazaran bovad del bar on yakist man behr on yaki do jehan do do am be baud ibam makon ke hausel har do jehan yakist today as the feast of fair ones to one is assigned the throne for though of the fair there are thousands there in beauty he stands alone. For him I forsake this world and that, And am counted in both undone. 
withhold your blame nor think it shame for the sum of the worlds is one one day passing by the city gate i heard a man reading from a book which he held in his hand the sweetness of the words and their dignity charmed me and i stopped to ask him what book it was at first he appeared unwilling to tell me but at length yielding to my persuasion he told me that it was the bayan of mirza ali muhammad the bulb he consented to lend me the book for a while and as i read it my assurance increased that this indeed was the word of god what then think you of baha i demanded for these would make him greater than the bob i know not he replied for me the bob sufficeth neither can i comprehend a station higher than his friday twelfth july third zelqa'de i woke late and found that fatullah and Osta akbar had both gone out the latter leaving word that he would return soon an old man named mirza ja'far a dervish of the zahabi order presently arrived he told me that he was at present engaged in fasting and other religious exercises and that he had an inner light presently ostal akbar returned with a shoemaker of his acquaintance named Osta Ghulam Reza, who brought with him a book of verses composed in praise of Baha by the Baubi poet Nabil. These, which in their eulogies were fulsome beyond belief, he proceeded to read, the pea-parcher encouraging him with occasional exclamations of Ziba Michonad. He does read nicely during a momentary pause the zahabi dervish ventured to make some remarks concerning an allusion to his inner light whereupon the shoemaker turned savagely upon him crying who cares for your inner light owl and bat that you are the sun of truth shines radiant in the mid-heaven of the theophany and do you dare obtrude your foolish fancies and vain imaginings or seek to distract us thereby from that which will truly advantage us at this arrogant and insolent speech anger overcame me and i said to the shoemaker silence how dare you speak in so unseemly a manner to this old man who according to his belief is seeking to draw near to god after all age is revered and courtesy of demeanour approved in every religion and you do but ill commend to others the creed which you profess by conduct such as this then the shoemaker hung his head and was silent on my way home i called on Agha muhammad Saudeg, the young bobby merchant at the caravanserai where he dwelt and he on learning that i had taken to smoking opium entreated me to abandon it ere it was too late he also begged me to lend him the manuscript of the kitab aqdas most holy book which had been given to me at shiraz that he might transcribe it for himself and this request at least i was ready to grant though the other as i began to fear came too late when i returned to my garden about sundown i found that sayyid hussein of jandak had been several times to see me and had inquired most persistently as to my whereabouts and that sheikh ibrahim his friend abdullah and a dervish who had brought me a present of apples were still patiently awaiting my arrival i found them sitting by one of the streamlets 
near the summer house and half a glance sufficed to show me that the sheikh at least was a good deal the worse for drink as i approached he greeted me with a loud screech of welcome and strove to stagger to his feet but quickly subsided into the expectant arms of abdullah crooning out a couplet from the masnavi which when he was in this state he never tired of repeating Baudenei der her sari shar mi konad on chonondro on chonon tar mi konad tis not in every head that wine works ill that which is so it maketh more so still after informing me with some incoherence that he was charged with a message to me from one of the principal physicians of kerman inviting me to lunch with him on the following day he continued chuckling to himself at the reminiscence your friend the seyed of azqand so he chose to call him confounding this place with jandab which was in reality his birthplace has been here but i your most humble servant and sincere friend sheikh ibrahim now as you perceive not quite himself have put him to flight together with another rascally seyed whom he brought with him i wish you would not insult my guests said i who was this other seyed how do i know he shouted defiantly all i know is this that just outside the garden gate he was attacked by a singularly intelligent dog and came in here shaking with fright when he had somewhat recovered he and the azghandi seyed began talking about you what like is this ferangi inquired he not a bit like other ferangis replied the azghandi inasmuch as instead of going after old tiles and other rubbish such as they mostly love he goes after religions and consorts with musulmans sheikhis and bolosaris sufis and even zoroastrians how about babis asked the other how should i know says the azghandi my brother when on a journey once occupied the opposite litter Kajave, to the chief of their gang continued he then i felt it was time to put him to rights a bit so i said you ugly wizened old fox for in the world of similitudes i behold you as such and so did that most sagacious dog who wished to tear you in pieces at the door in which wish i hope he may be more successful when you depart what do you know about babis and how dare you speak of one whose greatness and glory far transcend your mean comprehension in such disrespectful terms i saw him change colour and soon after he left without waiting for the tea which your excellent servant hoji safar was preparing for him hoji safar hoji safar where is hoji safar hoji safar approached he was sulky and morose offended as it appeared at having remained so long away without telling him where i had gone and grumbled accordingly i bade him be silent and sheikh ibrahim continued in a loud and aggressive tone i have heard from the postmaster how he surprised you in close confabulation with those foul and benighted 
Azalis at the house of the Sheikh of Qom. Mullahodi, a noted Azali, was there, and you were talking glibly enough when the postmaster entered. But on seeing him, you at once changed the conversation. Presently, to my great relief, Sheikh Ibrahim and Abdullah rose to depart. As they were leaving, Haji Safar met us and again complained of my want of consideration for him in leaving him ignorant of my whereabouts. Sheikh Ibrahim loudly applauded his solicitude, which I, on the other hand, was inclined to resent as impertinence. In consequence, we had words, and he threatened to leave me on the morrow and return to Tehran. But later on, when he brought my supper, he had repented of his decision, and offered an apology for his conduct, explaining it by saying that he had just had news that his mother was seriously ill, and that this had greatly disturbed his mind, and caused him to forget himself. Saturday, 13th July, 4th Zel Qa'deh According to my promise, I lunched today with the physician of whom I have already spoken. On my arrival I found Sheikh Ibrahim already much disguised in liquor, and Abdullah, together with my host and his little boy, a pretty child of eight or nine years of age, who amused us by repeating Obeyed Izzakani's celebrated poem of the cat and the mouse, Musho Gorbe. In the evening I was the guest of my host's rival, a physician of the old Galenic school, with a splendid contempt for the new-fangled doctrines of pathology and treatment which are beginning to make way amongst the medical men of Tehran. His son was a determined Balbi, and confided to me his intention of running away from Kerman and setting out on foot for Acre. Osta Akbar joined us presently, and after supper we sat late, talking, drinking tea, and smoking opium. Sunday, 14th July, 5th Zel Qa'de. Soon after we had drunk our morning tea, I left, and paid a visit to one of my Azali friends the prince's secretary, who invited me to stay to lunch. In the intervals of conversation, he amused himself by making the tea-glasses float in the little tank which occupied the middle of the room, pushing them from one side to the other, and objugating them with shouts of Gure pedarash laknat! Curses on the grave of its father! When receiving too violent a push they filled with water and sank to the bottom on returning to the garden about sunset i found that a number of visitors including the postmaster and two of his men the prince telegraphist the insufferable haji mohammad khan and mulla yusuf and fatullah the azalis had been to see me while the sheikh of Qom and one of his friends were still waiting my arrival. The sheikh brought me a photograph of Prince Nasser ud bearing an inscription in his own hand, together with a very kind answer to the letter which I had addressed to him some days previously concerning Mirza Yusuf of Tabriz this letter even after making a large deduction for persian politeness was so gratifying that i cannot forbear translating it my dear and respected friend from the receipt of your letter and the perusal of the pleasing contents of your script i derive the utmost gratification my delight at the handwriting and coherent diction of that honoured friend was chiefly owing to the fact that it is in Europe that you have thus perfectly acquired the Persian language and have obtained so thorough 
a mastery of composition and style may god if it so please him bring this dear friend of mine safely back to his native country and gladden him with the sight of his honourable father and mother and kindred i regret having met that dear friend so seldom nor has your sojourn in kerman been of any length yet such is the regard which i have conceived for you during this short period that it will never quit my heart hamishe dar baro bare chashmam musavari thy face will stand depicted for ever in my sight i shall ever supplicate god for your safety and advancement and i shall be much pleased if now and then a letter from you should reach me from ferangistan as for mirza yusuf the request of that honoured friend is of course most gladly granted by me and i have ordered that he shall receive money for the expenses of his journey i send a portrait of myself as a keepsake for that dear friend when i had read this letter the sheikh of qum informed mirza yusuf of tabriz that fifteen tumans about five pounds was the sum assigned to him by the prince mirza yusuf was of course overjoyed and sayyid hussein of jandab who had interested himself a good deal in the matter was also very pleased but said he to me don't suppose that these fifteen tomans were given to mirza yusuf they were given to you and the obligation lies on your neck for so much money was not raised in kerman save at the price of blood this of course was a mere figure of speech yet it somewhat damped my joy and would have done so more had i known how worthless mirza yusuf would prove himself monday fifteenth july sixth zelqa'de today i lunched with the sheikh of qom where i met the young azali artillery officer of whom i have already spoken after lunch the prince's head cook dropped in he was an amusing fellow and had seen something of the world having been for some time a servant of the persian embassy in london in the remembrance of which he gloried it was he i found who had prepared the elaborate meal of which i had partaken with the prince governor for he had learned the art of european cookery while in london though as he told me the ambassador unless he had company generally preferred to have persian dishes set before him i asked him whether the materials for these were generally forthcoming in london oh yes he replied i found them without much difficulty in the shops but of course i made the ambassador pay well for them i would buy eggplants baudinjaun for instance at a few pence each and when i returned i would tell him with a long face that things were terribly dear here and that i had paid a shilling apiece for them yes those were fine times and i wish i were back in london again the cook presently departed and the sheikh began to speak more freely about baha than he had hitherto done he produced a copy of the lithographed bombay edition of the Iqan, which he told me had been sent him by the baha'is and pointed out with great disapproval a passage where the shiites are called quote, that foul and erring sect end quote. he also showed me some letters addressed to him and other azalis by baha and took great exception to several passages in them especially the one where baha said quote, a child who has been blessed by beholding me is greater than all the people of the bayan 
End quote. Then he gave me an account of the attempt on the Shah's life by the Balbis in 1852, which I will not repeat here, as I have already published it in the second volume of my Traveller's Narrative, pages 323 to 4. The young artillery officer told me that for four years he had in vain sought to enter into relations with the Balbis, and had only succeeded at last by acquainting himself with a part of their terminology, and so leading some of his acquaintances, whom he believed to be adherents of the sect, to make open confession of their doctrines in his presence. Tuesday, 16th July, 7th Zel Qa'de. This afternoon I paid a visit to Mirza Javad's house. He himself was away, but I found his son and one or two other boys reading with their tutor, Mulla Ghulam Hussein, who on my arrival at once dismissed the class. I made some further inquiries of him concerning the Sheikhi literature, and he gave me the following supplementary list of books. By Sheikh Ahmad Ahsa'i, the commentary on the visitation, Sharhezyorat, and the Farah'ed, text and commentary in Arabic, and the aphorisms, Javameul Kalam, in Persian, by Haji Sayyid Kazem of Rasht, the commentary on Ali's sermon called the Khutbeye Totonjiye and the commentary on the Qaside by Haji Muhammad Karim Khan, the Faslul Khitab on tradition, the Ershadul Avam, direction of the common people, the Tariqun Najat, way of salvation, the Ezhaqul Batel, crushing of falsehood, and the Tireshehab, meteor bolt, both directed against the Babis, the Fetratus Salime, sound disposition, the Nosrat din help of religion, and the Sultaniye, an apology for Islam, written in Persian. Wednesday, 17th July, 8th Zel Qa'de. This morning, before I was dressed, Sayyid Hussein of Jandak came to see me. While he was with me, an old man named Mashhadi Ali, who keeps a shop just outside the city gate, came to lodge a complaint against Naeb Hassan's brother, a muleteer whom I had some thoughts of engaging for the journey to Shiraz. He was accompanied by a farosh sent by the vazir, who in the absence of the prince governor was administering justice, and his complaint was that he had been subjected to a violent and unprovoked attack on the part of Naeb Hassan's brother, for which he demanded redress. He had been before the vazir, who said that, as the defendant was in some sort under my protection, he would prefer to leave his punishment to me, but that he hoped I would inflict the bastinado upon him, if the complainant could prove his case to my satisfaction. Now, I have no doubt that the vizier meant kindly, but I could not help wishing he would execute whatever he conceived to be justice according to his own lights, without making me a judge and arbiter over his subjects, a position which I was very far from coveting. The Sayyid, however, who saw only an unhoped-for opportunity of displaying his Solomon-like wisdom, and delivering some epoch-making decision, was delighted, and bade Haji Safar bring the complainant, the defendant, the farosh, and any witnesses who might be forthcoming before us. The defendant was luckily away in the country, and as the only witness 
if such he could be called for it did not appear that he knew anything more about the case than that the defendant was his cousin and therefore in his view to be exculpated was haji safar our little tribunal was of very modest dimensions the case however lasted some time the complainant the witness and the farrosh all talking at once and the two first swearing to everything and at everybody so that even the loquacious seyed could hardly make himself heard at last however silence was obtained and the seyed with great gravity gave it as his decision that naib hassan's brother should give the defendant a new shirt as a token of regret for his alleged violence on condition that the charge should be suffered to drop and that the farrosh should receive a present in money from me for his trouble and as this seemed the easiest way out of the difficulty it was unanimously agreed to i hope the old man got his shirt but i cannot be sure of it as the farrosh having received his money naturally lost all further interest in the case i wished to give the old man the price of his shirt but this the seyed would not permit declaring that the farrosh would certainly take it from him end of section forty one recording by nicholas james bridgewater section forty two of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown section forty two i had lunch when the seyed left and then began to write in persian an account of my travels for the prince governor who had requested me to furnish him with a brief narrative of my journey about two hours before sunset however the seyed came back bringing with him two books one a book of his own composition called Vidoniye, and the other one of haji muhammad karim khan's refutations of babi doctrine from both of which he read to me aloud i was laughing in my sleeve at the garbled account given by the sheikhi leader of his rival's life and pretensions when suddenly the seyed stopped reading pricked up his ears and began to gaze intently in the direction of the gate whence arose mirthful peals of laughter mingled with the notes of a flute what is this unseemly noise he inquired angrily the question was answered a moment later by the appearance of mirza yusuf of tabriz mounted on a white ass fully caparisoned and laden with saddle-bags and other properties he advanced towards the summer-house at a rapid amble and after displaying himself before us to his satisfaction dismounted seated himself before us with a conceited smirk and awaited our congratulations at this juncture almost before the seyed had recovered power of speech sheikh ibrahim joined us listen to the flute when it tells its tale cried the seyed as soon as he could speak what does all this mean mirza yusuf where did you get that donkey i bought it replied mirza yusuf with the money his royal highness the prince may god prolong his life bestowed upon me bought it exclaimed the seyed 
why you were a pauper and this money only granted you at the urgent request of the sahib on whose neck lies the burden of obligation to the prince was intended to convey you to tabriz and the saddle the saddle-bags your smart kamarband and your other gear how did you get them i bought them too answered mirza yusuf pertly enough how else should i come by them you don't suppose i stole them you bought them too repeated the seyyed and may i ask how much money you have left out of the fifteen tumans the prince gave you mirza yusuf pulled out three or four grands from his pocket so much he replied and how are you going to get to tabriz may i ask with three grands demanded the seyyed on my donkey retorted mirza yusuf with a laugh what else did i get it for no doubt he cherished hopes of extracting further sums of money from the charitable barbies of yazd according to the plan which he had exposed with such refreshing simplicity to sheikh ibrahim and myself but he could hardly allude to this in the seyyid's presence you impertinent little fool cried the seyyid angrily is it for this that i have interested myself in your case you who two days ago were so humble a poor orphan whom none would pity you who would make me believe that you were so careful about your religious duties that hauji safar's occasional neglect of his prayers pained your tender conscience and who now come prancing into my presence on your precious ass deafening me with your unrighteous flute playing you don't understand these things master seyyed rejoined mirza yusuf you are not a man of the world but a recluse a man of the pen and the pulpit a votary of the rosary and the reading desk and he made a grimace aside to sheikh ibrahim whom he expected to enlist on his side against the common enemy for once however the sheikh was at one with the seyyed it is related said he sententiously that once the ass complained to god saying why hast thou created me seeing that thou hast already created the turk answer came verily we have created the turk in order that the excellence of thine understanding might be apparent mirza yusuf is a turk a tabrizi what would you have so mirza yusuf somewhat abashed withdrew and thereupon as i anticipated the sheikh and the seyyed began to quarrel about the manner in which the former had seen fit to treat the friend of the latter on the previous friday the seyyed for his part was politely sarcastic i said to my friend quoth he you have had the misfortune to displease the worthy sheikh no doubt inadvertently by talking of one whom he affects to revere with unbecoming levity and applying to him an appellation generally used of robber captains and the like it would be best for you to propitiate him by presenting to him one of those inlaid and enamelled pen-cases in the manufacture of which you are so skilful he promised to follow my advice and you may expect to receive his gift shortly you are too considerate rejoined the sheikh but really i am unworthy of so great an honour then suddenly losing control of his tongue and who i should like to know is this rascally brother of his who enjoyed the unmerited and unappreciated honour of travelling in the company of one whose greatness and holiness are as much beyond his comprehension as the splendour of the sun is beyond the comprehension of the bat or the mole 
i will tell you who he is he is now at tehran and makes his living by buffoonery of the lowest kind and the shah who loves buffoonery especially in a seyed has given him the title of pevamos saudaut there is another younger brother who is in high favour with certain of the nobles about the court and whose influence has conducted in no small degree to the exaltation of his family and do you mean to say inquired the seyed aghast at the scandalous details of persian court life furnished by the sheikh that this is the state of things prevailing in tehran the abode of the caliphate darul khilafat at the court of him whom we account the defender of the faith and protector of religion assuredly i do replied the sheikh and i can tell you more surprising things than this if you care to hear them from which you will be better able to judge of the claims which nasiruddin shah has to these titles and thereupon he launched out into a variety of scandalous anecdotes which it is to be hoped had no foundation in fact and which in any case are best unrecorded neither could he be diverted from this topic till the seyed departed in consternation an object at which in all probability he had from the first aimed and now sheikh i said when we were alone will you tell me more fully about the murder of the seven azalis who were sent with baha and his followers to acre you mentioned the fact a few days ago and added that you had seen the assassins yourself during your stay there and that they still received their prison allowance though at large and wore gyves on their ankles yes replied the sheikh who had drunk enough arag to render him communicative and not enough to make him incoherent they were twelve in number who slew the azalis and nine of them were still living when i was at acre this was the way of it when baha advanced his claim at adrianople and his half-brother subh azal refused to admit it the babis were divided into two factions some going with the former and some holding fast to the latter so high did the feeling run that the matter ended in open strife and two azalis and one bahai were killed so the turkish government determined to separate the two and arranged to banish mirza yahya subh azal and his followers to a town in cyprus near the seashore of which i cannot now remember the name and mirza hussein ali baha'u'llah with his family and adherents to acre but knowing the two factions to be on the worst possible terms it occurred to them that it would be advantageous to themselves to keep a few of each in the stronghold of the other so that should any persian or other traveller come to acre or cyprus with the intention of visiting baha or azal these adherents of the rival claimant to supreme power might cooperate with the government in throwing obstacles in his way so they sent three of baha's followers one of whom mushkin kalam so called from his extraordinary skill in calligraphy is still alive to cyprus with azal and seven azalis with baha to acre now as far as concerned azal this plan worked well enough for mushkin kalam set up a little coffee-house at the port where travellers must need arrive and whenever he saw a persian land he would invite him in give him tea or coffee and a pipe and gradually worm out of him the business which had brought him thither and if his object were to see subh azal off went mushkin kalam to the authorities and the pilgrim soon found himself packed out of the island 
but at Acre it was different. The seven Azalis, Agajan, called Kajkola, Skew Cap, who had served with distinction in the Turkish artillery, Haji Sayyed Muhammad of Esfahan, one of the original companions of the Bab, Mirza Reza, nephew of the last, and a scion of the same royal race of the Safavis, for both were descended from Shah Abbas the Great, Mirza Haydar Ali of Ardistan, a wonderful firebrand, Al Tashi Qarib, beside whom our mutual friend, Mirza Muhammad Balder of Bavanaut, was no more than a spark, Haji Sayyid Hussein of Kaushan, and two others, whose names I forget lived altogether in a house situated near the gate of the city well one night about a month after their arrival at acre the twelve bahais of whom i have spoken determined but without having received instructions from baha to kill them and so prevent them from doing any mischief so they went at night armed with swords and daggers to the house where the azalis lodged and knocked at the door agajan came down to open to them and was stabbed before he could cry out or offer the least resistance he was a young man but very strong so that once in the russian war he had without aid picked up a cannon-ball and thrown it into the mouth of the gun then they entered the house and killed the other six when the turks heard what had been done they imprisoned baha and all his family and followers in the caravanserai but the twelve assassins came forward and surrendered themselves saying we killed them without the knowledge of our master or any of our brethren punish us then not them so they were imprisoned for a while but afterwards, at the intercession of Abbas Effendi, Baha's eldest son, were suffered to be at large, on condition only of remaining in Acre, and wearing steel fetters on their ankles for a time. It was a horrible deed, I remarked. Nay, said the sheikh, it was soon over for them, i have seen worse than that myself love cannot exist without strife and as has been said affliction is the portion of affection what do you allude to inquired i when you say that you have seen worse than this yourself to an experience which befell me when i was a mere lad note the date of this occurrence so far as the sheikh could recollect it was about a h twelve seventy eight a d eighteen sixty one to two end note answered the sheikh and had but recently entered into this circle i was in sultanabad then my native place and the friends used to meet regularly at night-time the men in one room and the women in an adjoining apartment to read the holy books and hold spiritual converse all went well for a while our conventicles escaped the notice of the authorities and might have continued to do so had it not been for a traitor mulla ali now pishnamaz of one of the mosques of sultanabad as his father mulla hussein was then who to insinuate himself amongst us and compass our destruction feigned belief in our doctrines and for five or six months continued to frequent our assemblies until he knew us all and discovered where our books were concealed now this wretch used to be a constant visitor at the house of one of the chief adherents of our faith a theologian named mulla muhammad ali with whom he used to read the sacred books one day he requested permission to borrow a copy of the bayan which was at once granted him having thus secured possession of the book 
he forthwith proceeded to the house of haji aga mohsen the philosopher hakami and laid it before him aga mohsen whom a study of philosophy had rendered comparatively tolerant invited mulla muhammad ali to his house to discuss the matter with him intending should he not succeed in convincing him and inducing him to renounce his opinions to do no more than expel him and his associates from the city he further summoned another leading babi mulla ibrahim the author of commentaries on the kobra shamsiyeh and other treatises on logic and at that time tutor to prince nasir governor of this city whose father prince nosrat was then governor of sultanabad he was the first to arrive and while these two were engaged in discussion haji sayyid muhammad bauger mojtahed suddenly entered the room with a knife concealed under his cloak and seeing mulla ibrahim cried out do you hold converse or engage in controversy with this viper even as he spoke he drew forth his dagger and smote the bobby thrice on the side of the head the back of the neck and the back of the chest so that he fell dead to the ground a moment later the other bobby mulla muhammad ali ignorant of what had passed entered the room and was in turn stabbed by the mujtahed as was also a third named karbalai rahmatullah who followed him when news of these doings was brought to prince nosrat the governor he sent a message to the mujtahed saying leave this matter alone for i will see to it then he sent and arrested all the babis whose names were known to mulla ali the traitor and furthermore caused a number of those whose opinions were suspected to pass before him so that he might identify those whom he had seen at the bobby conventicles some twenty or thirty of us in all including myself were denounced and forthwith cast into a loathsome underground dungeon where we lay chained together in a row hardly able to move and in dire suspense for that night and the whole of the next day it was on the second night of our captivity that we heard a tramp of feet without then the key grated in the lock the door opened and the executioner accompanied by several of his assistants bearing lanterns and the implements of his ghastly craft entered i am come to kill the bobbies said he and the farroches set down the lanterns on the floor and we of course supposed that one and all we were doomed to die i was seventh in the row passing the first and second the man of blood halted before Osta mahmoud the pea parcher nohod beris of kaushan they forced open his mouth crammed a wet handkerchief rolled into a ball into his gullet and drove it down his throat with a wooden peg and a mallet for a minute or two with gaping mouth blackening face and eyes starting from his head he continued to struggle then he fell back on the floor and one of the executioner's assistants sat on his face till the last quiver died away they next came to karbalai haydar the furrier pustin Duz of kabul whom they slew in like manner and we seeing this for he was fourth in the row next to osta mahmoud made sure that all of us were to die we were mistaken however for they passed by the fifth and sixth in the row and myself the seventh and did not halt again 
till they came opposite to mirza hassan of sultanabad the surgeon who was next beyond me and when they had made an end of him and of mirza ahmad of tafrish who sat next beyond him they gathered up their instruments of death together with the lanterns and without saying another word left us there in the darkness the living and the dead chained together it was an awful night as you may imagine for us who lay beside our murdered companions expecting to share their fate or one yet worse on the morrow but amongst us was one poor hunchbacked cobbler who during the horrible scenes which had just been enacted had not once changed colour and he continued to console us reciting poems suitable to our situation chanting verses from the sacred books and crying a strange paradise is this yet if we are to die to-morrow it is at most that we shall eat so many pounds less of bread and meat ere our bodies return to the dust and our souls to the source whence they came he grew more excited as he talked and at last let us kill one another now he said i will show you how it may be done i will press and press so gently that you shall hardly know it on the veins of the neck and life will ebb quietly away how much better to die thus in all love and affection by the hands of our friends than as these did by the hands of the headsman it was only with the greatest difficulty that we could restrain him from carrying out his purpose and so continue anxiously awaiting the morning no more of us however were doomed to suffer death on this occasion save one old woman nearly seventy years of age the wife of haji aga mohsen's paternal uncle her they sent to tehran and when they asked the shah what should be done with her he said it is not good for a woman to be imprisoned wherefore they strangled her in the women's apartments of the palace and cast her body into a well the rest of us were released about a fortnight later after the governor had extorted from us as much money as he could in my case three hundred tomans i was not a little moved by this horrible story and regarded the sheikh with increased interest and respect for after all a man who has looked death in the face and such a death for conscience sake is worthy of respect though he be a drunkard and a libertine i could not help thinking what a strange combination of good and evil he must be such a combination as would be almost impossible save amongst the persians but i only said you have suffered much for your faith it would seem i he said nor was that the only time though it was the most terrible i was imprisoned in the jail and bar at tehran for three months and seventeen days along with five other babis aga jamal of borujerd son of mulla ali who was entitled the proof of islam hujjatul islam mirza abul fazl of golpaigon the secretary of monakji the zoroastrian agent at the persian court and the compiler under his directions and instructions of the new history of the most great theophany note this is a mistake 
mirza hossein of hamadan was monakji's secretary and he it was who with the help of mirza abul fazl compiled the new history see the introduction to my translation of that work pages thirty four to forty two end note Osta Ohangar, Molla Ali Akbar of Shemron, and Haji Molla Esmail Zabi. For the first three days and nights, our captivity was very grievous, for in the hopes of extorting money from us or our friends, they subjected us by day to various torments, and by night put our necks in the collar and our feet in the stocks Khalil. but we determined to bear our sufferings rather than appeal for money to our friends knowing that to produce money would be only to increase the zeal of our tormentors and after thus enduring for three days we were rewarded by an abatement of our torments sheikh ibrahim next related to me what had once passed between himself and the shah's eldest son the zealous sultan and the account given to him by the prince of the death of the martyrs of esfahan which as i have already published it in the notes to the second volume of my traveller's narrative pages four o one to three i will not here repeat especially as i have already referred to this episode more than once in the course of these pages i then again attempted to ascertain his views on the future life and on the nature of the divinity ascribed to baha but the arag which he had drunk was beginning to take effect and he was growing gradually incoherent concerning the soul he said that it was imperishable and that when the body died it looked calmly and unconcernedly on at the preparations for interment pure and impure souls he added were like clean and dirty water the pure poured back into the brook the impure cast forth upon the ground to become mingled with it as for baha the sheikh said i have heard him say in my presence i do not desire lordship over others i desire all men to become even as i am when i remarked that many of his followers declared him to be divine in quite another sense than those who according to the sufi doctrine had escaped from self and become merged in god the sheikh simply remarked then they are in error he added that baha had forbidden him from preaching or making any attempts at proselytizing saying that he had already suffered enough for his faith and after this the last rational remark to which he gave utterance he relapsed into ribaldry and incoherence and presently fell asleep thursday eighteenth july ninth zelqa'de towards evening i went into the town and called at the post office where the postmaster lent me a poem in praise of baha composed by one naim of obade a poor man of no education whose power of verse-writing is regarded by his co-religionists as a divine gift and little short of miraculous his verses are partly in persian partly in arabic and of the latter at any rate it may truly be said that they are of the most miraculous character osta akbar the pea-parcher was also there he was after his wont very mysterious and informed me that a relation of the postmasters who was a molla and who possessed some of qurratul ain's poems was anxious to see me but that i must not mention this to the postmaster as he might be displeased i was somewhat surprised at what appeared to me to be so unnecessary a stipulation 
but attributed it to Osta Akbar's love of mystery. It was only afterwards, for the pronouns in Persian do not distinguish gender, that I discovered that the Molla in question was a lady, who regarded herself as a manifestation, mazhar, or reincarnation of Qurratul Ain. It was accordingly arranged that I should meet this Molla on the next day but one, at the house of one of the officials of the post office. As I did not know where he lived, I inquired as to how I should find my way thither. Osta Akbar naturally selected the most cumbrous and mysterious method he could think of. I was to walk slowly past his shop at a certain hour on the Saturday in question, and he would tell his apprentice to be on the lookout for me, and as soon as he saw me, to run out, pass me, and precede me at a distance of twenty or thirty yards to the rendezvous. This plan was duly carried out, and on the afternoon of the appointed day, I found myself in a room in the house of Haydarullah Beg, the postman, where, besides my host, were seated the manifestation of Qurratul Ain and a Bobby dervish, the former engaged in smoking a kalyan, the latter an opium pipe. I was filled with astonishment at seeing a lady in the room, and my astonishment was increased when I heard the others address her as a mulla, and ascertained that she was the learned Bobby who had expressed a wish to make my acquaintance. She greeted me very politely, bowing repeatedly as she exclaimed, Musharraf, Mozayan, Chashmima Roshan. You have made the house honoured and adorned. Our eyes are brightened. And then asking me how long it was since I had believed. I was somewhat embarrassed by this question, and tried to explain that I was an inquirer only whereupon she began to give a long and rather garbled version of Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, which she concluded by bidding me not be like that disciple who denied his master. By this time eight or nine other persons had joined us, including Sheikh Ibrahim and his friend Abdullah, in consequence of which the recitation of Qurratul Ain's poems, which I had been so eager to hear, was postponed. Several Bobby books, however, were shown to me, including one containing the Kalimat i or Hidden Words of Fatima, note C, volume 2 of my traveller's narrative, pages 123 to 6, and note 2 at foot of page 123 and catalogue and description of 27 Bobby manuscripts, J.R.A.S., for 1892, pages 671 to 4, end note, of which the surpassing eloquence was greatly praised by all present. Will you not smoke a Galyan? inquired Sheikh Ibrahim, turning suddenly to me. I signified assent, and he called for one to be brought. A good one, mind, for the Saheb, he cried, as the servant left the room. In a minute or two, the Talyan was brought, and as I took it, and according to the customary etiquette, offered it in turn to all present, before putting my lips to it, I fancied that I watched with a certain attention and subdued amusement, for which I could not account. The first whiff of smoke, however, explained the cause of this. My experience with cannabis indica while I was a student at St. Bartholomew's Hospital had not been altogether fruitless, since it had indelibly impressed on my memory the taste of this hateful drug, which now again, for the third time in my life, struck on my palate. Oh, thought I to myself, so this is the trick you thought to play on me, is it?
but I continued to smoke on slowly and deliberately till the sheikh, unable any longer to control his curiosity, asked me how I found this Kalyan. Nice enough, I answered, but I fear it somewhat, for, unless I am much mistaken, you have put Master Sayyed into it. Note, hashish is thought so badly of in Persia that it is usually spoken of even by those who use it by some nickname, such as Agaye Sayyed, Master Sayyed, Tutiye Asrar, the parrot of mysteries, or simply Asrar, mysteries, the two first alluding to its green colour. One of the odes of Hafez, beginning Alaya Tutiye Guyaye Asrar, Mabauda Khawliyat Shat Kar O parrot, who discoursest of mysteries, may thy beak never want sugar, is addressed to the drug. End note. I do not think that during the whole time I was in Persia I ever scored so great a success as by this simple remark, that I, a mere European, should be able to recognize the taste of hashish was much but that i should know it so to speak by its pet name was indeed to prove myself well matured porte by travel and the society of persons of experience however did you know that inquired the sheikh amidst the laughter and applause of the others because i am a ferangi must i needs be an ass I demanded with a show of indignation. Sheikh Ibrahim was delighted, and proceeded to unfold to me many mysteries connected with the use of narcotics in Persia. He told me of an oil called rogan hashish oil of the Indian hemp, prepared from a plant named Tatoure datura, of which half a nochod would render a man insensible for twenty-four or thirty-six hours. This, he said, was often employed by Persian adventurers in Turkey and Arabia, especially in Mosul and Mecca, to stupefy persons whom they wished to rob. Mixed with the food intended for the victim's consumption, its flavour is imperceptible, and the protracted insensibility to which it gives rise allows the thief ample time to decamp these revelations were however interrupted by the arrival of a morshed or spiritual director of the shah netmatullahi order of dervishes who asked me point-blank what my religion was and was much annoyed when I answered him with the well-known tradition, Ustur the Hebeke, we the Hebeke, Wemed Hebek. Conceal thy gold, thy destination, and thy creed. Monday, 22nd July, 13th, Zelqa'de. Today, another threatened collision between Sayyid Hussein of Jandag and Sheikh Ibrahim was with difficulty averted. The former had dropped in during the afternoon to read me selected extracts from Haji Muhammad Karim Khan's attack on the Babi doctrines, when the latter most importunely joined us. The two glared at one another for a while, and then the Sayyid, who had a really remarkable faculty for making things disagreeable, began to ask the Sheikh whether he had been to Accra lately, and other similar questions. I interposed, and to my great relief succeeded in changing the conversation and getting the Sheikh to talk about his travels. He told us about the Yazidis, the so-called devil worshippers of Mosul and its environs. They extend for a distance of three stages west of Mosul, said he, and a strange folk they are, uglier than you can imagine, with immense heads and long unkempt beards, 
and dressed in white or crimson clothes they refuse to regard any sect or any person even the devil whom they call malakita us the peacock angel as bad and if any unwary traveller curses him or omar or shemr or any one else whom most men are wont to curse or if he spits on the ground they consider it incumbent on themselves to kill him though every man of them should suffer death in retaliation they have a sort of temple whither they repair for their devotions and there as i have heard for none save themselves may enter they from time to time spread a banquet and then let loose a cock if the cock eats the food they consider their offering as accepted but if not as rejected tuesday twenty third july fourteenth zel qade in the afternoon i rode into town and visited the sheikh of qom he called to his little daughter a child six or seven years of age who was on the roof to come down and speak to me but she with precocious modesty hid her face with a corner of her shawl and refused why wilt thou not come down and speak to the ferangi sahib inquired her father because i am shy cried the little one from the roof peeping out from behind her extemporized veil thou art not wont to be so shy before others he continued why then before this one i do not reckon them as men she replied with a toss of her head and ran away to hide while we both burst out laughing and i remarked that such a complaint from the lips of a child was indeed gratifying the sheikh talked rather freely about babism the allegations made by the mussulmans about the babis said he though untrue are in most cases founded to some extent upon fact they say for instance that the bab wrote arabic which violated all the rules of grammar this is not true but it is true that he made use of grammatical forms which though theoretically possible are not sanctioned by usage such as wahed from wahid and farad from farid and the like so too they accuse qurratul ain of unchastity that is a lie she was the essence of purity but after his holiness the point that is the bab had declared the law of islam abrogated and ere he had promulgated new ordinances there ensued a period of transition which we call fetrat the interval during which all things were lawful so long as this continued she may very possibly have consorted for example with mulla muhammad ali of barfurush as though he had been her husband though afterwards when the new law was revealed she and all the others were most rigorous in its observance at this point we were joined by a certain mulla whom i knew to be the chief azali in kerman and to have an enormous collection of bobby books i was extremely anxious to draw him into conversation on this topic when to my great chagrin the postmaster who was as will be remembered a determined bahai was announced he looked at us suspiciously evidently guessing the subject which occupied our thoughts and forthwith there fell upon us a sense of constraint which soon brought about the dispersion of the assembly on leaving the sheikh's house i was making for the telegraph office to condole with the prince telegraphist on the death of his eldest son the poor lad whom i had last seen smoking opium at the house of my friend the secretary of the governor when i was met with mirza ali nadi khan 
the brother of the chief of the farrashes and by him detained in conversation while we were talking a murmur suddenly arose that the prince governor was coming and every one began to bow down with arms folded across their breasts in humble obeisance when the prince saw me he called me to him brought me with him into his garden and bade his servants bring tea galions and cigarettes he did not talk much being busy reading a packet of letters which had just been placed in his hands and examining a fine gold repeater which had arrived by the same post so when i had sat for a short time i asked permission to retire which was accorded me i then proceeded to the telegraph office where i found the prince telegraphist looking very sad and dejected and surrounded by five or six bobbies of note who like myself had come to offer condolence on returning to my garden about two hours after sunset i found the pea parcher and a rather notable dervish of the shah netmatullahi order named shahrukh awaiting me they had supper with me and stayed all night the dervish smoked a great quantity of opium and recited a vast amount of mystical poetry of which his memory appeared to contain an inexhaustible store the pea parcher retired for a while leaving us alone and presently returned in a state of boastful intoxication i am adam he cried again and again i am moses i am jesus i am muhammad what say you to that i was so disgusted that at last i could not refrain from answering since you ask my opinion i should say that you have had too much to drink and are now talking blasphemous nonsense wednesday twenty fourth july fifteenth zel ba'de my guests departed early soon after sunrise usta akbar awakening me to communicate the message which had brought him to the garden on the previous evening there is a poor opium needer teryog maul of my acquaintance said he one of the friends who is most anxious to entertain you at his house and has so importuned me to bring you that for the sake of peace i had to promise that i would do so he wanted you to sup with him and stay the night at his house but having regard to its meanness i told him that this would not be convenient to you so it has been arranged that we shall lunch there to-morrow and spend the day come therefore in two hours time to the caravanserai of ganj ali khan and there one shall meet you who will conduct you to the opium needer's house i fell asleep again when usta akbar had gone and did not awake for several hours just as i was going out with abdul hussein i met the opium needer who poor man had already come once to the garden that morning to guide me to his house whither we at once proceeded haydarullah beg and nasrullah beg of the post office a dervish named habibullah and the pea parcher were the other guests and later we were joined by the prince telegraphist secretary and sheikh ibrahim who though uninvited had by some occult means discovered that an entertainment was in progress which i suppose he considered would not be complete without his presence soon after my arrival the dervish boy whose sweet singing had so delighted me one day in the caravanserai of ganj ali khan entered the room with a kalyan which he presented me with the bobby salutation allahu abha all those present indeed were bobbies and after lunch as we sat sipping our tea and taking an occasional whiff of opium quantities of bobby poems 
by Qurratul Ain, Suleiman Khan, Nabil, Rohau, a woman of Abade, and others were produced and handed round or recited, together with the Bob's seven proofs, Dalo El Sab E, Bahaz, Lohe Nasir, and other tracts and epistles. Before my departure, I succeeded in arranging with the Prince Telegraphist's secretary that he should copy out for me a selection of these treasures, which the owners kindly consented to place at my disposal. End of section 42. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Section 43 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Section 43. Thursday, 25th July, 16th zel in the afternoon i went into the city by the mosque gate through which crowds of people were pouring forth to visit the cemetery the eve of friday shabijom e being the favourite time for the performance of this pious act the bobby dervish boy was amongst the crowd and dervish fashion placed a sprig of mint in my hand as he passed but without asking or waiting for the small sum of money which is generally expected in return for this compliment in the square of the caravanserai of ganj ali khan i saw osta akbar standing and approached him to speak with him while we were conversing there came up to me a certain dervish who had once visited me in my garden and craved an alms for the sake of baha now in general i made it a rule to respond as far as possible to such calls but against this particular dervish i cherished some resentment for this reason on the day when he visited me in the garden sheikh ibrahim chanced to be with me and him either from previous knowledge or from some chance remark which he let drop the dervish recognized as a bobby so when he had sat with us for a while drunk several cups of tea and pocketed a gran and half a stick of opium he went out found sayyid hossein of jandag performing his ablutions at the stream by the gate and told him that i was certainly a bobby or in a fair way to become one since i was continually in the society of notorious bobbies all this of course was repeated to me and as i had treated this not very agreeable or intelligent dervish thus courteously rather on saadi's principle that quote, the dog's mouth is best stopped with a morsel end quote, i was naturally incensed at his indiscretion so when he asked me for the sake of baha to give him money i bade him be gone with scant ceremony and when he continued to importune me declaring that he had no bread for that night's supper i turned angrily upon him saying no opium i suppose you mean ay said he no opium neither bread nor opium for the sake of baha give me some money you ingrate namak haram i exclaimed exasperated at his pertinacity and indiscreetness for already a little crowd was gathering round us to listen to our dialogue and to stare at the ferangi babi from whom arms were demanded for the sake of baha how dare you come to me again for money after what you have done i am no ingrate he answered 
and whoever says so wrongs me what have i done that you should be thus angry with me what have you done i retorted when you came to the garden did i not give you money and tea and opium and speak you fair and did you not with the money and the opium in your pocket and the taste of tea in your mouth go out and make mischief against me spreading idle and damaging reports then at last he slunk away with some appearance of shame friday twenty sixth july seventeenth zel Ta'de. during the greater part of the day i was occupied in writing for the prince governor the brief account of my journey which he had requested me to compose for him towards evening sheikh ibrahim abdullah and the self-sufficient and conceited cobbler whose rudeness to the old zahabi dervish had so displeased me arrived simultaneously abdullah soon went off thinking that he might be wanted by his master and i was left with the other two both talked and sheikh ibrahim drank a great deal but as regards the talking the cobbler had at first the best of it and presently he demanded my copy of the Egon, and said he would read aloud to us an accomplishment on which he greatly prided himself sheikh ibrahim bore with this reading or rather chanting as long as he could gulping down his rage and his arag together till finally one or both of these proved too much for him and he suddenly turned ferociously on the unsuspecting cobbler beast and idiot he cried cannot you be silent when there are men present and let them talk without interrupting them with your abominable gabbling your silly head is so turned by ostal akbar and others who listen to your reading and applaud it with cries of zibo michonad how nicely he reads that you are conflated with conceit and do not see that this ferangi here who knows ten times as much arabic as you do is laughing at you under his lip because in every word of arabic which you read you violate a rule of grammar silence then and be no more intoxicated with osta akbar's zibo michonad the poor cobbler was utterly taken aback by this unexpected sally forgive me o sheikh he began i am only a poor ignorant man man cried the sheikh waxing more and more wroth i spit on the pates of the father and mother of this dog mamma note a slightly refined translation of the persian ridam bekelleye pedaro maudare nenne sag a form of abuse which was a great favourite with the sheikh who was not given to mincing words End note. man forsooth you are like those maggots charotin which thrust forth their heads from rotten fruit and wave them in the air under the impression that they are men i count you not as belonging to the world of humanity o oh, sheikh exclaimed the poor cobbler whatever you may please to say is right i have eaten dirt i have committed a fault i am the least of your servants but i will not accept you as my servant shouted the sheikh you are not in my world at all i take no cognizance of your existence and so he stormed on till the wretched cobbler now reduced to tears grovelled at his feet begging for enlightenment and instruction and saying you are a great and a wise man 
your knowledge is far beyond ours. You have travelled and seen the world, and looked on the blessed beauty, Jamal i Mubarak, that is, Baha'u'llah, the Babi hierarch at Accra. Tell me what to think, and what to believe, and what to do, and I will accept it. Finally, the Sheikh was appeased, and they embraced and made up their quarrel. Saturday, 28th July, 18th Zel Qa'da. This day was chiefly notable to me because, for the first time for several weeks, I succeeded in resisting the growing craving for opium which possessed me. This had now begun to cause me some anxiety, for I felt that the experiment had gone quite far enough. It is all very well, I thought to myself, to enter into the world of the opium smoker, and the experience was needed to complete my view of dervish life. But if I do not take care, I shall become a dervish in reality, living from hand to mouth, engrossed with smoking opium and weaving metaphysic, Erfan Balfi, and content if I can but postpone the business or trouble of today till tomorrow, a tomorrow which never comes. It is high time I took measures to put an end to this state of things. The plan which I devised for putting an end to my servitude was based upon the observation that it is not so much the smoking of opium as the regular smoking of opium at a fixed time that is dangerous. I believe that, speaking generally, anyone may indulge in an occasional pipe with impunity but I had accustomed myself to smoke opium regularly after supper, and so soon as this time came round, an indescribable craving came upon me, which only the drug could assuage. It therefore seemed to me that the first step towards emancipation must be to alter and gradually to increase the interval which, so far as I remember, I affected somewhat in the following way. One day, instead of waiting till after supper, I smoked a small amount of the drug at the time of afternoon tea. Next day, I waited till supper time, thus extending the interval of abstinence from twenty-four to thirty hours. On the third day, I sat up very late and smoked a very little opium just before retiring to rest, and on the fourth day I went to bed in reasonable time, and succeeded in falling asleep before the craving came upon me, not returning to the drug till the afternoon of the fifth day, thus farther extending the interval from thirty to forty hours. Thus gradually did I free myself from a thraldom which, as I believe, can hardly be broken in any other way. Sunday, 28th July, 19th Zel Qa'da. Today I lunched with Usta Akbar to meet the postmaster of Kerman. The chief of the telegraph at Rafsinjan, who was on a visit to Kerman, and several other Babis of the Bahai faction. On my entrance they greeted me with an outburst of raillery, induced, as it appeared, by their belief that I was disposed to prefer the claims of subh Azal to those of Baha, and that I had been influenced in this by the Sheikh of Qom and his friends. I was at first utterly taken aback and somewhat alarmed at their vehemence, but anger at the unjust and intolerant attitude towards the Azalis which they took up presently came to my aid, and I reminded them that such violence and unfairness, so far from proving their case, could only make it appear the weaker. From the statement of Sheikh Ibrahim, I concluded, who is one of your own party, it appears that your friends at Accra, who complain so much of the bigotry, intolerance, and ferocious antagonism of the Mohammedans, and who are always talking about consorting with men of every faith, with spirituality and fragrance, 
could find no better argument than the dagger of the assassin wherewith to convince the unfortunate azalis who were their companions in exile and i assure you that this fact has done more to incline me from baha to azal than anything which the sheikh of qum or his friends have said to me it would be more to the point if instead of talking in this violent and unreasonable manner you would produce the bayan of which ever since i came to kerman and indeed to persia i have been vainly endeavouring to obtain a copy and show me what the bab has said about his successor the postmaster and osta akbar eventually admitted that i was right and promised to try to obtain for me a copy of the bayan after this amicable relations were restored and the atmosphere seemed clearer for the past storm on returning to the garden i found sayyid hussein and one mirza Ghulam hussein awaiting my arrival they stayed for some time and as usual talked about religion with mirza Ghulam hussein i was much pleased though i could not satisfy myself as to his real opinions he told me that he had read the gospels attentively and was convinced of their genuineness by the deep effect which the words of christ recorded in them had produced on his heart he added that he could interpret many of the prophecies contained in the book of revelations as applying to muhammad and would do so for my benefit if i would visit him in the koravon saroye golshan where he lodged monday twenty ninth july twentieth zel Qa'deh. this evening there was another stormy scene in the summer house of which as usual sheikh ibrahim was the cause he and the parcher of peas came to visit me about sundown bringing with them a poor scrivener named mirza ahmad who had made for himself copies of certain writings of the babis with which as being a dangerous possession he was i was informed willing to part for a small consideration now to guard himself from suspicion in case the book should fall into the hands of an enemy he had placed at the end of the kitab aqdas which stood first in the volume a colophon wherein he had described it as quote, the book of the accursed misguided misleading sect of the babis this colophon which had not been seen by either of his companions caught my eye as i turned over the pages but i made no remark and fearing trouble if it should meet other eyes quickly closed the book and laid it aside shortly afterwards ostar akbar wishing to speak with me privately drew me apart when we returned it was to find that the explosion which i dreaded had taken place and that sheikh ibrahim having taken up the book and seen the objectionable words was pouring forth the vials of his wrath on the poor scrivener who overcome with shame and terror was shaking like an aspen and on the verge of tears it was only with the greatest difficulty that i could stem the torrent of threatening and abusive language which the sheikh continued to pour forth and lead mirza ahmad out into the garden where he sat down by the stream and began to weep finally i succeeded in comforting him a little with fair words and a larger sum of money than he had expected but the evening was not a harmonious one and the acquisition of a new manuscript was the only feature in it which caused me any satisfaction wednesday thirty first july twenty second zel Qa'deh. in the morning seyyed hussein came bringing with him a kindly and courteous old divine of the sheikhi sect named mullah muhammad of jupar when lunchtime came i invited them to eat with me 
although i added with a smile i am in your eyes but an unclean infidel now god forbid that it should be so exclaimed the old mullah in his name exalted is he will we partake of your food so haji safar set before them delicate and strange meats whereof they ate with great contentment and presently departed well pleased with their entertainment thereupon i again set to work on the account of my journey which i was writing for the prince governor intending later to go into the city but word came from mirza javad's son that he should visit me with his tutor and about three hours before sunset they arrived i was greatly displeased at the conduct of the aforesaid tutor mulla Qolam hossein on this occasion for soon after his arrival there was placed in my hands a letter from one of my bobby friends at yazd which he with gross impertinence requested me to show him this i naturally declined to do but he unabashed picked up the envelope from the ground where it lay and began to criticize the superscription which ran as follows which being interpreted is may its arrival be with good in kerman by the perusal of edward saheb of lofty dignity endowed with virtues excellent of qualities and of resort the discerning philosopher may his excellence be augmented and his guidance be increased may it be honoured discerning philosopher excellent of resort read mullah Qolam hossein what right have you a ferengi to such titles as these either be this thing or that a ferengi or a persian an end was put to this unpleasant conversation by the return of sayyid hossein and the old mullah of jupar who were soon followed by Osta akbar and several other persons mostly babis in this ill-assorted and incongruous assembly which threatened momentarily to terminate in an explosion i was oppressed as by a thunderstorm and i was almost thankful when the rudeness of usta akbar finally put the sheikhis to rout leaving the babis in possession of the field these also departed a little later leaving me at last in peace they wished me to go with them on the morrow or the following day to mahon to visit the shrine of the great sufi saint shah ni'matullah i told them that i had already promised to go with some of my zoroastrian friends whereupon they urged me to break with these gabrhoye najes unclean pagans as they called them and would hardly take no for an answer but at last when after listening in silence to their efforts to persuade me i replied it is no use talking more about it i have given my word to the zoroastrians and will not go back on it for my word is one they turned away impatiently exclaiming go with the gubras and god pardon thy father next day i had a telegram from shiraz inquiring when i proposed to return thither and urging me to leave kerman without further delay this caused me some annoyance as i had no wish to leave it yet and hoped to obtain permission from cambridge to postpone my return to england till january so that i might go by bandara abbas and the persian gulf to baghdad and thence to damascus and acre which would be impossible 
till the cooler weather came i therefore had recourse to the opium pipe and deferred answering the message till the following day when i visited the telegraph office and dispatched an answer to the effect that i had no intention of quitting kerman at present i found my friend the prince telegraphist still much cast down at the loss of his eldest son his mind was evidently running much on the fate of the soul after its separation from the body and he asked me repeatedly what think you of the matter what have you understood he also talked more openly than he had hitherto done about the bobby religion saying that as between the rival claimants to the pontificate baha and azal he found it hard to decide but that as to the divine mission of mirza ali muhammad the bab there could he thought be no doubt then his secretary who was an ardent believer in baha read extracts from the epistles and treatises which he was copying for me and asked if these were like the words of a mere man but the poor prince only shook his head sorrowfully saying it is a hard matter god knows best next day a term was put to my uncertainty though not in the way i wished by the arrival of a telegram from england which had been translated into persian and sent on from shiraz bidding me be in cambridge by the beginning of october there was no hope for it then i must leave kerman and that without much delay and abandoning all idea of baghdad acre and a camel ride across the syrian desert post to tehran and return home by the caspian sea and russia it was a bitter disappointment at the time and on the top of it came as is so often the case another which though small in comparison gave me that sense of things going generally wrong which almost every one must at some time have experienced my zoroastrian friend who was to have taken me to mahon sent word that a misfortune had befallen him the death of his brother in tehran as i afterwards discovered which rendered this impossible and my bobby friends who had previously so greatly importuned me to accompany them had now made other arrangements so that it seemed likely that i should have to leave kerman without visiting the tomb of the celebrated saint shah ni'matullah i had now no excuse for prolonging my stay at kerman yet still i could not summon up resolution to leave it it seemed as though my whole mental horizon had been altered by the atmosphere of mysticism and opium smoke which surrounded me i had almost ceased to think in english and nothing seemed so good in my eyes as to continue the dreamy speculative existence which i was leading with opium for my solace and dervishes for my friends peremptory telegrams came from shiraz sometimes two or three together but i heeded them not and banished all thought of them with these two potent antidotes to action of which i have spoken above their influence must have been at its height at this time for once or twice i neglected for a day or two even to write my diary a daily task which i had hitherto allowed nothing to keep me from accomplishing the record of the incidents which marked the day preceding the first break of this sort shows the elements of external disturbance and internal quietism in full conflict on the one hand a tripartite telegram from the english superintendent of the telegraph at shiraz the chief of the persian office at the same place the same whom i had known at yazd whence he had recently been transferred and my former host the nawab strongly urging me to start at once on the other two wildly mystical poems given to me by a dervish morshed 
a spiritual director whom i had left in a state of unconsciousness produced by some narcotic compound which i had refused to taste and of which he had offered to prove the innocuousness by eating it some decision however was imperatively called for and could not much longer be deferred for amongst other things my money had nearly come to an end and i could only obtain a fresh supply in tehran esfahan or bushir in this strait my friends came to my assistance with a delicacy and a generosity which i shall not readily forget i was making arrangements for borrowing at five per cent interest a sufficient sum to take me at least as far as esfahan or tehran when almost simultaneously by a balbi and a zoroastrian merchant i was offered an advance that i might need i was at first unwilling to borrow from either of them remembering the arabic proverb el qurdu miqradul muwaddat borrowing is the scissors of friendship but they would take no denial especially the balbi who said that he should feel deeply hurt if i refused to accept his offer finally i consented to avail myself of his kindness and borrowed from him a sum of sixty or seventy tomans about twenty pounds for which he declined to accept any interest and could only be prevailed upon with difficulty to take a receipt this sum i duly remitted to his agent at tehran on my arrival there and now haji safar who in spite of occasional fits of perversity and sulkiness had always shown himself a faithful and loyal servant came to the rescue he had been much troubled and not without reason at the state of indecision and inactivity into which i had lapsed which state he ascribed to some spell cast over me by the bobbies to whom he had even addressed threats and remonstrances so one night while waiting on me at supper he unfolded to me a plan which he had formed as follows sahib he began you cannot stay on here for ever and you know that you are wanted in england at the beginning of the month of safar next seventh october eighteen eighty eight now i have been thinking how you can stay at kerman as long as possible see as much new country as possible and still be back in your own country in time if you return to shiraz and go thence to bushir and there take ship you will not arrive in time even if we could start at once which we cannot do as it will not be easy to find mules for the journey it is much better then that we should go to tehran and that you should return thence through russia the advantages of this plan are that you can have a week or ten days more here visit your friends at rafsinjan on the way see your friends at yazd kashan qum and tehran again be in the capital for the moharram passion plays which you will nowhere see so well performed and traverse mazandaran or gilan both of which as i can assure you are very remarkable countries which you ought to see before leaving persia i will undertake to sell your horse for not less than you gave for it and before it is sold i will arrange for you to visit mahan as you wish to do you can write to shiraz for your things to be sent to meet you at tehran where also you will be able to buy any more books of which you have need what do you think of my plan have i not spoken well that he had spoken well there was no doubt his plan was the best that remained possible and he had baited it cunningly with a sudden sense of shame at my own lethargy and gratitude to haji safar for his wise admonition i determined once and for all to shake off this fatal quietism which had been so long growing on me 
and at once to take the steps necessary for the execution of his plan two days later on ninth august everything was in proper train the expedition to mahon had presented some difficulties but they were overcome by haji safar's energy he came to me about sundown on that day with a smile of triumph and satisfaction saheb said he it is all arranged you will go to mahon and perform your visitation to the shrine and that without bearing the burden of obligation to any one i have found an old man an uncle of the gardeners and a regular desert walker biobon gasht who will bear you company and show you the way for i must remain here to complete our preparations for the journey i will bring you your supper directly and then you had better go to sleep for a while for if you start four hours after sunset you will still be at mahon by daybreak you will remain there all to-morrow travel back in the same way to-morrow night and be here at daybreak on sunday morning the silent march to mahon for the old guide stalked on before me with swift untiring gait only looking round now and again to see that i was following him was pleasant in spite of its monotony never had my horse carried me so well as on this our last journey together once again my spirit was refreshed and rejoiced by the soft night air and the shimmer of the moonlight on the sand hills until the sky grew pale with the dawn and the trees and buildings of mahon stood clear before us we went straight to the shrine of the great saint shah netmatullah and were admitted without difficulty in company with other pilgrims one of the dervishes attached to the shrine read the ziyarat or form of visitation then he said to me as the other pilgrims were kissing the tombstone saheb shah netmatullah was a great man i acquiesced in the world of the gnostics there is no difference of sects he continued again i agreed then said he seeing that this is so it were not amiss for you to kiss his tombstone i did as he desired and then having visited the various buildings connected with the shrine returned with the dervishes to their kahve coffee-house or guest-chamber where i had tea and slept till noon in the afternoon the dervishes took me to see some of the gardens which surround mahon in one of these called the gardane shotor camel's neck a charming spot i met my friend serouche the zoroastrian who was still mourning the death of his brother and had come to mahon for a day's solitude and quiet before starting for tehran to wind up his affairs about two hours before sunset after another cup of tea i bade farewell to the kindly dervishes mounted my horse and started homewards with my guide well pleased with mahon and its people and disposed to regard as a gratuitous slander that cynical verse behesht e ruye zamin ast qet e mahon be shart e on ke takanash de hand dar duzakh the district of mahon would be an earthly paradise on condition that it should be well shaken over hell note that is that all its inhabitants should be shaken from it into hell end note to our left lay the village of langar the headquarters of the sheikhis where live the sons of the bab's great rival and antagonist the late haji muhammad karim khan of kerman i asked my guide whether we could not visit it on our way to this he consented and in a short while we found ourselves in the quiet lane where dwell the agazades sons of the master here we met a sheikhi divine whom my guide accosted telling him that i wished to pay my respects 
to the Agazades, and before I had time to consider whether I should do well to thrust myself upon the leaders of a sect for which I had but little kindliness, I found myself in the courtyard of their house. At the farther end of this courtyard, mats and carpets were spread, and on these sat in rows some dozen sour-looking, heavy-turbaned, shaky students, to whom two of Karim Khan's sons, seated in the place of honour, were expounding the text of a work of their father's called the Faslul Khetab. Ashamed to retreat, I advanced and sat down on my heels like the others, in the lowest place. Of those nearest to me, some glared indignantly at me, and others edged away. But no other notice was taken of my arrival, till the lecture was over, when one of the Agazades addressed me, remarking that he had heard I was going after religions. I replied that he had been correctly informed. Well, said he, and have you found a religion better than that in which you were brought up? No, I replied. What of Islam? continued he. It is a good religion, I answered. Which is best, said he, the law of Islam or your law? Why do you ask me this question? I replied. My apparel answers for me. If I thought Islam the better, I should not come here clad in this raiment, but rather in turban and abal. Thereat the younger students laughed, and the Agazades, remarking that it was the time for the evening prayer, went off to the mosque, leaving a cousin of theirs who wore the dress of a layman to entertain me till their return. He gave me tea, and would have had me stay to supper, so as to converse with the Agazades, but I excused myself, and soon after their return from the mosque, took my departure. One of Karim Khan's sons accompanied me to the gate. I thanked him for his hospitality. Our prophet hath bidden us honour the guest said he even though he be an infidel i replied completing the quotation whereat we parted with laughter another silent ride through the moonlit desert and as the sun rose above the horizon i alighted for the last time from my honest old horse at the gate of my garden in kerman the arrangements for his sale had been already concluded, and that very day the servant of his new master brought me a cheque for eighteen tomans, about six pounds, one toman more than I had paid for him, and led him away. And as I gave him a final caress, for I had come to love the beast after a fashion, I felt that now indeed I had finally broken with the pleasant Persian life of the last three months. End of chapter 17 Amongst the Kalandars End of section 43 Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater Recorded in London Section 44 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Section 44. Chapter 18. From Kerman to England. يقولنا أن الموت صعب وإنما مفارقة الأحباب والله أصعب They say that death is hard but by the name of God I swear that separation from one's friends is harder still to bear 
شب شنبه زکرمان بار کردم غلط کردم که پشت بر یار کردم on friday night i loaded up for kerman i did ill for i turned my back on my friend it was on a sunday morning that i parted with my horse and my departure was arranged for the following tuesday on that day while paying a farewell visit to the young bobby merchant who had so kindly advanced me the money which i needed for my journey back to tehran i met the postmaster's son he appeared to be sulky with me for some reason probably because of my friendliness with the azalis and apologies for their attitude and coldly observed that the sooner i left kerman the better and that if i could leave that very night it would be best of all i answered that this was impossible but that i would perhaps start on the morrow then you must go early in the morning said he so as to avoid collision with the post when i told this to sheikh ibrahim on whom i next called he was greatly incensed nonsense said he the rascally burnt father only wants to get your money as soon as may be so that he may get drunk eat sweetmeats and play the libertine you must stop here to-night and sup with me and some others of your friends i will ask the postmaster and his scoundrel of a son too and you shall see how small they will sing after i have had a talk with them i'll warrant they will be humble enough then and will let you have your horses whenever it may please you somewhat comforted by the sheikh's confidence in his own powers i went off with usta akbar to pay a visit to some of my bobby friends who were employed in the post office in a subordinate capacity after which we returned to sheikh ibrahim's abode he had been as good as his word the postmaster and his son were there both to use the sheikh's expression the very essence of submission Masitaslim, ready to let me have horses for my journey whenever it might please me the evening passed off harmoniously after this the sheikh cooking the supper himself only occasionally stopping to address a remark to one of us o thou who art buried in this land of kalf and rao note that is kerman which is so called by the babis and in the kitab e aqdas end note he cried out to me in one of these pauses why should you leave this place since you like it so well because i replied i must be back at the university of cambridge early in the autumn my leave of absence is nearly at an end and they have summoned me to return i spit on the university of gimbredge so he pronounced it answered the sheikh and to such revilings he continued at intervals to give vent throughout the evening when one begins to procrastinate there is no end to it i wish to start on thursday august sixteenth but at the last moment when i was actually ready for the journey word came from the post office that the post which was due out on that day was so heavy that there were no horses to spare and from one cause or another my actual departure was deferred till the evening of sunday nineteenth august all day i was busy with farewells to which there seemed to be no end for several of my friends were loath to bid me a final good-bye and i too shrank from the parting for i knew how unlikely it was that i should ever see them again to this thought the postmaster who had recovered his wonted kindliness of manner gave expression in this world we shall see one another no more as i think said he but in another world we shall without doubt meet again and that world is the better for there all things will be made clear and there will be no more parting my last visit was to the prince telegraphist on my way thither i was stopped in the street 
by the Babi cobbler, who had been so roughly rebuked by Sheikh Ibrahim for his chanting of the sacred books. He was in a great state of agitation, and cried out to me with tears in his eyes. Sahib, you will go to Accra, if not now, then at some future time, and you will see the supreme beauty. Note, that is, Baha'u'llah, end note. Do not forget me then, mention me there, and let my name be remembered in the holy presence. The post-horses, ready laden for the journey, called for me at the telegraph office. It was after sunset, but the prince had caused the northern gate of the city to be kept open for me after the usual hour of closing, so that I was able to linger a little while longer in the city, which had cast so strange a glamour over me. At last, however, I rose regretfully and bade him farewell and as the great gate closed behind me with a dull clang and i found myself in the open plain under the star-spangled sky i thought that i had seen the last of all my kerman friends but when we halted at the post-house which as before said stands some distance outside the city to the north there was sheikh ibrahim and Osta akbar the pea-parcher come out to see the last of me and i had to dismount and smoke a last pipe with them while the sheikh who was subdued and sorrowful told me how his friend abdullah had fled none knew whither with such raiment only as he wore leaving word that he was bound for Accra and would not return till his eyes had gazed on the supreme beauty you may very likely come up with him on the road he concluded in which case i pray you to stop him reason with him and if necessary send him back in the custody of some trustworthy person else will he certainly perish ere his mad quest be accomplished it was three hours past sunset when i at length mounted and turned my face northwards at midnight i was at balbin the first stage out from kerman and there i rested for a while in a garden belonging to naeb hassan whom we had overtaken on the way and who set before me melons and other delicious fruits soon after daybreak i was at kabutar khan where i slept till noon was past and then after lunch and tea set out for rafsenjan where i was to stay for the night with the telegraphist a balbi whose acquaintance i had made at kerman on the way thither i passed two of my dervish friends who with banners arms gourds and all the paraphernalia of professional mendicants were returning from rafsenjan and somewhat later naeb hassan's brother who presented me with a melon a little later after this i met one of the officials of the kerman post office also a babi with whom i was well acquainted returning from the limit of the kerman district to which it was his duty to escort the post after a brief conversation we exchanged horses i taking the ugly black beast which had brought him from rafsenjan in spite of its ill looks it got over the ground at an amazing pace and guided by another babi in the postal service all the post office officials about kerman seemed to be babis i arrived at my friend's house in kamalabad hard by bahramabad in good time for supper at which i met my old friend the postmaster of the latter place i had arranged before leaving kerman to spend two days with another of my babi friends aga muhammad hassan of yazd my guest on the occasion of that wild banquet described on four eighty nine supra who lived at a little village distant only about five miles from bahramabad somewhat off the main road i had not altogether wished to consent to this fresh delay 
but Aga Muhammad Hassan was determined that it should be so, and had secured my compliance by a rather cunning device. Hearing that I was very desirous of obtaining a manuscript of the Persian Bayan, and that Osta Akbar had found one which the owner was willing to part with, he bought it himself, sent it off by post the same day to his home, lest I should induce him to change his mind, and then, when he bade me farewell, promised to give me the book I so greatly longed to possess if I would visit him on my way north. Only after his departure did I learn the trick that had been played upon me, for not till Osta Akbar explained that this was the manuscript about which he had spoken to me did I realize with mixed indignation and amusement how I had been duped. Now, if I wanted my bayan, it was clear that I should have to go to Aga Muhammad Hassan's village for it, and I was not going to lose the only chance that I had yet had of obtaining this precious volume for the sake of gaining two paltry days. As there was no question, therefore, of getting beyond this village for the present, and no object of arriving there before evening, I stayed with my friends at Bahramabad till half an hour before sundown, when I again mounted the ugly black horse which had carried me so well on the previous day, and set off at a tearing gallop. As I drew near the village, I descried a little group assembled on a small conical hill just outside it. Their figures stood out clear against the setting sun, and I could see that they were watching for my arrival. Even as I espied them, one of them, my host's son, a handsome lad of eighteen or nineteen, disengaged himself from their midst, and, mounting a large white ass, which stood ready, advanced at a rapid amble to meet me. I should have stopped to greet him, but the black horse would hardly consent to be checked in his headlong career, and in about a minute more I was in the middle of the group. Having dismounted, I had to exchange embraces with my host and his bobby friends, some ten or a dozen in number, a proceeding which, in spite of its patriarchal character, was rather tedious. Then taking me by the hand, my host led me through the village street, which was lined with curious onlookers, to his house. I remained here for two days, days which passed pleasantly, but uneventfully. There were the usual tea-drinking, smoking of opium and tobacco, and long debates, in shaded rooms by day, and in the moonlit garden by night, on religious and philosophical questions. There were several guests besides myself, some of whom had come from Kerman to meet me. Amongst these was one, a dyer by trade, whose good sense and moderation especially impressed me. To him I expressed my dissatisfaction at the exaggerated language employed by Nabil, the poet, and other Bobbies in speaking of Baha. He agreed with me, but said that allowance must be made for them, if their affection for their master prompted them at times to use language which calmer reason could not approve. My host had a large collection of Bobby manuscripts, together with some photographs, which he showed us with much pride and yet much caution never suffering more than one book at a time to leave the box in which he kept his treasures. For liberal as the Balbees are in all else, they hoard their books as a miser does his gold, and if a Balbee were to commit a theft, it would be some rare and much-prized manuscript which would vanquish his honesty. And so it was that, when the moment of my departure arrived, I came near to losing the manuscript of the Persian Bayan, which had served as the bait to lead me to this remote hamlet of Rafsenjan. My host begged me to leave it with him for a month, 
for a week even for five days in five days he said he could get it copied and it should then be sent after me to yazd or tehran or any other place i might designate i was obdurate however for i yearned to possess the book and felt that i was entitled to have it neither dared i leave it behind me fearing lest the temptation to keep it should prove too strong for my bobby friends so at last when the discussion had grown protracted i said i have eaten your bread and salt and am your guest if you will have the book take it but i would almost as lief give you my head then said he after a moment's pause take it if such be your feeling we cannot ask you to give it up so i put the precious volume in my pocket with a sense of profound thankfulness and accompanied by my friends walked out a little distance from the village before mounting once more we embraced and then tightening the wide leather belt in which i carried my money and buttoning the hardly won bayon into my breast pocket i hoisted myself into the saddle and amidst a shower of good wishes for the journey again set my face towards yazd it was about an hour before sunset on thursday twenty third august when i resumed my northward journey three hours after sunset i was at koshku where i stopped only to change horses at about three a m on the friday i was at bayaz and soon after sunrise at anaur here i rested and had luncheon not starting again till the afternoon about sundown i was at shenosh where such bad horses were provided that i did not reach kerman shauhan till nine or ten p m there i had supper tea and i regret to add a pipe of opium which greatly comforted me and then i slept till daybreak next day saturday twenty fifth august i reached zainuddin two hours after sunrise and ate a melon while the fresh horses were being saddled soon after leaving this place the shagird chaupaur postboy who accompanied us raised an alarm of thieves and indeed we saw three horsemen wheeling round us in the distance i fancy however that they were waiting there in the hopes of rescuing some of their comrades who had recently been captured at kerman and were being sent in chains to tehran to undergo judgment at any rate they did not molest us about noon we arrived at sarayazd where i halted for lunch for an hour or two as i was preparing to start a kermani woman who was standing by called out to me we pray god to bring you back to kerman i suppose she was a balbi and regarded me as a co-religionist though how she knew anything about me i was at a loss to imagine rather more than an hour before sunset i reached mohammedabad a sort of suburb of yazd here i visited the brother of the younger babi merchant who had befriended me at kerman meaning only to stay for a short time but nothing would serve him save that i should be his guest that night and go on to yazd on the following morning i was not loath to accept his hospitality and a right pleasant evening we passed on a roof overlooking beautiful gardens redolent with the perfume of flowers and resonant with the song of the nightingale here it was i think that i smoked my last opium pipe in persia amidst surroundings the most perfect that could be imagined next evening sunday twenty sixth august i supped with the balbi seyeds at yazd where i remained till the following friday lodging at the post-house which is situated at the northern extremity of the town i saw most of my old friends except the prince governor during these five days and received from all of them a very cordial welcome 
but the Babi Sayyids were not a little vexed to find that I had foregathered with the Azalis at Kerman. I told you, remarked the poet Andalib, that no good would come of your going there, and I was, it seems, perfectly right. I left Yazd at sunrise on Friday, 31st August, and entered the great sand desert which bounds it on the north. It and the long post ride to Kaushan were equally monotonous, and need little more description than a list of the stages, times, and distances, which were as follows. Yazd to Meibut, or Meibod, where I arrived about 2 p.m., at Ezzabad, to visit an acquaintance, ten parasangs. Thence to Chefte, which we reached about 5 p.m., six parasangs. Thence to Agdal, where we arrived about half an hour after dusk, four parasangs. Here we were delayed by the post, which always has the first right to horses, till late in the night, when, after supper and a short sleep, we stayed by bright moonlight and reached the desolate post-house of Nogonboz, whence a road leads to Esfahan, half an hour before sunset on 1st September, nine parasangs. 1st September. Slept till noon at Nogonboz, thence a dreary stage of six parasangs brought us about 4 p.m. to the queer old rambling town of Naen. Half an hour after sunset, we reached Neyestanak, six parasangs, where the son-in-law of one of the postal officials of Yazd, with whom I had made acquaintance, hospitably entertained me to supper. 2nd September. Left Neyestanak a little before daybreak, accompanied by an intelligent and handsome little shagird chopar, and arrived eight parasangs, during the forenoon at Jokand, a pretty place abounding in trees and streams, where I would fain have lingered a while to converse with the singularly amiable and courteous postmaster. While I was waiting for fresh horses to be saddled, two or three villagers came in, well-favoured, genial fellows, who told me that an old dialect nearly akin to that of Qohrud, was spoken in this and the neighbouring villages. After a short halt, the fresh horses were led out, and I bade farewell to the kindly postmaster, who exhorted me to deal gently with them, as they had just watered. The Shagird Chopar, a bright handsome lad named Haydar, saw to this, for he was proud of his horses, and rightly, for they actually had to be held in, and prattled incessantly about them, till, after a ride of five parasangs, we reached the little town of Ardestan. Here I had an introduction to a Babi, who took me to his house, gave me fruit, tea, and pipes, and showed me a manuscript of the works of a mystical poet of Ardestan, named Pire Jamal, in whose verses, as he declared, the manifestation of the Bab had been foreshadowed. I left Ardestan about two hours and a half before sunset, the boy Haydar again bearing us company. The horses supplied to us were so bad that when we had gone a short distance we had to send back two of them, and take on two of the horses we had brought from Jokand, to the delight of Haydar and the disgust of the poor old postmaster of Ardestan, who had to refund part of the money which he had received. After a stage of six parasangs, we reached Mogor, where I had supper and slept for a while by the side of a stream, which ran past the post-house, starting again soon after midnight. Five parasangs more brought us to Khaledabad about sunrise, six more parasangs to Abu Zaydabad about noon on 3rd September. The horses which brought us thither had been very bad, but those now supplied to us were even worse. So, as it was impossible to urge them out of a walk, 
i resigned myself to the inevitable bought some melons and thus eating the fruit and crawling along in true caravan fashion entered kashan soon after sunset and was again hospitably received at the telegraph office by mr agenor here i remained that night and all next day to make some purchases and see one or two of my old friends i left kashan about sunset on fourth september and reached sensen at ten p m and pasangon about sunrise the next morning i was very tired and would fain have rested a while but the post from the south was behind us and there was nothing for it but to push on unless i wished to run the risk of being stranded for a day at this desolate spot at ten a m on fifth september i was at qom where i was most hospitably received at the telegraph office and enjoyed a welcome rest of twenty-four hours for i was by this time half dead with weariness not being used to such severe riding sixth september left qom at nine a m reached rahmatabad for parasangs at eleven a m koshke bahram seven parasangs at sunset and peak four parasangs about midnight here i had supper and slept till daybreak seventh september started at six a m and after a hot and dusty ride of six parasangs reached rebat karim a populous and rather pretty village during the forenoon here i stopped for lunch after which i set off about three and a half hours before sunset to accomplish the last stage seven parasangs of this wearisome journey we had good horses and shortly before sunset found ourselves at a little roadside tea-house distant one parasang from tehran here we halted to drink tea when haji safar suddenly observed that if we didn't make haste the southern gates of the city would be shut and we should have to make a long detour to obtain admission we at once set off and galloped in as hard as we could go but all to no purpose for the nearest gate was already shut nor could the gatekeeper be induced by threats or promises to reopen it he only did his duty poor man but i was so angry and disappointed that i gave him the benefit of the whole vocabulary of powerful abuse and invective which i had learned from sheikh ebrahim and it was perhaps as well that the solid gate stood between us i was ashamed of my outburst of temper afterwards but those who have ever made a journey of six hundred miles on persian post-horses will be ready to make some allowances for me luckily we found the shah abdul azim gate still open and threading our way through the bazaars we alighted about three thirty p m at prevost's hotel where haji safar left me to go and visit his relatives the return to what must i suppose be called civilization was anything but grateful to me i loathed the european dishes set before me the fixed hours for meals the constraint and absence of freedom and above all the commonplace and conventional character of my surroundings seven months had lapsed since i quitted tehran for the south and during this time i had been growing steadily more and more persian in thought and speech alike the sudden plunge back into european life came upon me as a shock which was not mitigated even by the charm of novelty and it took several days to reconcile me at all to my surroundings my whole wish being at first to get away from the degenerate capital at the earliest possible date many of my friends too had left tehran or gone into the surrounding villages for the hot weather so that life was much duller than it had been during my previous stay in spite of my desire to get away from tehran it took me thirteen days to transact all my business first of all i had to find out about the steamers from mashhad-e-sar 
the port whence i intended to sail for russia for i would not take the well-known rasht and enzeli route then there were books to be bought packed up and sent off by way of bushir to cambridge babis to whom i had letters of introduction to be visited money arrangements to be made and last though not least ta'ziyahs to be seen for it was the beginning of the month of muharram and the national mornings for hassan hussein and the other saints of the shiite church were in full swing to the chief babis of tehran i was introduced by a merchant of shirvan a russian subject to whom i carried a letter of recommendation they entertained me at lunch in a house near the dulab gate and i was much impressed by their piety and gravity of demeanour so unlike the anarchic freedom of the kerman babis as a psychological study however they were less interesting neither did i see enough of them to become intimate with them as i intended to spend all my available money on books i was at some pains to ascertain what was to be had and where it could be had cheapest i therefore visited several booksellers and asked them to furnish me with a list of books and prices telling them that as i hated haggling i should make no remarks on the prices quoted but simply buy what i needed from him who would sell cheapest this plan had the best effect since they did not know what other shops i had visited and could therefore make no coalition against me and i soon filled a large tin-lined box with a good selection of useful works of reference which seldom find their way to europe where bad indian editions are as a rule the only things readily obtainable i also bought a few curiosities and a complete suit of persian clothes which was made for me under hoji safar's supervision amongst the booksellers i made the acquaintance of a delightful old man a real scholar who when he could collect two or three manuscripts of some rare book which took his fancy generally a philosophical or mystical work would at his own risk and with no one to assist him lithograph as correct and good a text as he could of course he got no encouragement or help from the great who in earlier and better days might have recognized his worth and supplied him with the means of carrying on his labor of love on a larger scale his name so far as i remember was sheikh mohammad hussein of kashan whether he still lives i know not but i shall ever remember him as one of the best types of the unobtrusive kindly disinterested enthusiastic scholar and bibliophile of the east that it has been my lot to meet on wednesday sixth muharram twelfth september i dined with my kind friend mr fahi at the telegraph office the shah's prime minister the amino sultan was giving a rosekhan or religious recitation on a splendid scale in the adjoining house and after dinner we adjourned to the roof to watch it on this occasion a whole regiment of soldiers as well as a number of other guests were being entertained by the generous vazir supper was provided for all of them and i counted over a hundred trays of food as they were brought in by the servants next evening i accompanied several members of the english embassy to the royal tekye a theatre specially constructed and set apart for the dramatized representations of muharram ta'ziyahs which are to the shiite mohammedans what the miracle plays of ober amegan are to christians of the romish church the theatre is a large circular building roofless but covered during muharram with an awning there are boxes talk chairs all around which are assigned to the more patrician spectators one specially large and highly decorated being reserved for the shah the humbler spectators sit round the central space or arena in serried ranks 
the women and children in front. A circular stone platform in the centre constitutes the stage. There is no curtain and no exit for the actors, who, when not wanted, simply stand back. The acting is powerful, though somewhat crude, and it is impossible not to be influenced by the deep feeling evinced by both actors and audience. The Tatziers comprise at least some thirty or forty episodes, the representation of any one of which requires two or three hours. Some of them are drawn from the histories of the Jewish prophets, and these are the less interesting, because the spectators are less profoundly moved by them. The majority, however, illustrate the misfortunes of the Shiite imams. Those connected with the fatal field of Karbala, culminating in the death of the Prince of Martyrs, Sayyidosh Shohada, the Imam Hussein, are the most moving. But I fancy that the Persians are, as a rule, not very willing to admit Europeans or Sunnite Mohammedans, so greatly are the religious feelings of the spectators stirred by the representation of the supreme catastrophe of the Ashura, or tenth of Muharram. On that day, bands of men, especially soldiers of Azerbaijan, parade the streets in white garments, which are soon dyed with gore, for each man carries a knife or sword, and as their excitement increases with cries of Yao Hassan, Yao Hossein, and beatings of breasts, they inflict deep gashes on their heads till the blood pours forth and streams over their faces and apparel. It is an impressive sight, though somewhat suggestive of Baal worship. The Ta'ziyeh, which I was privileged to see, represented the bereaved women of the Holy Family before the impious Shemr, Yazid's general. Shemr was clad in a complete suit of chain armor, and the captive women were brought in before him, mounted on bare-backed camels. Then he entreats with the greatest brutality, driving them with a whip, from the corpse of Hossein, round which they gather to weep and lament. The mise-en-scene and costumes were good, but the effect was spoiled in some measure by the introduction of a number of the Shah's carriages, with postillions barbarously dressed in a half-European uniform, in the middle of the piece. This absurd piece of ostentation seem to me typical of Qajar taste. Note an English translation of some twenty or thirty of the more important Ta'ziyehs has been published in two handsome volumes by Sir Lewis Pelly, formerly resident on the Persian Gulf. One of them, Les Nocées de Cassim, is given in French by Gobineau in his Religions et Philosophie dans l'Asie centrale pages 405 to 437, which also contains a general account of the Moharram Passion Plays, pages 381 to 403 and 439 to 459. End note. I had been much exercised in mind as to the safe conveyance of my precious Balbi manuscripts to England. The box of books which I was sending home by Bushir would, I knew, be months on the road, and I wished to begin to work at my manuscripts immediately on my return. On the other hand, I had heard such dreadful accounts of the Russian custom house that I was afraid to take them with me. Finally, I decided to sew them up carefully in thick linen, direct the parcel to my home address, and send it, if I could obtain permission, in the embassy bag, which is conveyed monthly to Constantinople by a special bearer, and there handed over to the Queen's messenger for transport to London. It cost me an effort to part with my beloved and hardly won manuscripts, even for so short a time, but I felt that this was the safest plan, and, accordingly, 
having packed and directed them with the greatest care i rode out to Qulahak, the summer quarters of the english embassy situated about six miles to the north of tehran and to my great relief saw the precious packet sealed up in the bag i had been delayed in starting from tehran and so reached the embassy too late for lunch i stayed at Qulahak till about five thirty p m visiting some of my persian friends and did not get back to the city till nearly seven p m and that evening i had been invited by my servant haji safar to sup with him at his house and then to visit some of the smaller tazies and rozikhans with him in disguise as i had had nothing to eat all day but tea and biscuits i was well-nigh famished before supper-time and returned to the hotel about midnight almost dead beat so tired was i that it was some time before i could even summon up energy to undress next day i woke at i know not what time feeling faint ill and helplessly weak as though every bone in my body were broken no one came near me and it was not till evening that i could make the effort to rise and obtain some food after drinking a plate of soup and some tea i again fell asleep and woke next morning somewhat better though still too weak to rise till evening as two of my persian friends had promised to take me into the town to see something more of the moharram mornings and spectacles i then made a fresh effort got up had dinner and as soon as they arrived put on a persian coat sardari and lambskin hat kolah and sallied forth in this disguise well content to feel myself for the time a persian amongst persians we spent a pleasant and interesting evening visiting unmolested the masjid i shah royal mosque and the houses of two notable divines the imam jom e and mulla ali of kand on tuesday eighteenth september i concluded my purchase of books on which i spent something over ten pounds for the benefit of persian students i append a list of the twenty-six volumes which i bought for this sum together with their prices the first fifteen i obtained from my good old friend sheikh mohammad hussein of kashan the last eleven from another bookseller one the borhan jame a very excellent and compact dictionary of persian words composed in the reigns of fat ali shah and muhammad shah by muhammad karim ibn mahdi qoli mirza and chiefly based on the burhan qalte and the farhang rashidi lithographed in tabriz in a h twelve sixty a d eighteen forty four price ten krons two the divan of anvari tabriz edition of a h twelve sixty six price twelve krons three the qasasul ulama stories of celebrated divines by mohammad ibn soleiman et tenakoboni together with two other treatises one called sabilon najat the way of salvation and the other by seyyed murtaza alamul huda called ershadul avam the layman's guide second edition lithographed in tehran in a h 1304 price ten krons four the sharh manzume or text and commentary of the philosophical poem arabic of the great modern philosopher of persia haji mulla haudi of sabzavar lithographed at tehran in a h twelve ninety eight price twenty krons five the divan of sanai one of the most celebrated of the early mystical poets of persia died about a d eleven fifty lithographed not dated price eight krons six the hadiqatosh shi'e garden of the shiites 
an extensive work on Shiite doctrine and history. Second volume only, dealing with the Imams, lithographed at Tehran in A.H. 1265, price 12 krons. 7. The mystical commentary on the Qur'an of Sheikh Muhyuddin ibn al-Arabi, a very notable Moorish mystic, who flourished during the latter part of the 12th and earlier part of the 13th centuries of our era. Lithographed in India, Bombay, in A.H. 1291, A.D. 1874. Price, 30 krons. 8. Philosophical Treatises of Mulla Sadra, with marginal commentary by Haji Mulla Haudi, lithographed, no date, price, 10 krons. 9. The Tazkiratul Khattatin, Biographies of Calligraphists, and the Travels in Persia, Turkey, Arabia, and Egypt of Mirza Sanglauch, a large and extremely handsome volume, beautifully lithographed in a fine Naskh handwriting in A.H. 1291 at Tabriz, price 25 krons. 10. The Poems of Onsuri, a contemporary of Ferdosi, and 11. The Poems of Farrokhi, another poet of the same period, both lithographed at Tehran, the latter in A.H. 1301. Price 3 krons for the two volumes. 12. The complete works of Qa'oni and Faruqi, two poets of the present century, together with the Hadal Eqos Ser, a treatise on rhetoric by Rashiduddin Vatvaut, lithographed in A.H. 1302, Tehran, price 14 krons. 13. The Fosusul Hekam by the celebrated mystic Sheikh Muhyuddin ibn al-Arabi, mentioned above, lithographed at Bombay in A.H. 1300. Price 5 krons. There is another edition of the same work lithographed at Tehran in A.H. 1299, which I bought on another occasion. 14. So'olo Javab, Questions and Answers, a sort of catechism on Shiite law and ritual by the great divine Haji Sayyid Muhammad Balgher, printed at Esfahan in the reign of Fat Ali Shah, A.H. 1247, under the patronage of Manuchehr Khan, Mu'tamedo Dole, the governor of that place, by Abdur Razak of Esfahan, assisted and instructed by Mirza Zainul Abedin of Tabriz, who is described as, quote, the introducer of this art, that is, printing, into Persia, end quote. A fine piece of work, price, eight krons. Fifteen. The Hadikatul Hadikat, a well-known early mystical poem by Hakim Sanoi, flourished during the earlier part of the twelfth century of our era. The two first chapters only, with commentary by the Nawab Muhammad Alauddin Khan, poetically surnamed Alaoi, edited by Muhammad Ruknuddin Qadari Hesari, lithographed at Luharu, no date, price two and a half krons. 16. The last volume of Sepehr's Great History, entitled Nasekhot Tavarikh, the abrogator of chronicles, containing part of the reign of the present Shah. Price, five krons. 17. A little volume containing the quatrains of Omar Khayyam, of Baba Tawher, the lore of Hamadan, the most celebrated dialectical poet of Persia, of Abu Sa'id ibn Abel Khair, a notable mystic who died about the middle of the 11th century of our era, and of Khaji Abdullah Ansari, together with some Qasides by Salman of Salve, lithographed at Bombay during the vice regency of Lord Lytton in A.H. 1297, price two krons. 18. A work on the evidences of Mohammedanism, written at the request of the present Shah, and hence called Sultaniyeh, 
by the bab's rival haji muhammad karim khan of kerman the leader of the modern sheikhi school price three krons nineteen the poems of menu chehri a contemporary of ferdosi lithographed at tehran no date price two krons twenty the asrar Nome, book of mysteries of the celebrated mystical poet sheikh fariduddin at taur lithographed at tehran a h twelve ninety eight twenty one the qiranu sa'dain conjunction of the two lucky planets of amir khosro of dehli lithographed at tehran in the reign of the present shah twenty two the divan of the philosopher haji mulla hadi of sabzavar poetically surnamed asrar there are two editions of this work both lithographed the one in a h twelve ninety nine the other in a h thirteen hundred price two krons twenty three a manuscript incomplete of sheikh fariduddin at taur's tazkiratul awliya biographies of saints transcribed in a h twelve o nine price forty krons twenty four the poems of nasser khosro lithographed at tabriz in a h twelve eighty price fourteen krons twenty five an old manuscript of a highly esteemed collection of shiite traditions called rosatul kalfi price thirty krons twenty six mir khan's universal history called rosatus safal with the supplement of reza qoli khan lala baushi poetically surnamed hedayat carrying the record of events down to the reign of the present shah ten volumes in two lithographed at tehran a h twelve seventy one to seventy four price seventy krons end of section forty four Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Reco- Section forty five of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Section 45. On returning to the hotel with a sturdy porter who bore my purchases, I found my old teacher, Mirza Asadullah of Sabzavar, who had kindly come to bring me a short biography of his master, Haji Mullah Hadi, the philosopher, and also an autograph of the great thinker next day wednesday nineteenth september haji safar secured the services of a tinsmith with whose aid we packed up and hermetically sealed my books and other purchases in a large wooden chest lined with tin which luckily proved just large enough to contain them all when it was closed up we got porters to carry it to messieurs ziegler's office in the koravon saroye amir where i left it in the care of their agent for transport to england by way of bushir the total value of its contents as estimated by myself for the custom house came to almost exactly seventy nine tomans twenty four pounds on the afternoon of the following day having concluded all my business and said farewell to such of my friends as still remained in tehran i started on my last march in persia which was to convey me through the interesting province of mazandaran to the caspian i had succeeded in obtaining through messieurs ziegler's agent two hundred and twenty eight roubles in russian money the equivalent of seven hundred fifty two krons eight shahis persian the rest of my money amounting to seven hundred forty seven krons twelve shahis i carried with me in persian silver and copper 
our first stage was as usual to be a short one of two or three parasangs only but the moon had risen ere we reached our halting place the solitary caravanserai of surkh hesar the red fortress where i obtained a very good clean room opening on to a little courtyard through which ran a stream of limpid water soon after quitting tehran by the shemron gate we had been joined by an ex-artilleryman who had just been flogged and dismissed the service for some misdemeanour he expressed a desire to accompany me to landan london declaring that persia was no fit place for an honest man and actually went with us as far as amul where i was not altogether sorry to lose sight of him friday twenty first september left surkh hesar about seven thirty a m and after a dull ride through a barren stony plain reached the solitary and rather dilapidated caravanserai of asalak an hour before noon here i stopped for lunch and was entertained by a quaint old seyed who was suffering from a bad foot he told me with great glee how he had recently succeeded in defrauding the revenue officers sent to collect his taxes being apprised of their intended visit he had in spite of his lameness gone on foot to tehran a distance of six parasangs carrying with him all his cash some twelve or thirteen tomans mostly in copper coins which he there entrusted to the keeping of a friend when the revenue officers came there was no money to be found on the premises and they were obliged to depart empty-handed after a fruitless search on my departure i gave the old man a kran with which he was highly pleased soon after leaving asalak we entered the mountains and the scenery began to improve rapidly gradually assuming an almost english character for our way was between green hedgerows beyond which lay real grass meadows watered by rippling mountain streams and dotted with grazing cattle towards sundown we reached the pretty straggling village of Aug, which consists of three distinct groups of houses separated by considerable intervals of road we stopped at the last group just before the steepness of the ascent begins here i obtained a delightful lodging in an upper chamber looking out on the most charming landscape imaginable saturday twenty second september started about seven fifteen a m and at once began to ascend steeply towards the pass by which we were to enter mazandaran the first part of our march was delicious for our road was bordered by moss-grown walls overshadowed by leafy trees and crossed by innumerable streams while around us lay green grassy fields such as my eyes had not looked upon for many a long day as we advanced the ascent grew gradually more abrupt and the path began to climb the mountainside in a series of apparently interminable zigzags which has given to it the name of hazar cham the thousand twists at the summit of the pass is a little building where we had lunch ere commencing the descent into mazandaran our downward course lay at first by the side of a rushing river the laur i think which soon plunged into a deep gorge far down in this gorge on a little plateau which broke the sheer face of the opposite cliff we could see the village of ask of which the mother of the shaf's eldest son the zealous sultan is a native how it is approached i could not imagine for i could discern no signs of a path down the beetling precipice on our left arose the mighty snow-capped mountain of mount damalvand which can be ascended from the side without much difficulty although the inhabitants of the village of damalvand and indeed the generality of persians believe it to be inaccessible 
for on its summit according to ancient legend was chained the tyrant zohauk by feridun the deliverer of his country the avenger of his race and the restorer of the ancient royal house and the accursed spirit of the usurper is popularly supposed still to haunt the cloud-capped peak of the mountain but the inhabitants of the little village of rene where we halted for the night have no such superstitious dread of the mountain and some of them are in the habit of ascending it frequently to collect the sulphur which is to be found in a cave near the summit we left the beautiful alpine village of rene next morning sunday twenty third september around seven thirty a m the pretty winding road by which we continued to descend was so steep that for the first hour or so of our march i preferred to walk at the bottom of the valley we again came to the river in some places this had undermined and washed away the path so that we were obliged to enter the water but on the whole the road was a triumph of engineering skill for soon the valley narrowed into a mere cleft with steep rocky sides out of which the passage had been cut this the new road runs along the left western side of the gorge on the opposite side were discernible the remains of the old road which had been built out from the cliff instead of cut in it at one point on the new road a bas relief of the present shah surrounded by his courtiers had been carved on the rocks about two p m we passed a village no lodging was to be found there so we proceeded on our way halted for lunch in a cornfield and about four p m reached a house by a bridge where the muleteer wished to halt for the night here also no decent lodging was to be found and consequently in spite of the mutterings of the muleteer Ocher mozanderon ast chemichohid after all it is mozanderon what would you have we again pushed on until about sunset we came to a little group of hovels half caves half huts called kalovan where we halted it was a sweet night and its sweetness was enhanced by the shimmer of the moonlight and the murmur of the river but inside the cave hut which i shared with the owners it was close and warm and the gnats were plentiful and aggressive monday twenty fourth september we started about seven thirty a m and travelled for some time in the company of a mozanderoni muleteer who gave me information which i had been unable to obtain from my own south country charvador as to the position of the castle of sheikh tabarsi that once redoubtable stronghold of the balbis which if possible i desired to visit before embarking at mashhad -e sar i found that it lay beyond borfurush between that town and sauri some distance off the main road near a village called kauratil and that if i were to visit it it must be from borfurush as we advanced the valley began to widen out and the rocky cliffs which had hitherto formed its sides gave place to wooded slopes in front too low wooded hills appeared while round our path the wild pomegranate and other trees grew ever thicker and thicker so that we could no longer see far about us soon we were out of the hill country altogether and entered a vast forest where ferns and mosses grew thickly ever and anon we traversed beautiful glades on the green sward of which were pitched here and there the black tents of nomads whose cattle grazed peaceably round about the encampment save for these black tents and a certain luxuriance of vegetation the whole scene was wonderfully english in appearance and i could almost have believed myself to be already back in my native land 
in one of these delicious glades we halted for lunch which consisted of cold boiled rice and fowl called in mazandarani parlance kette later in the day the road got terribly bad being sometimes so deep in mud and slush that the beasts could hardly advance our muleteer had intended to make for a village called firuz kolah but we being somewhat in advance passed the point where the road thither diverged from the road to amul and were already some way advanced on the latter when the muleteer overtook us a violent altercation arose between him and haji safar for he would have had us turn back but learning from an old peasant who happened to pass by that amul was distant but one parasang we insisted on proceeding thither and the muleteer was finally compelled to a sullen submission again the character of the country underwent a sudden change for emerging from the dense forest we entered on a flat fenny plain covered with long sedge-like grasses and tall bulrushes and dotted with marshy pools and grazing cattle about six p m we passed a little village with thatched cottages which seemed strangely out of place in persia that land of clay houses and flat roofs interspersed amongst which were curious wooden erections each composed of four staunt poles set vertically in the ground and supporting a sloping thatch beneath this at a distance of some feet was a sort of platform on which carpets and pillows were spread i supposed that the inhabitants slept on these platforms during the hot weather to escape the mosquitoes but haji safar said that it was to avoid the low-lying fogs which at night-time spread themselves over the surface of the ground about half an hour after passing this village we reached amul one of the chief cities of mazandaran a picturesque straggling town divided into two parts by a large river which is spanned by a long narrow bridge built of bricks crossing this bridge we found quarters for the night in the house of a respectable citizen but though the room allotted to me was clean and comfortable enough the close moist air mosquitoes and vagrant cats combined to keep me awake for some time tuesday twenty fifth september we started about seven thirty a m and all day our course lay through flat marshy fenlands covered with rushes sedges and scrubby bushes snakes lizards some large and green others small and brown tortoises and frogs abounded in and about the numerous stagnant pools by which we passed the road was in many places little better than the surrounding quagmire sometimes hardly discernible and this notwithstanding the fact that it is the main highway between two of the chief cities of mazandaran about five p m we crossed the river barbol by a fine bridge and turning sharply to the left north along its eastern bank traversed a great common used as a grazing ground for cattle and in a few minutes entered barforush on our right as we entered was a large lake covered with water lilies in the centre of which was an island this island was joined to the shore by a bridge and on it stood a summer palace called Balgeshaw, the king's garden which serves the shah as a residence when he visits this part of his dominions farther on we passed just outside the town the caravanserai now in ruins where the babis under mullah hussein of bushraweh the first letter of affirmation defended themselves against the townsfolk of barforush in the conflict which preceded the fiercer struggle at sheikh tabarsi entering the town the spacious square of the sabzimaydan or herb market turned my thoughts 
to the concluding catastrophe of the great struggle of eighteen forty eight to nine for there in the summer of the latter year mulla muhammad ali of barfurush called by the babis jenab quddus his excellence the most holy suffered death together with the chief of his surviving lieutenants at the hands of the saeedul ulama and his myrmidons as we entered the main street of the city we found one of the muharram representations ta'ziyas in progress and some of the people would have had us turn aside but we continued on our way while i wondered whether the bob's prophecy would ever be fulfilled that a day would come when in these spots hallowed by the blood of his martyrs representations of their sufferings and steadfastness should move the sympathetic lamentations and tears of the children of those who slew them and obliterate the remembrance of the martyrs of karbala the town of barfurush is much finer and larger than amol but less picturesque and old world we alighted at a rather dilapidated caravanserai near the centre of the town here i was visited in the course of the evening by a native of kabul a british subject who showed me his passport with evident pride and by one or two other persons who informed me that the russian ambassador had on the previous day passed through the town on his way to sauri whence as i understood he proposed to return to his own country by ship from astarabad i inquired of my visitors concerning sheikh tabarsi which i still eagerly desired to visit they told me that it was two parasangs distant from barfurush to the south-east and that the babis drawing an analogy from the early history of islam called it karbala barfurush kufa and the lake surrounding the Balkishah, the euphrates forat and were still in the habit of making pilgrimages thither in the evening after supper i summoned haji safar told him of my wish to visit sheikh tabarsi and asked him whether it would be possible to do so after thinking for a little while he replied that as we must necessarily be at the port of mashhad -e sar by nightfall on the following day to be in time for the steamer which was to leave early on thursday morning the only practicable plan was that he should if possible secure the services of a competent guide and two stout mozandarani ponies to convey me to the shrine and back to barfurush and thence on after a short rest to mashhad -e sar whither he himself would proceed direct with the baggage all depends he concluded on my success in finding a guide if i can find one i will wake you betimes in the morning for you must start early if not you must perforce relinquish the project next morning wednesday twenty sixth september haji safar awoke me about seven with the welcome intelligence that he had found a shopkeeper of barfurush who owned two ponies and was well acquainted with the road to sheikh tabarsi whither for a consideration he was willing to guide me while i was drinking my morning tea the aforesaid guide an honest-looking burly fellow appeared in person well said he i hear you want to visit tabarsi what for is no concern of mine the wire ferangi should desire to go there baffles my understanding however i am ready to take you if you will give me a suitable present for my trouble but we must start at once for it is two good parasangs there over the worst of ground and you must as i understand get to mashhad sar this evening so that you should be back here at least two or three hours before sunset if you don't like fatigue and hard work you had better give up the idea what do you say will you go 
or not of course i will go i replied for what else did i seek you out well said replied my guide patting me on the shoulder then let us be off without delay in a few minutes we were in the saddle and moving rapidly along the high road to sauri on our sturdy wiry little mozandarani ponies whither away cried some of my guide's acquaintance as we clattered out of the town sheikh he replied laconically whereat expressions of surprise and curiosity which we did not stop to answer would burst from our interrogators soon we left the high road and striking across a broad grassy common entered trackless swamps and forests in which my guide well as he knew the country was sometimes at fault for the water lay deep on the rice fields and only the peasants whom we occasionally met could tell us whether or no a particular passage was possible after crossing the swampy rice fields we came to thickets and woods intersected by the narrowest and muddiest of paths and overgrown with branches through which we forced our arduous way thence after fording a river with steep mud banks we entered on pleasant open downs and traversing several small coppices arrived about ten thirty a m at the lonely shrine of sheikh ahmad ibn abi talib tabarsi so stands the name of the buried saint on a tablet inscribed with the form of words used for his visitation which hangs suspended from the railings surrounding his tomb rendered immortal by the gallantry of the balbi insurgents who for nine months october eighteen forty eight to july eighteen forty nine held it against overwhelming numbers of regulars and volunteers sheikh tabarsi is a place of little natural strength and of the elaborate fortifications said by the musulman historians to have been constructed by the babis no trace remains it consists at present of a flat grassy enclosure surrounded by a hedge and containing besides the buildings of the shrine and another building at the gateway opposite to which but outside the enclosure stands the house of the motevali or custodian of the shrine nothing but two or three orange trees and a few rude graves covered with flat stones the last resting places perhaps of some of the balbi defenders the building at the gateway is two stories high is traversed by the passage giving access to the enclosure and is roofed with tiles the buildings of the shrine which stand at the farthest end of the enclosure are rather more elaborate their greatest length about twenty paces lies east and west their breadth is about ten paces and besides the covered portico at the entrance they contain two rooms scantily lighted by wooden gratings over the doors the tomb of the sheikh from whom the place takes its name stands surrounded by wooden railings in the centre of the inner room to which access is obtained either by a door communicating with the outer chamber or by a door opening externally into the enclosure my guide believing no doubt that i was at heart a bobby come to visit the grave of the martyrs of my religion considerately withdrew to the motavali's house and left me to my own devices for about three quarters of an hour i was still engaged in making rough plans and sketches of the place note these will be found in my translation of the new history published by the cambridge university press End note. however when he returned to remind me that we could not afford to delay much longer so not very willingly yet greatly comforted at having successfully accomplished this final pilgrimage i mounted and we rode back by the way we had come to barfarouche where we arrived about three p m you are a hoji now said my guide laughingly as we drew near the town and you ought to reward me liberally for this day's work for i tell you that there are hundreds of balbis who come here to visit sheikh tabarsi and can find no one to guide them thither 
and these would almost give their ears to go where you have gone and see what you have seen so when we alighted at a caravanserai near his house i gave him a sum of money with which he appeared well content and he in return set tea before me and then came and sat with me a while telling me with some amusement of the wonderings and speculations which my visit to sheikh tabarsi had provoked amongst the townsfolk some say you must be a balbi he concluded but most inclined to the belief that you have been there to look for buried treasure for say they who ever heard of a ferengi who cared about religion and in any case what has a ferengi to do with the barbies i for my part have done my best to encourage them in this belief what took you to tabarsi is no business either of theirs or of mine when i had rested for a while a horse on which was set a paulon or pack saddle instead of an ordinary saddle was brought round my guide apologized for not himself conducting me to mashhad sar adding that he had provided a guide who knew the way well with this new guide a barefooted stripling i set off for my last ride in persia our way lay at first through beautiful shady lanes and thriving villages composed of thatched cottages both singularly english in appearance and we made good progress until about two miles from mashhad sar we emerged on the bare links or downs which skirt the coast and almost simultaneously darkness began to fall here we lost our way for a while until set in the road by an old villager and at length about seven thirty p m after traversing more lanes overshadowed by trees and brilliant with glow-worms we saw the welcome light of the caravanserai which stands hard by the seashore at some distance beyond the village that night was my last on persian soil but i had little time to indulge in sentimental reflections for it was late when i had finished my supper and i had to dispose my baggage for a different manner of travelling from that to which i had been so long accustomed besides settling up with haji safar i paid him one hundred sixty three krons in all about five pounds of which sixty krons were for his wages during september thirty krons for the first half of october for he would not reach tehran for ten days probably forty krons for the hire of the horse i had ridden and thirty-three krons for the journey money i also made over to him my saddle saddle-bags and cooking utensils as well as some well-worn clothes and further entrusted to him my revolver which he was to give to one of my friends in tehran as a keepsake together with several letters this done i retired to rest and slept soundly next morning thursday twenty seventh september haji safar woke me early telling me that the steamer was in sight this proved to be a false alarm and when i went to the russian agents who had an office in the caravanserai they declined to give me my ticket until the steamer actually appeared these two agents either were or feigned to be excessively stupid they affected not to understand either persian or french and refused to take payment for the ticket in anything but russian money so that it was fortunate that i had in tehran provided myself with a certain quantity of rouble notes finally the steamer hove in sight the ticket was bought for twenty-five roubles and i hastened down to the shore of the estuary where several large clumsy boats were preparing to put off to her it was with genuine regret that i turned for a moment before stepping into the boat to bid farewell to persia which notwithstanding all her faults i had come to love very dearly and the faithful and efficient haji safar he had served me well and to his intelligence and enterprise i owed much he was not perfect what man is but if ever it be my lot to visit these lands again i would wish no better than to secure the services of him or one like him 
I slipped into his hands a bag of money, which I had reserved for a parting present, and with a few brief words of farewell, stepped into the boat, which at once cast off from the shore, and, hoisting a sail, stood out towards the Russian steamer. The sea grew rougher as we left the shelter of the estuary, but with the sail we advanced quickly, and about 8.15 a.m. I climbed on board the Emperor Alexander, and for the first time for many months felt myself with a sudden sense of loneliness, a stranger in the midst of strangers. The only passengers who embarked besides myself were two or three Persians bound for Mashhad, and with these I conversed fitfully, knowing not when next I might find chance of speech in an intelligible tongue, till we entered the vessel, when they took up their station forward as deck passengers, and I descended to the cabin. At nine the steamer had turned about, for mashhad -e sar is the end of this line, and was running eastwards for bandar -e gaz the port of Astarobod. About 10.30 a bell announced breakfast, and I again descended to the cabin. I was the only passenger, and on entering the saloon, I was surprised to see two tables laid. At one was seated the officers of the vessel, three or four in number, busily engaged in the consumption of sardines, caviar, cheese, roasted potatoes, and the like, which they were washing down with nips of vodka, a strong spirit resembling the Persian Arab. The other table was laid with plates, but the places were vacant. Wondering whether the officers were too proud to sit down at the same table with the passengers, I stood hesitating, observing which, one of the officers called out to me in English, asking me whether I felt sick. I indignantly repudiated the imputation, whereupon he bade me join them at their zakuski. I sat down with him, and after doing justice to the caviar and cheese, we moved on to the other table and had a substantial déjeuner. At 6.30 in the evening, we had another similar meal, also preceded by zakuski. At 4 p.m. we reached bandar -e gaz the port of Astarobod, and anchored close to the shore by a wooden barge serving as a pier in full view of the little island of Ashurada. This now belongs to the Russians, who first occupied it on the pretext of checking the Turkoman pirates who formerly infested this corner of the Caspian, and then declined to give it back to the Persians and around it several Russian warships were anchored. Some of their officers came on board our steamer, and later in the evening rockets were sent up from them in honour, as I suppose, of the Russian ambassador, who, so far as I could learn, for everyone was very reticent and uncompanionable, was in the neighbourhood. I went to sleep that night with the sweet scent of the forests of Mazandaran in my nostrils, for the wind was off the shore, but when I went on deck next morning, Friday, 28th September, not a tree was in sight, but only a long line of yellow sand dunes which marked the inhospitable Turkoman coast. Whence, in bygone days, ere the Russians stepped in and put a stop to their marauding, the Turkoman pirates issued forth to harry the fertile Persian lands and bear back with them to hateful bondage, hosts of unfortunate captives destined for sale in the slave markets of Samarkand and Bukhara. At about midday we anchored off Chekishlar, where a number of Russian officers, two ladies and a child, came on board to breakfast on the steamer. Immediately after breakfast we again stood out to sea. That evening an official of the Russian police, who I suppose had come on board at Chekishlar, came up to me with one of the officers of the boat and demanded my passport, which, he said, would be returned to me at the custom house at Baku. I was very loath to part with it, but there was no help for it, and, inwardly chafing, I surrendered to him the precious document. Early next morning, Saturday, 29th September, I awoke to find the vessel 
steaming along between a double row of sand dunes towards Uzun Ada, Long Island, the point whence the Russian railway to Bukhara and Samarkand takes its departure. Passing the narrows, we anchored alongside the quay about 8.30 a.m., being without my passport, which had probably been taken from me expressly to prevent me from leaving the steamer, I could not, even if I would, have gone on shore. But indeed there was little to tempt me, for a more unattractive spot I have seldom seen. It seemed to consist almost entirely of railway stations, barracks, police stations, and custom houses, set in wastes of sand, infinite and immeasurable and the turkoman seemed to bear but a small proportion to the russian inhabitants a number of passengers came on board here all of whom save one lady and three children were russian officers the deck too was crowded with soldiers who after dinner at a sign from their officer burst out into a song with a chorus like the howling of wolves which i supposed was intended for a national anthem on retiring to my cabin i found to my disgust that my berth had been appropriated by a russian officer who had ejected my possessions and now lay there snoring hideously i was angered at his discourtesy but deemed it wisest to make no remonstrance from my short experience of Russian travelling, I should suppose that their military men make a point of occupying places already taken, in preference to such as are vacant. At any rate, when the occupant is a civilian and a foreigner, I woke about 6.30 a.m. on the following morning, Sunday, 30th September, to find myself at Baku, or Bad Kube, as it is called by the Persians somehow or other i escaped the ordeal of the custom house for intending at first to breakfast on board i did not disembark with the other passengers and when afterwards changing my mind i went on shore about nine thirty a m the pier was free of excisemen and i had nothing to do but step into a cab and drive to the station stopping on the way at a persian money changers to convert the remainder of my persian money into rouble notes the train did not start till two thirty seven p m so i had some time to wait at the station where i had lunch the porters were inefficient and uncivil the train crowded and the scenery monotonous in the extreme so that my long railway journey began under rather depressing auspices still there was a certain novelty in finding myself once more in a train and after a while i was cheered by the entrance into my compartment of two mussulmans of the caucasus with these i entered into conversation in turkish for which i presently substituted persian on finding that one of them was familiar with that language but i had hardly spoken ten words when a russian officer who sat next to me on the right and with whom i had had a slight altercation in french about one of my portmanteaus which he alleged to be insecurely balanced in the rack leaned forward with an appearance of interest and then addressed me in perfectly idiomatic persian i discovered that he had been born in persia near borujerd i think and had learned persian almost as his native language to both of us i think but to myself certainly it was a pleasure to speak it and we became quite friendly i had intended to stay a day at tiflis where we arrived at eight fifteen next morning monday first october but the friendly officer told me that the steamers for odessa left batum on tuesdays and thursdays and that after cities more truly oriental in character tiflis would offer but little attraction to me so i determined to continue my journey without halt in order to catch the morrow's boat i had some difficulty in getting my ticket and finding my train as no one seemed to talk anything but russian but at last i succeeded though only after a waste of time which prevented me from making more than the most unsubstantial and desultory breakfast this however was of little consequence for i never knew any railway on which there were such frequent and prolonged stoppages for refreshment 
or any refreshment rooms so well provided and so well managed the fact that there is only one train a day each way no doubt makes it easier to have all these savoury dishes and steaming samovars tea urns ready for passengers on their arrival but at no railway station in europe have i seen food at once so cheap so good and so well served as in the stations of the transcaucasian line the scenery on leaving tiflis was fine and at one point we caught a glimpse of splendid snow-capped mountains to the north but on the whole i was disappointed for the line lies so much in narrow valleys which bar the outlook that little is to be seen of the great caucasian range what could be seen of the country from the train was pretty rather than grand and i was not sorry to reach batum at about eleven fifteen p m where i put up at the hotel de france and for the first time since leaving tehran eleven days ago enjoyed the luxury of sleeping between sheets as the steamer for odessa was not to leave batum till three thirty p m on the following day tuesday second october i had all the morning to look about me but the town presented few features of interest and the only thing that aroused my wonder was the completely european character assumed by a place which had only ceased to be turkish twelve years ago i was very glad to embark on the steamer which actually started about four p m dinner was at six and afterwards i stayed on deck till after eleven where we arrived at suhum kala next evening wednesday third october we reached novo rasayask about five p m and lay there till late at night there were several war vessels in the fine harbour which continued throughout the evening to send up rockets and flash the electric light from point to point early on the morning of thursday fourth october we reached kerch where amongst other passengers a very loquacious american came on board he had been spending some time amongst the russians whom he did not much like or admire though as he told me he believed them to be the coming nation end of section forty five recording by nicholas james bridgewater recorded in london england